Today, the House Government Reform Committee held a nearly six-hour hearing on the safety of mail and postal workers. Now we'll show you the whole thing. Throughout the afternoon, committee members heard from Postal Service Management, public health officials, and postal union representatives. In this first portion, Chief Postal Inspector Kenneth Weaver joins panelists from the FBI and Centers for Disease Control. This part's about two and a half hours. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. Uh, quorum being present, the committee uh, will... Excuse me. Okay. I ask unanimous consent that all our articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record without objection so ordered. Because we have limited time with the first uh, two panel witnesses, we are going to ask the members to limit their opening statements. Now, uh, we were going to just have the chairman and the ranking member give opening statements, but because others would like to make opening statements, I'd, I'd, I'd urge you, because we want to get to questions as quickly as possible, to limit them to just what essentially you have to, have to say instead of, uh, you know, giving the normal five-minute uh, opening statements. Uh, Over the past two months, we've been struck by the terrorists not once but twice. They've attacked us with weapons developed from things we use in our everyday lives, commercial airplanes and the U.S. mail. Prime Minister Netanyahu called the attacks on the World Trade Center a wake-up call from hell. It feels like we hardly woke up at all before we were hit with the anthrax-infected letters. Now we have three people dead and at least a dozen more are infected and we heard this morning someone else is in critical condition. We have thousands of people up and down the coast, east coast, taking antibiotics. Every day traces of anthrax are found in more post offices, more mail rooms, and more office buildings. As a nation, we'll probably never be the same. The sense of security that we once felt has vanished. We now know that terrorists can strike at any time and any place. We have no other choice but to fight back. As we speak, the men and women of our armed services are fighting to bring Osama bin Laden to justice and to destroy his terrorist network. The President has rallied the American people and the world community to this cause. His leadership has given the American people a lot of confidence. But we can't stop with the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. We have to strike back hard with those who would use biological or chemical or nuclear weapons. Eight years ago, terrorists tried to blow up the World Trade Center, eight years ago. Obviously, not enough was done by our intelligence agencies because we saw what happened on September 11th. This time, it's anthrax. We shouldn't make the same mistake twice. We need to take action now. We should strike hard at any site that our intelligence agency shows is producing chemical, biological, or nuclear material for terrorists or terrorist nations anywhere in the world. And we need to do it very, very quickly. We need to do it now before they perfect those weapons. Remember, eight years ago we had a trade, an attack on the World Trade Center and they didn't succeed. And eight years later, they did succeed. So we've had that wake-up call and we have to act. We must not wait even if the current anthrax, anthrax uh, attack is not from a foreign entity. Our enemies abroad are watching and preparing. And if we don't do anything, I think we'll regret, we'll regret it. Obviously, we also have to step up the security here at home. Following the disaster of September 11th, we've gone to great lengths to make our airports and airplanes more secure. After the last two weeks, we have to do the same things with our Postal Service. We have to do what's necessary to protect the American people from biological and chemical threats, and that's why we're holding this hearing today. We're going to look at how the Postal Service has handled the situation so far and what still needs to be done. And I want to thank our new postmaster, General uh, Jack Potter, who's going to be with us uh, later on this afternoon. I know it's a very stressful time for the Postal Service. The task ahead is monumental. The postmaster is going to be here, I, say, I think, around 2 o'clock. He'll be accompanied by David Feynman, the vice chairman of the Postal Board of Governors. And I want to thank them all uh, in advance for being here. I also want to thank our other witnesses, Mr. Jarbo from, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Mr. Jarbo from the FBI, is that correct? Who came on very short notice, and I really appreciate that. The FBI is working very hard to try to meet these new threats. Their cooperation with this committee has always been very good and appreciated. Dr. Mitch Cohen from the CDC also came on very, very short notice. 
A new case of inhalation anthrax was reported in New York City last night, and I know that the CDC is doing everything they can to stay on top of the situation. So I want to thank you for coming on short notice. I want to also thank, as well, our Chief Inspector, Mr. Weaver, from the Postal Service for being here. I also want to thank our witnesses from the four postal unions who are going to testify later today. I think it's fair to say that this situation hasn't been handled perfectly, but we're in uncharted territory. With the advantage of hindsight, it's easy for us to second guess. Given the little experience that we've had with anthrax in this country, it's not surprising that we've had some rough spots. I was told that the last time we had a case of anthrax was about 25 years ago. So we'll have some questions about decisions that were made and the way the situation was handled. We lost two employees from the Brentwood facility. Did we wait too long to start testing there? What lessons have we learned? I think the most important thing we could do at this point is to work together so we're better prepared for the next attack. And we understand that there probably will be more attacks. We have 800,000 people working in the Postal Service. Their safety comes first. We have millions of people and businesses across the country who rely on the Postal Service. They send and receive mail every day. We have to restore their confidence that the mail is safe. We want to hear from the Postmaster about what steps they're taking, what's being done so we can open all open the mail again without fear. What type of technology is the Postal Service investing in? How effective is it? How long will it be for, before it's up and running? And how much will this equipment cost? The first figure we heard last week was $800 million, and before long it was up to almost $2.5 million, including infrastructure changes. Where does this money come from? This is an area where the Congress and the Postal Service needs to work together. If the Postal Service has to pass along all these costs to the ratepayers, the impact on their finances will be devastating. The Postal Service is already losing money, about $165 billion last year. And the combination of a sluggish economy and increased use of email could make this year's losses even greater. And that's not even considering the costs that's been a result of these terrorist attacks. The September 11th attacks cost the Postal Service over $60 million in damages alone. The economic slowdown that followed cost them another $300 to $400 million in lost revenue. The cost related to this anthrax attack will be many times that. In its current financial condition, the Postal Service cannot absorb these costs. The White House has already committed $175 million in emergency funds to help the Postal Service take the first steps. More is going to be required. I hope we can get a more exact idea on how much more today or in the very near future. I'm going to work with the White House and so will the committee and the Postmaster and my colleagues on this committee will work as well to make sure the Postal Service has the resources it needs to face this challenge. I also want all of my colleagues to know that we're not going to give up on postal reform. It's more clear now than ever that we need to have a financially strong postal service. They need to have greater flexibility or they can't compete in today's environment. I know that John McHugh agrees with me and so does Danny Daniels, who's uh, not here yet, but uh, they've been working very hard on the postal reform issue. John McHugh can't be here with us because of a family problem, but uh, he has a statement that we will insert into the record without objection. I just have a couple more remarks. This is probably the greatest challenge America has faced in decades. I can't remember the last time so many Americans were afraid to go about their daily lives. I can't remember the last time so many people felt insecure. Yet, we're rising to that challenge and it wouldn't be possible without the hard work of thousands and thousands of people. The men and women of the armed forces flying combat missions over Afghanistan, conducting commando raids in hostile territory, and all the people at the Defense Department who's supporting them. The Justice Department and the FBI have committed vast resources to investigating these crimes. They're working tirelessly to try to protect the public, and we appreciate that very much. At the CDC, they're working around the clock, and I really appreciate them being here today because I know how difficult it is right now to contain this outbreak of anthrax. The men and women of the Postal Service, they continue to keep the mail moving despite all of the uncertainties they face. The local firefighters and policemen who risk their lives to try to save others. And I'd like to correct one thing I said. I said $165 million. It's $1.65 billion that the Postal Service was uh, uh, asking for. On behalf of everyone on this committee, I want to thank everyone who's doing his or her part. And with that, that concludes my opening statement. Mr. Waxman, you're recognized.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. There are two que questions we need to focus on today. Is it safe for families, businesses, and government agencies to open their mail? And is it safe for postal workers to handle the mail? Ensuring the safety of the mail is a paramount federal responsibility. The public depends on the U.S. mail. We use the mail to stay in contact with family and friends, to pay our bills, and to transport goods. When the mail is not safe, our national economy cannot function properly. Since the attack on our country on September 11, the Postal Service has delivered 20 billion pieces of, of mail. And since that time, only a handful of mail has been found to be contaminated with anthrax. The odds of any family receiving a contaminated letter during this period are vanishingly small. But it is also clear that the mails are being used by terrorists to kill and injure innocent Americans. Since the September 11 attacks, anthrax contaminated mail has killed three people, caused inhalation or cutaneous infections in at least 15 others. Most of those killed or injured have been postal workers who were unknowingly infected while serving the public. I especially want to express my sympathies to the families of Thomas Morris, Jr. and Joseph Kersine, Jr., the two postal workers who died earlier this month from inhal inhalation anthrax. We must do everything in our power to stop these terrorists and ensure the safety of the mail. On September 11, terrorist attacks uh, were launched on New York and Washington using airlines. Three days later, Congress provided $40 billion to help New York and Washington respond. And one week after that, Congress provided another $15 billion to help the airlines cope. The mails are now under attack. We must respond just as quickly and just as forcefully to protect the mail. The Postal Service has said that the technology needed to respond to the anthrax attacks will cost $2.5 billion. I fully support helping the Postal Service pay for its response to the anthrax threat. In fact, I believe the Postal Service may need even more money to adequately protect the mail. But I also have questions about how this money will be spent. We need to act fast, but we also need to do it right. The Postal Service should have done emergency planning before the recent attacks that would provide a blueprint for how to respond, but the Postal Service didn't do this. In fact, the only emergency planning by the Postal Service before September 11 involved how the Postal Service would respond if attacks were launched against other targets. For example, if airlines were attacked and couldn't be used, the Postal Service had looked at alternatives for delivering the mail. The Postal Service had no plan for responding if the Postal Service itself were attacked. As a result, the Postal Service is now trying to do emergency planning at the worst possible time, in the midst of an emergency. Along the way, serious mistakes are being made, such as the tragedy at the Brentwood facility. We cannot afford additional mistakes. Improvements will cost money, but throwing money into the system doesn't necessarily bring about more safety. I will ask hard questions today about whether there is a magic technological fix to, to this problem. I will ask questions about whether the right process is in place for making sound judgments. Ultimately, what we may need is a common sense strategy that uses both low-tech safety precautions and new technologies. It's natural for families to have concerns about postal safety, but there is a problem we can address, and it's a problem that we must fix. Today's hearing will be an important part of that process. I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses today and the opportunity to ask questions so that we can evaluate what they have to tell us and figure out the best response given the difficulties we're facing, the fast time frame in which we have to act, 
and the amount of money that uh, will be involved. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Dr. Weldon. Um, I, too, want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. Um, I um, practiced uh, general internal medicine and infectious disease for seven years uh, prior to being elected. I also uh, was in the Army Medical Corps uh, and received some uh, training on uh, ChemBio. Uh, also, interestingly, my father, who is now deceased, uh, was a retired postal worker. And certainly, uh, my condolences go out to the uh, family members of those who have been stricken and all postal workers. Uh, and I certainly support efforts to uh, get our postal system fully up and running uh, and do everything that we can to reassure the, the American public uh, that the postal system is safe. And I commend you for the timeliness of this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Weldon. Uh, Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. First, Mr. Chairman, let me express on behalf of all the American people the sorrow and anguish we all feel for the postal employees who lost their lives. The postman or the postwoman on the beat are beloved fixtures on the American landscape. And to see this group of remarkably committed and decent and hardworking men and women under this threat pains every single American citizen. Mr. Chairman, I am as confident that we will win the war domestically as I am confident that we will win the war in Afghanistan. But while we can express our confidence in our long-term victory, it is important to put the minds of our loyal postal workers at ease. Their prime concern at the moment, obviously, is a health concern. And with the best health advice in the world, we will deal with that issue. I would like to spend a moment on their financial concerns. Long before September 11, the Postal Service was in very serious financial difficulties. As a matter of fact, in the 30 years since 1970, the cumulative deficit of the Postal Service was about $5 billion. I predict that the deficit of the Postal Service in the next two or three years will exceed $5 billion. And I, for one, want to put at ease the minds of all the postal workers that this Congress will stand beside them in meeting the financial challenge that the Postal Service will have to face. Since the first letter containing anthrax was mailed on September 18. 25 billion pieces of mail were safely delivered by the men and women of the Postal Service. And the very least these people are entitled to expect from their Congress is that we will see to it not only that their health is fully protected, but their financial future is fully protected for all postal employees currently working. Now, in the long run, there may be a systemic impact of this change. And that systemic impact may drastically reduce the use of the postal service. But I think it would be eminently unfair to impose a burden on men and women who have been devoting years of their lives to this important endeavor. My commitment, Mr. Chairman, is to see to it that we as a government stand behind the men and women of the Postal Service in these difficult days. I yield back. 
Thank you, Mr. Lantos. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing, and thank you, Mr. Waxman, for being so supportive of this hearing. I believe this is a hearing uh, in honor of Thomas Moore and Joseph Christine uh, and uh, all their fellow employees. Uh, that's what this hearing is about, to make sure that they are protected uh, in the future and to never forget the two who have lost their lives. Um, I'm going to submit my written statement. I just want to say these brief words. We are at war. We are at war. We are at war. We are at, in a race with the terrorist organizations to shut them down before they have a better delivery system for chemical and biological agents, before they get nuclear waste material they can put in a bomb and explode with all the toxicity that presents and before, heaven forbid, they get a nuclear weapon which they can blackmail us or detonate. That's what this is about. And um, Thomas Moore and Joseph Corsini are victims uh, of casualties of this war. We're going to learn how to fight it better and better as we go along, and we're going to succeed. Uh, but um, the bottom line is uh, we have a tough task ahead of us. And I know there are going to be a lot of should-haves. Uh, there isn't anyone in this room who can't look at themselves in the mirror and say, we should have or I should have. Uh, and that includes all of us. Uh, but obviously, we in government have the responsibility to take action, and we're going to. But I'm going to try real hard not to be part of the should-haves, because um, I know that list is endless. Um, and I know I'm part of that list. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, Ms. Maloney? Ms. Maloney? You have an opening statement. We're, 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 and I, I would urge everyone, because we're going to lose part of our panel, I think, okay. at 1.30, if we Just, can make uh, Just very briefly, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member. Uh, three people, including two postal workers, have died, and others have uh, been infected. We need to review and do everything possible to protect uh, their health in the future. This is a, a, an issue of, of tremendous importance to me. Anthrax spores were found in four sorting machines at New York City's largest mail distribution center. The executive board of the city's largest postal workers union voted yesterday to file a lawsuit to have the facility closed for a thorough cleaning. Health officials, however, have told the workers that there is no danger for em employees and that they should continue working in the building. I must say that many postal workers have been calling my district office and calling me uh, saying, why will you not close the post office when you closed the congressional buildings when spores were found? And I think that's a legitimate question. On Wednesday night, the Postal Service began giving a 10-day supply of the antibiotic Cipro to 7,000 New York City postal employees as a precautionary measure. Uh, the Cipro is being made available to employees at Morgan Sorting Center, the James A. Farley uh, Mail Building, Asonia Mail Station, Radio City Station, Rockefeller Center Station, and the Times Square Station. So uh, we are responding to their health. I, I must uh, mention that even before the September 11th tragedy, and the anthrax scares, the Postal Service was projected to lose $1.6 billion in 2001, and now it's going to be much worse. Uh, since September 11, uh, five magazines have gone out of business, many of them housed in the district that I represent. Mademoiselle, that I grew up with, is now out of business. And uh, one of the challenges that we face is, is uh, to make sure that we continue to have a competitive and universal mail service. You can't really blame anyone uh, for being concerned about the mail these days, but we have to keep things in perspective. 680 million pieces of mail move each and every day, and the risk to the general public is infinitesimal. And anthrax mailings have apparently been confined to a small number of organizations and elected officials, though I must uh, mention very disturbing news that a 61-year-old woman who worked in my district at, at Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Nose and Throat Hospital had no contact uh, or didn't work with the mail, is, is deathly ill, and has uh, been exposed and infected. 
The mailing industry is tremendously important to our economy. It's actually 8% of our GNP, a $900 billion uh, industry. And uh, really, uh, it's uh, tremendously important to our country. I certainly uh, support uh, the efforts by the Postal Service to purchase the sanitation machines. And, and the price tag alone for this is going to be in the neighborhood of 2 to $3 billion, I'm told. And uh, many people have not focused on is that the mail volume has, has dropped uh, since September 11th, which means that the USPS is, is losing uh, more money every single day. And I have seen some estimates that put this reduction at 10 percent. I, I uh, applaud the administration for coming forward with a $175 million influx of funding to assist and support uh, the United States Mail Ser Service. And I applaud uh, the efforts of my colleagues, Danny Davis and Congressman McHugh. Uh, Danny Davis has come forward with a, a, a stirring uh, resolution honoring the postal workers, their loss of life, the bravery. They're in the their soldiers every day going to work and, and getting the mail out to people. And I applaud the work of the task force that uh, McHugh and Davis have put forward to look at uh, postal reform. This may be the time that we should move forward, uh, not only with the influx of the, the dollars uh, for the new machines, the new protections, uh, but the reform that has so long been debated. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schrock, I, I guess you don't have an only statement. Thank you, Mr. Schrock. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to say thank you for holding this very important hearing at a time when our postal workers have been put at high risk and the possibility still remains that there will be even more risk. And I look forward to um, hearing the comments from the distinguished panel. Thank you. Ms. Norton. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you especially for your rapid response in holding this hearing. Uh, I don't need to, to tell, tell you that we in the district uh, feel very much at ground zero. We're still grieving the loss of uh, two postal workers who served us valiantly, had, had particularly good record in the Postal Service. Soldiers go to battle prepared to die. People don't go to the post office prepared for their families uh, to hear that they too have died. I believe, uh, because I've worked closely with the post office and with the CDC, that our federal officials are working very hard every day very long hours trying to come to grips with this uh, matter. I agree with uh, my good friend, Mr. Shays, who says the finger pointing won't do us uh, any good now. Uh, I am a problem solver, not a finger pointer. I do think it is important uh, to assure the country that the District of Columbia experience will not be repeated elsewhere and that we will get control of the experience in this city very soon not only because the Congress is here or the President is here, but because 600,000 people live here. Um, I don't believe that the people who live here or even that our postal workers have been guinea pigs, pigs as some have said, out of bitterness, and bitterness is perhaps understandable. I do believe that we were the first to test the system and that, and that the test showed multiple defects, including the worst defect of all, the, the death of uh, two postal workers. Unfortunately for the post office, the shutdown of the House has created a gold standard. I was just on MSNBC, and I was asked this question. After detailing these deaths, I was asked, why then should we not close down the mail system of the United States, or at least of the East Coast, until you get this problem under control? Why won't you know? I said, I don't think you should do that. I said that without a lot of, of, of evidence and information except the information I have. And I told him this, that I am not about to be terrorized to the point of getting that far in front of the evidence before us. And I certainly hope we are not anywhere near there. But I do say to you that we need an alternative to doomsday scenarios like closing down the house. It's going to be very hard for me to say to the people now in two of our post offices in the District of Columbia, Southwest and Friendship, that they shouldn't evacuate the place immediately and close it down. We evacuated this place before a single granule was found, and now we've only found trace amounts. There have got to be alternatives to this kind of panicked uh, scenario, panic that everyone understands in the, in the absence of information. But surely 
are not the best way to go about ensuring the country that we got to get back to normal, as the president, I think, justifiably says. Uh, if we can terrorize a nation on the cheap this way by putting, you know, an envelope or two in the mail, then all that our administration is doing to close off the money supply becomes quite irrelevant because it doesn't take a lot of money to do what you have to do to terrorize a nation. We've got to quickly find a way to meet the major challenge of lumbering bureaucracies that are being called upon to somehow be a finely honed machine that can take on a crisis and solve it quickly. I suggest that small task-oriented groups with all the major actors working at the same time at the same table may be necessary if you have an unprecedented crisis. For example, postal facilities were not the logical place to start given the science that you knew. But the science that you knew didn't turn out to be uh, de definitive because you had so little ex science, so little experience with anthrax, uh, and it was so old. I think we need new hypotheses uh, in order to reach beyond the science. Uh, I'm very concerned that the two neighborhood facilities where there have, has been some anthrax will send yet another perhaps false message to the public, hey, it's coming downstream and it's finally going to get in your mail. We've got to stop. We've got to have enough information to, to make people cautious without panicking them to the point of believing that now one of the great institutions of the United States, without which we cannot do, ought to be solved, uh, shut down until we can somehow, quote, solve this problem. Uh, as you get closer to the general public, that is going to be your challenge. I'm sure you can meet it. I'll be very pleased to hear what you have to say today. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Because we all want to see our mail service continue and because we must provide for the health of postal workers and for the security of our mail, those entities handling anthrax incidents need to abide by at least three principles. First, affected individuals must be given detailed information and receive consistent updates as to the potential contamination levels of confirmed contamination, the health risks posed, steps that can be taken to prevent infection, symptoms to watch out for, and treatment options. Unfortunately, this has not occurred. Numerous postal employees have complained to me about the lack of information from postal and health authorities. Initially, for instance, the CDC did not believe postal workers and mail handlers were at risk of anthrax infection from handling sealed mail. While the first deaths of postal workers from inhalational anthrax forced CDC to revise its assumptions, the conflicting information undermined the trust of postal workers in their leadership and in their health authorities. Moreover, though CDC has revised its recommendations and many postal workers are now receiving prophylactic treatment, those still on the job have not received adequate instruction on precautionary measures and symptoms to look out for. Many postal employees have received gloves, but it appear, appears few have been told how to use them and dispose of them properly so that potential contaminants are not spread. In the wake of these recent anthrax incidents, the Postal Service is experiencing as much as a 40 percent absenteeism rate in cities such as New York. This, I believe, is a direct consequence of postal employees feeling underinformed about the threat, the health risk, safety precautions, and treatment. This must change. The second principle, CDC, the post office, mail operations and government entities and other potential targets and local health authorities must better coordinate their efforts and respond aggressively to potential contamination and infection. Press reports suggest that health authorities have been unable to comprehensively track the condition of all employees who work in contaminated areas. This renders likely the possibility that an exposed individual might contract anthrax infection and become seriously ill before the CDC and other health authorities are even aware of the case. It also appears that not all local health authorities and individual entities with mail operations are able to immediately re recognize contamination or infection. The mailroom employee at the Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital in New York, recently hospitalized for inhalational anthrax, 
went four days after exhibiting initial symptoms before she was admitted to the ventilator. Third, the FBI's criminal investigation of these attacks, while very important, must not trump the public health response to these attacks. Though authorities have been reluctant to do so, the level of contamination at affected sites, the nature of the contamination, and the way in which testing is being conducted to determine contamination must be made known to all interested parties. More, uh, moreover, the FBI must expedite the sharing of information as anthrax exposure and infection, uh, on anthrax exposure and infection by federal and local health authorities. This would seem self-evident. However, we must make sure that the interim guidelines for reporting of anthrax by the CDC, which re requires the FBI receive notice first, are not interpreted to mean that information in a criminal investigation takes priority over emergent public health concerns. In the weeks since the September 11th attacks, many officials here in Washington have invoked the following principle, that a government's number one responsibility is the protection of its citizens. Let us proceed with this hearing in that spirit. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, just a few days ago, uh, my colleague uh, Ben Cardin and I went to the um, uh, Baltimore main post office in downtown Baltimore and um, had an opportunity to go through the post office. And um, after seeing the many people there hard at work with their mask on, many of them with gloves, and having a chance to talk to them. It's interesting, Mr. Chairman, that not one of them said we should slow down. But what they did say, Mr. Chairman, was that, Congressman, we want you all to look out for us. We want you all to make sure that we are protected. We want you to do every single thing in your power to make sure that there is not another death. And, Mr. Chairman, that's why this the hearing is so timely. There were 20 men, when we got to the end of the tour, after about an hour, who were sitting in a, l a lunchroom. And I'll never forget the questions that they asked. Like, well, um, one of them said he had been at Brentwood, and should he not be getting tested? Should he be getting Cipro? Another one asked, well, you know, will it make a difference whether uh, we wear gloves. It seems like this, these particles are so minute that it won't make too much difference. So it does the mass make a difference? And Ben Cardin and I stood there as the union people and the administrators tried to answer their questions. And on my way here today, one of them said to me, I ran into him on the street. He said, I heard they're having a, a hearing on, on us today. And he said, don't forget what we said. Look out for us. Don't forget us. We're the ones that make sure the mail goes through. And so, Mr. Chairman, uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but you, Mr. Chairman, to your credit, was addressing the issue of anthrax a long time ago, far uh, earlier than September the 11th, because I remember sitting in the hearings. And so we've, we've got a major situation here, but I, 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 I too agree with Congressman Shea. I, you know, we, we've got to be careful that we make sure that the mail goes through, but we've got to also do everything in our power to protect these men and women who are very, very brave and, 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 and do a job that many Americans probably wouldn't even want to be bothered with. But that American spirit, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that bold spirit that we saw, that Ben Cardin and I saw, um, just cries out for us to do everything in our power to protect them. And if we don't do it, then they ask the question, who will? Thank you, Mr. Cummins. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you and ranking member, Mr. Waxman, for convening this hearing to discuss the safety of postal employees and the mail. Since the terrorist attacks of September the 11th, life as we have once knew it has never been and never will be the same. The attacks of September the 11th have caused a ripple effect that has reverberated throughout our economy and throughout our entire society. 
Earlier this month, reports surfaced of anthrax-tainted mail. The anthrax-tainted mail seems to have been targeted to government officials, media, and other innocent civilians. Since the founding of our postal system, there is no report of biological agents being used as a weapon of war in the mail. Our mail system is vital to the nation, accounting for approximately 8 percent of the gross national product. The overall goal of the Postal Service is to bind the nation together through a communication system that is the best in the world. The perpetrators of anthrax-tainted mail seek to disrupt our communications network and threaten the viability of not only our mail service, but of our nation. There are those who criticize the Postal Service for responding too slowly to the anthrax threat. To those, I say I understand the criticism, but I also suggest that it is much easier to criticize than to find solutions. Find solutions to fear and terror that is spreading throughout the country. The threat of anthrax tainted mail is new for all of us. And now is the time to pull together to successfully combat it. I, along with Representative John McHugh, will introduce a resolution later today honoring the 800,000 plus men and women in the United States Postal Service who have done an outstanding job of delivering the mail throughout this national emergency. Since the terrorist attacks of September the 11th, the men and women of the United States Postal Service have processed and delivered more than 20 billion pieces of mail. In addition to honoring postal workers, we pledge to help make sure that the service with the resources that they are available to ensure the safety of their employees and the general public. I also, Mr. Chairman, want to extend my condolences and prayers to the families of the postal workers and all of the rest of the people in our country who have actually died as a result of this assault. It is important that we hold this hearing today as more than 13,000 USPS employees are being treated for anthrax prophylactically. And three, of course, U.S. Postal Service employees remain hospitalized, suffering from inhalation anthrax. Today, Mr. Chairman, I believe that we send a message to the terrorists that we will not be frightened into fear, we will not be delayed, and we will not be denied. We will make every effort to make absolutely certain that every employee of the Postal Service has the safest, most desirable work-related and work experiences that we can possibly have. And yes, Mr. Chairman, there were problems relative to the funding and financing and the business of the postal operation and services before the anthrax scare. But I believe that this also provides us with an opportunity to look comprehensively at what is needed, and at the same time that we find a solution to the problem of bioterrorism, that we also find a way to bind up the postal system, period, so that we can continue to provide service, be the great nation, and continue to communicate as the postal system has allowed us to do. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Mink, you have an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, too, want to join my colleagues in expressing a great uh, appreciation for the convening of this hearing. And I hope that it's a <clears throat> mere beginning of a series of hearings that uh, you will hold so that we can um, find out exactly what happened in these last two weeks. I'm very much distressed uh, to read uh, reports of dissatisfaction among the uh, postal workers uh, that their uh, needs and concerns about their health are not being attended to. I'm concerned uh, with the uh, reliance of the postal authorities on the uh, CDC's recommendations that the facility at Brentwood did not need to be closed when we already knew two days before that that uh, cutaneous uh, anthrax infection did occur in a postal worker that merely handled mail in New Jersey. I'm also distressed that it's taken us two weeks to really uh, get into 
uh, understanding of the uh, nature of this uh, uh, threat and uh, uh, who did it and all the rest of it. So I think that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this should be a mere beginning of our inquiry because I think that we are expressing concerns that are felt uh, throughout this nation. Uh, frankly, I think that the burdens of uh, inquiry and protection and safety uh, for the workers ought not to be the expense of the postal system. The Congress ought to be willing to fund uh, whatever is necessary. If the facilities are closed and there are expenses with relation to that, the uh, Congress ought to fund it, just as we were ready uh, to fund uh, <clears throat> the uh, other uh, uh, atrocious events that have uh, overtaken our country. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for these hearings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mink. Uh, before we get uh, to our panel, let, let me just uh, ask that we uh, have a moment of silence for Thomas Morris and uh, Joseph, Joseph Kersen, Kersen, and uh, the other people who've been infected with this uh, terrible thing and for our nation. So can we have about uh, a few seconds for a moment of silence? Thank you. We will now welcome our first panel, Chief Inspector Kenneth C. Weaver, Dr. Mitch Cohen, and uh, James Jarbo. Is that correct? correct how I pronounce that, Dr. James Jarbo? Uh, would you please rise and raise your right hand? You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. Do any of you have an opening statement you'd like to make, or do you want to get right to questions? I do, Mr. Chairman, if you Mr. Weaver? permit. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate very much the opportunity to update you today on the activities of the Inspection Service as they relate to the terrorist acts of September 11th and the anthrax mailings. I'm pleased to participate on a panel with our law enforcement partners in this war on terrorism, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We are in the midst of an unprecedented attack on our nation's mail system. Never in our history has the mail been used to deliver biological terror as we have experienced this month. Postal employees have been placed directly in harm's way during this attack. And sadly, we have lost two of our own in this new war. The entire postal community mourns these two fine, dedicated employees who died in the line of duty. Since September 11th, the Postal Inspection Service, the law enforcement and security arm of the Postal Service, has been on high alert, as all law enforcement agencies across our country have been. Our mission of protecting the United States Postal Service, its employees and customers from criminal attack, and protecting the nation's mail system from criminal misuse has never been more challenging since September 11th. I have directed all 1,900 postal inspectors and 1,400 uniformed police officers that their highest priority is the investigative and security work in support of the terrorist and anthrax investigations. Unless these personnel are involved in the investigation of crimes of violence, such as assaults of postal employees, robberies of post offices, or mail bombs, they are now on the front lines in this war on terrorism. As you may know, the FBI has been designated by the Department of Justice as the lead agency on all terrorist investigations. In matters involving the Postal Service or the U.S. Mail, and where our investigative or forensic expertise can be beneficial to the overall investigation, the Postal Inspection Service commits resources to terrorist investigations. Postal inspectors are members of the Joint Terrorism Task Forces and the Attorney General's Anti-Terrorism Task Forces in all parts of the country and are integral contributors to the September 11th terrorist investigation. Inspectors are assigned to the FBI's Strategic Information Operations Center and FBI agents are assigned to Inspection Service headquarters where they partner with postal inspectors to coordinate our national efforts. The Deputy Director of the FBI and my Deputy Chief for Investigations are in regular contact to ensure our respective organizations are working together. Postal inspectors are assigned to FEMA and we are also coordinating our efforts with the new Office of Homeland Security. 
We have assigned some of our forensic experts to assist in the examination of the anthrax letters and other evidence. On October 18, the United States Postal Inspection Service, in partnership with the FBI, offered a reward of $1 million for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those who are responsible for the anthrax mailings. An additional unique partnership has been established with America's Most Wanted to handle the phone calls. To date, we have received over 165 investigative leads from these calls and are following up on them. The safety of postal employees remains the top priority of our service. We are working with postal management to provide security updates and educating employees about the critical need to make security everyone's business. Security of the mail also continues to be a top priority. Inspection service personnel are posted at selected postal mail processing facilities to screen mail. The Postal Service has established a mail security task force comprised of, comprised of representatives of the labor unions, management associations, postal operations, and the mailing industry. The Postmaster General has put me in charge of this effort. Safety of the American public is also paramount to our mission. We have produced an inf informational video on mailroom security, a poster on suspicious packages and letters, and a postcard that was delivered to every address in the nation, advising them of precautions to take in handling the mail. Regular messaging continues via our websites, and inspectors are making presentations to businesses, community groups, and law enforcement organizations on safe mail handling procedures. We are coordinating our efforts with state and local governments. For example, we have discussed mail handling procedures with the adjutant generals of all 50 states' national guards. And we have reached out with this same message to over 500 congressional district offices via telecons. Our joint investigative and security efforts are resource intensive, but will continue until the mails are safe and the criminals who are committing these crimes are behind bars. The strict devotion of resources is strained, strained by the need to respond and investigate anthrax hoaxes, threats, and suspicious letters and packages. Over 7,000 incidents have been reported to the Inspection Service in the past few weeks, an average of almost 600 per day. Almost 300 postal facilities have had periods of evacuation as a result of these threats and hoaxes. But we have a message for those who use this time to contribute to the unrest and terror. If we find you, we are going to prosecute you and send you to jail. So far, we have arrested 18 people and have an additional 14 cases pending prosecution. The Inspection Service has a long and proud tradition of aggressively pursuing all types of postal criminals, from robbers to murderers, mail bombers to child pornographers, male thieves to male fraud con artists, the men and women of the United States Postal Inspection Service will stay on the case until the perpetrators are caught and brought to justice. Mr. Chairman, you can be assured the Postal Inspection Service will continue this proud tradition and remain on this case to make sure the mails are safe and ensure America's confidence in the mail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, opening statements? Dr. Dr. Cohen. First, uh, Chairman uh, Burton, uh, Mr. Waxman, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate uh, in this hearing. Uh, I am the uh, director of the Division of Bacterial and Mycotic Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control. I'm accompanied today by Dr. Rima Kabaz, who is the uh, team leader uh, for the investigative team uh, in the D.C. area. Uh, I've provided a written statement for the record and just want to make a couple of brief comments. Uh, since October 3rd, we've been investigating uh, cases of anthrax in four areas, Florida, New York, uh, New Jersey, and in the district. Uh, to date, there have been 15 confirmed cases of anthrax. Nine of these have been inhalational. Six of them have been cutaneous. There have been uh, three deaths. The epidemiologic investigation has indicated that letters containing anthrax were the vehicle of transmission for these illnesses. The Centers for Disease Control has expended a great effort uh, to be able to investigate these outbreaks. We're working very closely uh, with uh, many state and local health departments, 
various federal agencies, federal workers, to try to protect the public health and the health of all of our citizens. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, Mr. Jabot, you're a Hoosier, I understand, so uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, other ladies and gentlemen of the uh, committee. Uh, just a, a couple of things very briefly so that the questions uh, may be put forth. Uh, the structure of the current... Can you bring the mic a little closer, please? Okay. Is that any better? Uh, there, that might okay. be better. Currently, we've restructured the investigation from where it was in the inception uh, as far as the anthrax investigation goes. We brought in a senior sp agent from our Washington field office, an assistant special agent charged to oversee the combined efforts of the investigation for Miami, New York, Washington, D.C., and, and the ancillary investigation in Newark. Uh, we've done this to make sure it's compact, concise, and there's one single focus. Uh, yesterday, we brought in representatives from all those field offices as well as other offices that had lead information to Washington and had an all-day conference to make sure everyone understood exactly what our, our process was, what our focus was, and to make sure that all the investigators from the different offices were aware of what was going on in any other office as well as the forensic information available. We did this again to make sure that we continue to keep the investigation as sharply focused as we can so that we can get results as quickly as possible. The case is obviously joined with the uh, investigation of the September 11th bombings. It's the uh, most intensive investigations that we've had in, in the Bureau's history, uh, up to 7,000 plus individuals, and that fluctuates on a daily basis depending on need, have been involved in the investigation. In my 22 years with the FBI, I've never seen anything this intense. Uh, we have daily briefings with the director. Uh, he wants to make sure he's totally engaged, and then as incidents pop up during the day that he needs to be aware of, uh, I've spent many a days, many an hour in his office to make sure he's fully aware and fully engaged. Uh, one thing I would like to, to say and bring out is the fact that uh, not only the FBI, but state and local authorities are getting tremendously overwhelmed with the anthrax hoaxes that have cropped up since the initial uh, information of, about the actual threats. Uh, on a routine basis, we'll handle approximately 250 uh, threat analysis per year in the, in the WA weapons of mass destruction arena. In the first two weeks of October, we handled over 2,000 of these, and, and that pace has not slowed down. I said it's not only the FBI resources, but we have local police departments, state authorities that have to respond in conjunction with uh, what the federal authorities are doing, and all of them are being overwhelmed. I, I'm pleased to see that the Attorney General and the United States Attorneys throughout the country have taken a very aggressive stance about prosecuting those who would perpetrate an anthrax hoax. The resources that are required to respond to those are indeterminable, and I don't think the individuals have a concept of not only the resources that they use, but the terror that they bring to the victims. Uh, they may think it's a joke, but if you're in receipt of a letter that powder comes out of, it is no joke. Uh, I would like to say that there's been very, very close coordination with the uh, Postal Service and with CDC. Dr. Cohen, from the inception of the investigation in Miami, has been literally living in my space at FBI headquarters. He's there on a daily basis, and uh, he has been an absolute tremendous asset to us to make sure that the FBI keeps focused on the health issues. And as, as uh, Representative Kucinich stated, the health issues are more important than the prosecutive issues at this point. Uh, Dr. Cohen has been just beyond uh, of a great help, just a tremendous assistant. We've also had Ray Smith from the United States Postal Service also working in our space in on every briefing and in the meetings at a desk in, so that he can coordinate uh, the postal efforts with the FBI efforts and that there's no, th no information that we have or the Postal Service has that doesn't cross back and forth and that we're all totally, so that we're all totally informed of all aspects of the investigation. I would like to say that the, the system did work in the inception. Uh, it's designed that if a disease breaks, uh, that the state local health officials are first notified and then they follow on with CDC and then CDC will make uh, that not proper notification to the, to the FBI of a potential criminal investigation. That's exactly what happened in this case. Uh, in the initial steps, we were there to support CDC uh, as an assist to their efforts to determine uh, the epidemiological problems that they had in Florida, and it gradually rolled into a criminal investigation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just start the questioning off uh, by uh, asking, what are the penalties for a uh, mail that uh, is a hoax, where they uh, put powder in it? Those penalties can range up to the, the same penalties for mailing uh, the agent itself. 
and some U.S. attorneys I've heard uh, are charging people with the same seriousness of the crime as if they had mailed. So, so the penalty could be what, what five, ten? Could years? be life. Could be yep. up to life in prison. I think that that's a message that I hope everybody in the country hears. If you start sending something like that out as a joke, that you could end up in jail for a substantial period of time. It really isn't funny. Uh, yesterday, the Attorney General, and I'll ask this to Mr. Jabot, uh, the Attorney General issued an alert uh, warning of the possible a terrorist attack uh, this next week. Let me just ask a, a couple of questions regarding that, and you can answer them at one time. What can the American people expect, if you can tell us that? What kind of information was this alert based upon, if you can tell us that? And I understand there's uh, classified material there. Is there any intelligence about specific targets, or is this uh, more of a general threat? And what should the American public do uh, in response uh, to this, uh, this alert? And what should state and local law enforcement people do? As you said, Mr. Chairman, it is nonspecific, and I believe that's the message that the Attorney General put forward. Uh, the source of the information is classified, so I, I don't want to go into that source here at this uh, open briefing. Uh, what should the citizens do? What should state and local law enforcement do? Uh, and I know it's been said before, uh, they have to be on even higher alert than is the normal. And I know the nation has been on, on very high alert ever since September 11th. Uh, if we had specific information about a specific target at a specific time, that information certainly would be made known so that we could protect those targets. Uh, one of the reasons we set forth or put forth the, uh, the warning is to make sure that everything maintains an elevation at the highest, highest peak of preparedness. If we can do that, then hopefully we can disrupt any plans that are in, in process. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not have specific information about what the targets may be. Does uh, it appear that the anthrax that were in the three letters to Tom Brokaw, Brokaw uh, Senator Daschle, and uh, the New York Post, uh, did they come from the same source? The information that we had was that the anthrax in the letter to Senator Daschle was finely milled a very uh, high grade, if you want to call it that. And uh, the, uh, uh, the letter to Tom Brokaw was a more uh, unrefined kind of anthrax spore. Uh, do you believe these came from the same source or these uh, different sources? Uh, your description of the uh, two separate packages is correct. Uh, as of right now, the information we have is that the anthrax that we, uh, samples that we do have are indistinguishable from one another on a DNA analysis. There's continuing analysis being done uh, to bring the, them down to the rudimentary elements and see exactly what we have. But again, as of this point, we have the information shows that they are indistinguishable. Well, why would they send a more refined form in one letter to Senator Daschle and, and not have the more refined uh, form into uh, Brokaw's office? That's a question that we do not have the answer yet. And part of the investigation will be to focus on that and why the two separate types. I see. I presume you're probably checking to see if different cells had different mechanisms for delivery and refinement. We're checking everything that we can think of, yes, sir. With respect, uh, this goes to Dr. Cohn, with respect to the contamination in the Brentwood facility here in Washington, I believe the original theory was that the anthrax escaped from the Daschle letter and contaminated other mail. Is that correct? Oh, that's certainly one possible explanation. Well, there's more and more mailrooms in the federal office building are having positive tests. Does that lead you to believe that uh, uh, those mailrooms were infected with the same letter? Well, there are other alternatives. Uh, the possibility would be that there are additional letters. Uh, the uh, cases of disease, uh, particularly inhalation disease, suggest that individuals were uh, exposed to an aerosol. And uh, that potential uh, possibility would uh, suggest that there may be more than one letter that had passed through the facilities. I presume that the FBI, I know there's a huge volume of mail that's over there being stored. Are they going through that to see if there's any other letters that are containing anthrax spores? Uh, yes, sir, we are. We've, we're making plans to go through that uh, piece by piece. Uh, let me ask one question of uh, uh, Mr. Inspector Weaver and Mr. Jabot. Uh, a large volume of mail has been collected and sent to Ohio and other destinations to be sanitized using irradiation technology. Some mail is also being held for investigation purposes. 
Are these pieces of mail being checked for anthrax? And do you believe that there may be one or more letters out there containing anthrax that haven't been detected? You're correct. We are sending that mail to, uh, to be sanitized. And upon the return of that, uh, as Mr. Jarbo indicated, we will thoroughly uh, jointly go through that mail and, and look for characteristics uh, uh, that might be uh, indicative of, what, of the mailings, uh, prior mailings that were made. Does that answer the question? Yes, sir. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know that all of you had to deal with an unprecedented and difficult situation, uh, but un unfortunately, this may not be an unusual situation in this country when we have a terrorist attack in one form of, of an or another. Um, so I want to ask you about, first of all, the coordination, which of course leads to how the communications were, uh, were handled with the public, whether there were inconsistent messages sent, and whether there was a different standard for people that were exposed to anthrax. First of all, Mr. Uh, Gerbeau, you uh, one of the most common complaints was that the uh, uh, agency was not doing a good job coordinating with the other agencies. And I want to ask you about this, particularly as it relates to the anthrax in the mails. After anthrax was discovered in Senator Daschle's office, the Capitol Police turned it over to the Army lab at Fort Detrick and my understanding is that the Army had the responsibility to inform the FBI of the test results, and then the FBI had the responsibility to inform the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, is, is my understanding correct of the way it was supposed to be handled? That's correct. They informed us, and we worked in conjunction with CDC. That's correct, sir. So on October 18th, we had newspaper articles quoting law enforcement sources as saying the anthrax in Senator Daschle's office was weaponized. Uh, the article seemed to indicate the anthrax was made up of fine particles. But the next day, the newspapers uh, contained different information. Those articles said the anthrax was just run-of-the-mill anthrax. And then on October 25th, the papers were again reporting that the anthrax was indeed made of fine particles that were easily suspended in the air. When did the Army and the FBI determine the small size of the anthrax spores? And when did the Army and the FBI first suspect the small size of these uh, anthrax spores? The first information we had about the uh, physical properties of the anthrax that was found in Senator Daschle's letter was the evening of October 15. And um, why was there so much confusion about it? Whether it was a large spore or a small spore, whether it was different than the other anthrax that we'd seen. It seemed to me that it shouldn't be that difficult uh, to, uh, to determine the size of a spore. Well, I think the most confusion came in media reports and that partial information or misinformation was given to the media and, and they reported it as they received it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Cohen was in our space the evening, I believe it was around 9 or 10 o'clock p.m. when we got the first reports in indicating the preliminary analysis of size and, and composition. And again, that was a preliminary analysis. It had to go on to subsequent tests to be confirmed. Well, let me go into the question of the, of the confusion about communicating to the public. Uh, Jeffrey Copeland, who is the president, uh, director of the CDC, has said that his agency did not have any opportunity to examine the letter or its contents, as the letter that went to Senator Daschle's office. And according to the Washington Post on October 26, Copeland indicated CDC investigators were not shown the letter and had no idea of the condition of the envelope. And Dr. Copeland has stated that his agency did not recognized that the anthrax in the Daschle letter consisted of tiny particles that could seep out through the pores in the envelope until it was too late to save the postal workers. Uh, wh why were the CDC investigators not shown the Daschle letter? Well, the letter was in the uh, laboratory at USAMRIT. And when was the information about the quality of anthrax spores, including the size and any additives, communicated to the CDC? The evening of the 15th, when uh, the initial reports came in, uh, Dr. Cohen and CDC w were made aware. And then once the scientists got together after they had done a further analysis and determined additional physical properties, a phone call was made to uh, the deputy director of CDC with that information. So you, you, you maintain that he was informed immediately then on October 15th? 
Well, again, we had preliminary information, and what we were putting out is what the, the preliminary look-see was from the laboratory without any formal analysis. Um, you know, I, I don't want to rehash it all, but we have to learn from this experience on how to deal with these problems in the future. And I want to ask you one last question, because I know my time is about to expire. But uh, FEA, FEI contains, uh, retains the custody of much of the mail that came to Capitol Hill along with the Daschle letter. Now, there's a lot of anxiety about cross-contamination of mail with anthrax spores. Americans justifiably would like to know the risk of contracting anthrax in their homes for mail that might have come in contact with an anthrax-laced uh, letter. Uh, one way to assess the risk of such cross-contamination would be to test some of the mail that the FBI has in its custody. These letters were part of the same batches as the Daschle letter or subsequent batches. Has the FBI tested the outside of these other envelopes for anthrax spores? Has the FBI tested whether anthrax spores stuck to these envelopes have the capacity to re uh, aerosolize? And would the FBI consider it? conducting such tests if you haven't done so already. Right. They have not been conducted at this point. We have all the mail, and we, we have recently located a, a physical location where we can go through the mail. And again, we're going to go through it piece by piece to see if we can find any additional letters that may have gone through the system and just not have been delivered at the same time that Senator Dasher received his letter and conduct any appropriate laboratory analysis from that point. How, how has it taken so long to, to see whether there's a cross-contamination with other letters because these other letters could be delivering the anthrax from exposure to the letter from Senator Daschle. Why is it taking so long and why is it taking so long? Well, it's been going through on a, a very slow, I shouldn't say slow, that's the wrong word, a very specific procedural basis so that we can make sure that we have it, A, we have to have a place to do it. We, we had trouble getting a physical location to go through. This is a, a large volume of, of letters that we're talking about. And then we have to get the procedures in place to go through it to make sure that those who are re reviewing it are not contaminated and that we can make sure that when we, if we have something there that is properly preserved, we can identify exactly what we do have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real, real quickly, was that mail sent out to Ohio to be decontaminated so you can examine it? Uh, no, I don't believe perhaps you can answer that, Mr. Weaver. Well, it's my understanding that was the process that we well, were going to send it out, out and get it sanitized and bring it yeah. back. Has it been brought back or checked? Uh, we've just begun that well, process as far as uh, I think the first trailer is coming back now and well, we're my looking for my, my colleague, he, he, he makes a very salient point here. If it takes a long time for that, a lot of these people who may have been touching some mail that was in close proximity to the Daschle letter, they could become infected and have uh, uh, inhalation anthrax and, and, and be on, have a death sentence because of the time delay. Well, bear in mind, we're capturing all that mail. None of it's going to be delivered that, for that particular See, location. So none of that mail was right. delivered. You're, That's you're, correct. You're sure of that? Yes. And none of the mail that was in close proximity to the Daschle letter was delivered? That's the mail that we have captured that we want to send to Ohio, get sanitized, and bring it back, and then go through a methodical examination of that with the FBI. Dr. Weldon. Uh, Dr. Cohen, could you comment on the number of spores that an individual might have to inhale to become sick with an inhalation anthrax? Yes, the, uh, the various studies that were done suggest that uh, one would need to inhale anywhere between 8,000 to 50,000 spores to get inhalational disease. And what about a quantity of spores that would have to get on your skin uh, to get the cutaneous form of anthrax? That's not as well known. Uh, my understanding is that uh, it requires a break in the skin for the anthrax spores to cause infection. Uh, is there any evidence that intact skin can be infected by anthrax? Well, historically, most of the cases of cutaneous anthrax were in people who had had injuries, who had exposure to animal sources which were contaminated with spores. Uh, we are seeing patients now who do not report having 
areas of skin that were damaged prior to developing a lesion. So there may be something that is different about this in our past experience, suggesting that disease could occur under those circumstances. The question of the level of exposure is a question I'm getting asked uh, a great deal. Uh, we have a situation in the Longworth building here on Capitol Hill. Um, in the case of uh, one of the offices, uh, it was a surveillance wipe that came up positive. And the method that's used, as I understand, they take something resembling a 4 by 4 gauze pad and rub it on a series of desks, and then they uh, put it in a, a vial with some buffer solution, spin it down, um, extract a sample of fluid out, and plate that. Uh, now, as I understand it, in these offices, they got very little growth. They got a few colonies on a plate. Um, it, it is my opinion, my medical opinion, that a, a level of anthrax like that poses no threat for inhalation anthrax, uh, and it only poses a threat for cutaneous anthrax if you had an open skin lesion and you happened to get the anthrax into that area. Would you concur with that? Uh, generally, yes, I would agree. I think that you're talking about fairly low levels of, uh, of presence of spores. And in addition, there were studies that were done in the 1950s that showed that these types of particles that fell out of an initial aerosol were generally heavier and were difficult to re-aerosolize so that they would be, in fact, even less of a risk uh, for inhalation disease. I think the, uh, the risk, as you suggest, perhaps would be too cutaneous. Uh, again, we have this unknown as to whether or not there may be some factor that might make normal skin susceptible. But I would agree with you know, your assessment. Now, based on uh, the fact that we have um, surveillance tests coming up positive on a lot of postal equipment, but we do not have uh, reports of a letter with powder in it, uh, it has been uh, presumed that a lot of this is cross-contamination, and it's been reported that the um, uh, particles in the letter to Senator Daschle's office was uh, very, very fine and had the ability to get through an envelope. Um, is it safe to say that um, some of this that is coming up positive, the anthrax, does not likely pose a threat of inhaled anthrax for the postal workers in those areas, but more a cutaneous threat? Again, I think uh, that it would in part relate to how it got there. For example, if a letter was torn and some of the powder spilled out, if someone generated an aerosol with that by, say, using a high-pressure hose or something, then you could potentially get particles into the air that, that could be a risk. Uh, if these were particles now that... That is what happened at Brentwood, it's believed. They were using uh, an air, a uh, compressed air gun to clean out sorting machines. Again, that's one of the hypotheses as to, you know, how an aerosol could have been created. I'm out of time. Could I just ask you a follow-up question, though? What happened down in Florida? Was there a letter that came through? Is there evidence of the letter down there? And have the postal facilities down there in Florida where the mail that went to that publishing company, have they all been screened with surveillance cultures down in Florida? Uh, yes, uh, there has been a, an extensive evaluation. Uh, it is assumed that there was uh, at least one letter that was received uh, by the company. Uh, none of them had been uh, identified in part because of the interval from when it would have been received and when the investigation was actually begun. Uh, it's, yes. Was an attempt to go through their garbage processing facilities made at all to determine <laughs> if a letter came through that had... Yes. Perhaps the F FBI would like to answer. Yes, sir. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, material is, is waste material that goes from the company AMI in Florida is incinerated. 
so we didn't have an opportunity to go through it and dig up any uh, letters to find out where it came from. Okay. I think my time has expired. We need to oil that thing. Miss uh, Norton. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, institutions other than government buildings, as you might imagine, here where most of the anthrax has been found are trying to be proactive and preventative. Um, and as I indicated in my own remarks, they, they saw the house close down before anything was found based on something that was found in another building. So there is great confusion about how to take the appropriate preventative steps. Uh, may I ask you whether you think the neighborhood post offices, the Friendship Heights post office and the Southwest neighborhood post office, in light of the precedents that have been set for government buildings, should be closed down. The Supreme Court was closed down when trace amounts were found. The house was closed down before any amounts were found. Now, of course, some trace amounts have been found. Is the standard that when you suspect that there may be a problem, the institution itself should close, the building itself should close, because we don't know enough at this point to guarantee the health of people? Or how, what would you suggest in light of what is happening in government buildings that others uh, do to protect their employees and their clients? Yes. Can you want me to answer first? I'll take the first shot at that. Uh, I think there's some uh, health considerations there too that I'm really not qualified to yeah, both of you need to answer that respond to. But in the case of the Postal Service, and, and I'm sure you'll get a much fuller briefing when the Postmaster General comes in the next panel, but a lot of it depends on the facility and the square footage and the size of the facility we find it in. And That's why I gave you two examples. The French, these are two neighborhood post offices. I think where it is confined and there's, there's uh, again, an opportunity that it may be spread in a smaller location, uh, that's probably more prone for closure at that time than if it were a massive facility where we could cordon off a specific area and, and deal with the, the problem in that way. And I'll defer to my uh, expert in the health field to comment. I think it would, it, it would have to be done really on a case-by-case -case basis because some of the, the variables that you're hearing uh, come to play, uh, the size, whether or not there was illness there, uh, which might suggest uh, the difference in risk that people would have. Uh, I think that all of those things have to be looked at and a decision made on the level of contamination, disease, and a variety of factors. Well, I have to assume that there's not a great level of contamination in both of these neighborhood post offices, because as I understand, they are not closed down. Is that correct? <coughs> these two neighborhood post offices are not closed down? No, they are not. As, as far as I know, they are not, no. The criteria, the, the case by case notion is one that, that, that I, I understand generically. Uh, some of the factors you name might be important for people to understand the difference. There is, there is terrible suspicion, most of it unfounded. I have to tell you, I believe it entirely unfounded that there was a class bias and certainly a official bias that officials of the government who ought to, who in fact are paid to take risks, <laughs> were willing to take none, and that low-level people uh, who have ordinary jobs, who are not paid to take risks, so that if this difference simply has to be cleared up, and it's not enough to tell us that it's done on a case-by-case -case basis when all the cases that get closed down <laughs> are up dee up and all the places that get uh, are, 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 are left open are closer to the people. We, so we need, uh, we need you to spell out uh, as soon as you can to the general public how the, what the, you know what size means uh, the, the, the 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 people in new york don't have any reason to understand why brentwood was closed down they were not why a single trace has kept the longworth closed for days 
even though we are told that trace doesn't really uh, signify danger, these differences need to be explained or we all are going to have the credibility problems we now have and deserve. And I'm not willing to stand behind the differences, uh, even though I understand uh, analytically as I have followed them why they occurred. I'd like to know this. Um, is it not true that Sorry, let me just uh, allow the gentlelady to ask her question, get a response. Uh, we're in an awkward, even though you're, the time is up, but I, we're in an awkward situation. Mr. Weaver, we had somewhat duty-bound to let you leave at one thirty. I'm sorry, Mr. Jarbo, we are somewhat duty-bound to let you leave at one thirty. And, and is it my understanding you have a meeting in the White House and you need to leave now? Is that the... Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Um, is, there, is there anyone who can take your place that uh, is uh, with you now that could... Uh... No, sir. So we need to let you go, regretfully. Um, and, uh, uh, Mr. You, Chairman, yeah, I, yeah. just a uh, point of information here. I, I can appreciate that uh, Mr. Jarbo has to go to a meeting at the White House. But since Mr. Jarbo knew he had to go to a meeting at the White House, it would have seemed appropriate if you had somebody else who would have been able to speak for the FBI. I just want that on the record. Yeah. I, I think that's a mistake on the committee's part. We should have made that clear, um, regretfully. Um, so you are free to go. It is uh, something that we'll try to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. Um, and uh, ask your question, please. If we could have a short answer, and then uh, we'll get to, we'll keep things moving. I'd like to know about, as as best I've been able to tell, the the latest and most relevant experience with anthrax has been in in the armed forces, uh, where people in the Persian Gulf, of course, had vaccinations. The whole rest of it. Uh, how much of that experience has been shared with you? How much of that experience is factored in to your work? What is the nature of your relationship with the people in the armed forces that may have had greater experience than the rest of us in this country? Well, we work very closely uh, with the folks in the Department of Defense. Uh, the actual experience for anthrax disease, though, uh, really dates uh, through the last century in the United States. And there have been, you know, since uh, the early 1950s, for example, a little over 230 cases. Most of those have been skin infections. Uh, there were only 18 cases of uh, inhalational anthrax in the entire uh, 20th century. So there has not been a great deal of experience with anthrax. So. And there was Much. none in the Persian Gulf. No, no, no member of the armed forces, in fact, uh, contracted anthrax in the Persian Gulf. I'm not aware of any cases. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is my time up? Yeah, your time has long passed. But given the location of your district, we wanted to give you a little extra time. Uh, I would ask Mr. Horn and recognize Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is directed to you, uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, as in your director role for the Center for Disease Control and uh, Prevention and some of the sections. On October 5th, the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, Intergovernmental Relations, which I chair, held a hearing on bioterrorism response preparedness. Dr. Scott Lillibridge, Secretary Thompson, Special Assistant for national security issues and emergency management. He testified before our subcommittee. At that point, federal officials knew that Bob Stevens had been diagnosed with inhalation of the anthrax in Florida, and they believed his case stemmed from natural causes. At our hearing, Dr. Lillibridge said, quote, at this point, we are advised by the FBI that this does not seem to be a biological agent attack. We are not finding secondary cases. This person, Mr. Stevens, uh, became ill nearly a week ago, and by that time, we certainly should see additional cases if this was going to be a widespread problem, unquote, to Mr. Lillibridge. Even in the light of the limited amount of information available at that time, do you think Mr. Lillibridge's statement was either overly wrong or optimistic? Well, I think at that point in time, uh, all of us hoped that there was a natural explanation. Uh, as I, uh, I pointed out before, most of the cases in the United States had explanations so that it was possible that there might have been an exposure to an animal product that which 
you know, by which he could have acquired the disease. So I think that uh, all of us hope there would be a natural explanation to it. Well, at that time, news reports indicated that Mr. Stevens was originally believed to have meningitis. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, preliminary tests on his co-worker, Ernesto Blanco, indicated Mr. Blanco did not have anthrax, yet anthrax bacteria were later found in his nasal passages. Could anything have been done differently to obtain a more accurate diagnosis of this or other cases earlier? Well, the, uh, the additional, there were additional studies uh, conducted, and some of those studies require a length of time. For example, a serologic tests require a length of time for the human body to make antibodies. That's one of the tests that uh, we can do. Uh, there are some tests that are more rapid, for example, the PCR test. And when uh, Mr. Blanco actually developed a pleural effusion, one of those tests were done on uh, the pleural fluid, uh, indicating further evidence that he was likely infected with anthrax. So there were a number of tests that were being employed to try to determine whether or not uh, the illness that he had uh, could have been anthrax. His initial presentation uh, was not classical uh, for anthrax. And I think as we've seen in several of the other patients, uh, there are some differences in uh, the way you know, they are presenting that hospitals uh, in contrast to what we have expected uh, to see with inhalation anthrax. In uh, light of that situation you just talked about, the number of anthrax cases have appeared since October 5th, a uh, number of them. What lessons has the public health community learned from this disease? How is it contracted? And uh, how can it be contained and treated? And to what degree is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention sending guidance to the hospitals of America and the doctors? Well, one of the most critical things that we can do is uh, educate uh, healthcare providers that uh, these are the symptoms and signs of these diseases and to report them. And in fact, uh, with uh, Mr. Stevens, I think this was an example of that where a, a physician recognized that this was something unusual and quickly notified the health department, which convinced, uh, then commenced the investigation. Uh, we have done a variety of, of other additional activities. We've been uh, edu trying to educate healthcare providers through satellite conferences, other kinds of informational material. Surveillance is critical uh, because there is no guarantee that this or any other disease would be announced, and so the people who will recognize it are the healthcare providers. In uh, New York, I believe, the doctor uh, really didn't know what was before him, but he put the right uh, uh, Cipro the right uh, medicine to uh, help him. And when they finally discovered it, he was way ahead of everybody else. Yes, it was, it was a good diagnostic choice. Yeah. Any, uh, anything uh, that you've done and uh, or is, are going to do uh, in terms of hospitals and doctors, have you got some method that you can do it across all the people in the United States? Well, we're looking at uh, uh, as many opportunities as possible to try to educate physicians and other health care providers to make them aware about this and other diseases. Uh, as I said, we've uh, worked with uh, various groups, American Medical Association, through satellite conferences, the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America. Uh, there are many efforts to try to do this. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm going to be a little more strict on the five-minute rule and, uh, because we need to get to the postmaster eventually. And uh, Ms. Maloney, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, and I'd, I'd like to thank both of you for your hard work uh, here for the nation and, and, and really in particular for New York. Uh, New York uh, faces yet another crisis uh, in my district at the Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital. A woman has come down with anthrax. She's in serious condition in, in the hospital. I'd like to know if you know anything about her condition and her case. And secondly, I'd like to go back to the inconsistent responses. Um, I uh, represent many postal workers, and, and many of them are not going to work. They're concerned about uh, their health. And, and their question to me is, why is our uh, large uh, sorting center open where anthrax spores have been found, yet here in Washington, buildings were closed even before, buildings were closed that, that they just reviewed and they didn't even find anthrax. In fact, there have been at least four buildings and several mail facilities in D.C. are closed. 
and in New York, uh, and in New Jersey, several postal facilities are closed. Uh, but in New York, uh, facilities known to be infected and contaminated with anthrax remain open. And uh, this is a tremendous concern, and I, I request uh, permission to put into the record a letter that I've written to the Postmaster General uh, asking for clear guidance on, on this particular item. Also, there are questions uh, on, on uh, the treatment. Uh, uh, some people have been told to take Cipro. Some people have been told to take uh, uh, doxycycline. And uh, does this mean that Cipro and doxycycline are equally effective? And if you were exposed to anthrax, anthrax, what medication would you take? Okay. Well, let me start off. Uh, yes, uh, Cipro and Doxy are equally effective uh, in treating uh, anthrax. So that uh, the strategy has been since initially one did not know what the, uh, an which antibiotics to which the bacteria was susceptible, that the, the most conservative choice was to use Cipro. But once... Uh, that information was available. Doxycycline is a very effective drug. Uh, there are some issues about uh, side effects, and so that uh, both drugs have a role, and both drugs can be equally used. Um, the patient, I did not have an update from this morning, uh, but my understanding was that the, uh, the patient was quite ill and was on a respirator, but I do not know any further information. Um, with respect to the, uh, the closing of facilities, uh, in each instance, we've tried to uh, work with the various uh, groups that are responsible for making those de decisions and providing recommendations. In many instances, there are different groups, so some of the, the different decisions may reflect the fact that they're different decision makers. Well, we are, we are trying to, to work uh, with, uh, you know, again, the... Uh, the concept of, of doing things on a case-by-case -case basis is important, as well as uh, that our knowledge is evolving in this as, as we go through it. We're getting more information to help us make those decisions, but we do want to remain flexible because we're getting input from a variety of different sources. So we're, we're trying to, uh, to approach something that is somewhat standard, but again, we want to maintain some degree of flexibility. Could you talk about the side effects of these antibiotics? You, you mentioned the side effects. Well, there are, you know, there are various side effects that you know, are associated with them. Some are uh, skin rashes that may be associated with them. Uh, some uh, may be other types of, uh, of you know, different kinds of manifestations, uh, neurologic manifestations, uh, uh, some that are more prominent uh, in older people. Uh, I think the important point is that uh, there's a, it is a delicate balance uh, in uh, trying to make a decision about who you prophylax and who you don't prophylax yeah. because there are side effects that can occur. Yes. Well, can, can you explain uh, the reasons why some postal workers were given a nasal swab test and others were not? Yes. The, the nasal swab is not diagnostic. We're not trying to determine that that person has uh, an exposure to anthrax. It's helpful in the epidemiologic investigation. And in fact, we're more concerned that people would have a false sense of security because they would have a negative nasal swab. So it's important that you know, we, uh, we identify who is at risk for the exposure. Now, the nasal swab can help us identify the areas where that's occurring, but not all the people who are, in fact, exposed and need treatment. Well, is there, if, if, if a nasal swab can't determine, is there uh, research taking place now so that we can determine? tests that we can determine? We've been not. considering, uh, well, at, at this point, one of the, the areas that we've uh, begun to think about is there, are there rapid tests that we could use in people who present to the hospital that might be able to differentiate uh, between uh, anthrax and other diseases? So we've begun considering the possibility of, of those types of tests. My time is up. Ms. Davis. Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to yield to you for a short question. Okay, this will be a real short question. You know, we had hearings on uh, the anthrax uh, issue and the military and the vaccines, and we understand there's about 28 different strains of uh, anthrax. Uh, the, the first thing that I'd like, or the only thing I'd like to ask you is, uh, because the anthrax was a threat to the military, 
why didn't CDC and the Postal Service and the other agencies of our government think about the possibility that there might be an attack on the population of the United States in addition to the military? And why wasn't something done about that beforehand? I'm not yes. trying to blame anybody. I just wonder why they didn't think about that. Well, there, there has been uh, a number of activities uh, that be, have been interdepartmental where folks have tried to get together and discuss the types of uh, activities that needed to be done to prepare for any kind of an event like this. From CDC's perspective, one of the, the critical elements was trying to build and rebuild the public health infrastructure so that we could really better detect these kind of phenomena. And that's both epidemiologic and laboratory, developing a network of laboratories where one could get a good confirmation fairly rapidly. So there are a number of activities that have, that have gone on to try to uh, detect. In addition, there have been efforts to stockpile various antimicrobial agents that would be necessary for the treatment of this and other diseases. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I'm glad to hear that the traces of uh, anthrax found in Longworth is probably not threatening, and hopefully that means we can get back in our offices soon because my staff would like to get back together. Uh, the question I have, I'm not sure who it would be for, but it, it involves the Brentwood Postal Facility. Uh, several of my constituents in my district are nonprofit organizations, and for the last 10 days, they've not received the business reply mail. And when they've called to get answers as to why they're not getting it, they are getting other mail, but not that. The organization depends on that, and they're getting to the point they're going to have to start laying off some employees, possibly. Can anyone give me an answer as to what the status of that type of mail is? I can't give you a quick answer on it. We can certainly check on that and find out, but uh, if that mail was entered into the system, they should be receiving it. But we can, we can follow up on that, ma'am, and find out. If you could follow up and let me know, I'd certainly sure. appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have no other questions? No, sir. I just needed to get that one in for my constituents. General ladies, uh, yields back her time. Um, who's next on our on site? Mr. Kucinich. <clears throat> Dr. Cohen, uh, we've uh, heard uh, my colleague from New York speak about the case where the Manhattan mailroom employee uh, contracted inhalational anthrax. Now, uh, it's my understanding that this individual experienced preliminary symptoms four days before she was admitted. Do you, are you aware of that? I, I do not have the you know, specific clinical information. I think it would be helpful for the CDC to look into that to make a determination whether or not this case could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what efforts, Dr. Cohen, has the CDC made to deliver clear public health messages to susceptible populations, uh, namely postal workers and mailroom employees? We've been working uh, with uh, both uh, the U.S. Postal Service and uh, with uh, their workers, uh, and we're uh, trying at this point in time to finalize some interim recommendations that would uh, help uh, prevent uh, the exposure uh, to, uh, to this disease. Uh, we're working uh, when in, in addition to that with uh, educational activities, uh, and we have also actually provided a full-time uh, liaison uh, to the U.S. Postal Service uh, who has a, an office there to try to facilitate the coordination of all of these materials and information. Uh, you say you're, you're working with them, but yes. do, you, do you already have in place such public health messages from the CDC to the postal workers and mailroom employees? Are they in place? No, we have actually been revising some of those with discussions with the, uh, the workers and the U.S. Postal Service. So you have them in place and you're revising them? Yes. Okay. Now, can you comment on uh, if and how the CDC is keeping track of postal employees who worked in contaminated areas? Is there some sort of uh, comprehensive system? Or is the CDC only aware of employees who have actually sought out treatment or have checked in to... Uh, uh, to receive uh, testing or antibiotics. Hmm. 
Uh, yes, the, uh, uh, the surveillance is being conducted by uh, examining lists of uh, employees who worked in affected areas and actually doing active surveillance to determine uh, their health status. So you're saying you're making sure that uh, no postal employee would be uh, uh, experiencing preliminary symptoms of infection without ever having been in contact with the CDC or other health officials? Uh, we can't guarantee every single person, but those who are in, who have worked in those areas that are identified as high risk are certainly under intense surveillance. I hadn't heard that. Uh, do you feel it's the CDC's responsibility to facilitate preemptive action and early intervention during a public health crisis? Well, we've traditionally tried to develop the, you know, the best recommendations uh, available based on the assessment of the scientific data and provide those to the people who need to make those decisions. And do you feel that uh, America's public health infrastructure has the capacity to deal with uh, uh, this anthrax crisis? I think it's been recognized for a number of years that there have been weaknesses in U.S. public health infrastructure. It's part of the reason why there's been an effort to try to rebuild that public health infrastructure, and I think we need to continue to do that going forward. Has the CDC uh, issued any statements with respect to uh, public health uh, structures having surge capacity, uh, being able to uh, effectively treat any influx of cases that may arise as a result of our current situation? I believe part of the planning has been involving uh, the issue of, uh, of making sure that treatment is potentially available through the stockpile and through other mechanisms. And what are you doing with respect to uh, communicating with the nation's physicians with respect to information about detection and treatment protocols for anthrax? Uh, we've used a, a number of, uh, of educational approaches, including satellite conferences. Uh, our uh, weekly publication in the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report is uh, uh, a source for many physicians on uh, information about current problems and treatment choices. And what's the communication between the uh, FBI and the CDC with respect to the release of information to the public? Uh, we have uh, we've been working very closely together, as uh, Mr. Jarbo pointed out, that I am the liaison uh, between CDC and FBI, and I have been there since uh, the 8th of October, uh, trying to provide uh, both a liaison function and perspective on uh, the clinical and microbiologic aspects with respect to their investigation. Are you aware of any instances where uh, the FBI held on to information for the purposes of a criminal investigation and that delayed by even a day the communication of that information to public health uh, authorities? I was in the, as Mr. Jarbo pointed out, I was in the meeting uh, in the night of uh, October 15th uh, when we had the preliminary description of the material uh, that uh, was being examined at Fort Detrick, and uh, those, that information was rapidly uh, uh, transferred to CDC uh, by a conference call within one to two hours uh, and shared at that point. Uh, within the next day or so, I was shown copies, uh, detailed uh, photomicrographs of the various envelopes and materials uh, for you know, further information. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Weaver, thank you for being here, and Dr. Cohen, uh, both of you being here. M Mr. Weaver, it's my um, understanding that the, the oldest law enforcement agency in the country happens to be your agency. It, it, That's correct. Yeah. And you, you all have a, a fine tradition and, and a, uh, obviously a very long history. I'm interested to know how the law that we recently passed and was signed into law um, dealing with wiretaps and the sharing of information is going to impact your job. Well, it certainly, uh, I think, gives law enforcement a little more flexibility to do their job. Uh, at the same time, of course, we've got to be careful on how we use that, that we uh, protect people's rights also. But I, I think it's going to give us the flexibility to, uh, to have more access to, to information, uh, readily available information. Uh, some of that uh, on the wiretap, of course, you, you were only allowed to go to a certain physical piece of equipment uh, in, in the past, but now that has changed to where it, it's, it's more or less going to follow the individual. So I think, I think it is a benefit. In your previous investigations, did you believe that 
you were uh, sometimes involved with terrorist organizations, or is, is terrorism kind of a, a new concept for your agency to be dealing with? Well, I think, I think we're all learning uh, that terrorism takes on many forms. Uh, certainly September 11th was a terrorist act, and there have been many questions on whether the anthrax uh, incidents are direct re directly related to that. See, uh, I, I, th I can say that almost an irrelevant uh, issue. I mean, these are terrorist acts, aren't they? Yes, I was going to make the point that regardless, this is still an act of terrorism. And, and we were treating it as such. Yeah, I can't think of anything uh, even remotely suggesting it wouldn't be an act of terrorism. Right. These are acts against the general public. They are indiscriminate, and uh, they, they do exactly what terrorism is intended to do. They, yes. they are, have terrorized and shut down uh, certain sectors of our, of our uh, activities. So I'm, you don't have any doubt in your mind that you're fighting terrorism, whether or not it comes from bin Laden or any other group? Correct? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. And the question I, I want to th know, though, is I'd like to have a more concrete a kind of example of how you will be able to utilize this law that can make me feel safer, that because you have this law, you're going to be able to solve the crime more quickly. Is there anything in the past that you can draw on that said, my gosh, if we had this law, we might have been able to to be more it doesn't specific. jump right out at me, okay. uh, Congressman, but uh, let me think about it, and I would like to get Are back to you. Are you in need of any additional resources that aren't uh, available to you right now? I think we're looking at that very closely. The, the whole environment's going to change from a security standpoint. We're looking at putting technology into our facilities to help us. I'm sure the Postmaster General will talk about that in the next uh, panel. Uh, and again, from a, I, th I think we have the resources we need to do the job. They're strained right now. Uh, I, I don't understand, candidly, why you feel you would have the resources. Uh, it, it, the only way I could suggest that you do is if you had too many resources in the past. We, did you have a, an excess of no, resources? No, not at all. So are, are, aren't you being taxed a bit more than in the past? Yes. So can I make a natural assumption that you need to assess, uh, let me say it this way, can I make an assumption that you need more resources? It's a question of what resources you need and how quickly you need them? Well, the thing is, we're, we've diverted resources. Again, some of those resources that may have been working other crimes are not working those right now. So you're exactly right. If we're to continue at the same level, plus take on uh, terrorism, and if it continues, yes, I would say we would need more resources. Yeah, I, I'll just say my concern will be that that sometimes we in the legislative side don't do what we should do, but if you don't ask for them, then we're not going to be as aware of them. And I would think that that you will need to come forward with a, a, a tremendous amount of, of thoughtful requests. And I realize this is all new, but I, I hope that you're having time besides coming to testify <laughs> where you can, can do that. Dr. Cohen, um, should I get, uh, I, 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 I fail to understand why we get in this debate if it's weaponized or not, if in fact it, whatever we're dealing with in anthrax is a weapon. So um, is some of this debate, you know what, my time is over and I, I know we need to move forward. So I'm going to withdraw the question. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, Mr. Cummins. Uh, let me just announce that the postmaster has arrived. Uh, he's going to be with us till around 4 o'clock. So uh, we, we, we need to get him down here as quickly as possible. I don't want to cut anybody off, though. So, Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Cohen, uh, I want to just go back to something the chairman was asking about um, with regard to these anthrax vaccines. Uh, when we had testimony before uh, this committee several months ago, um, one of the things that was very interesting and that just kind of got a little, got some of us, I think, a bit alarmed was that there were so many people who came before the committee who had an adverse reaction to the vaccine. Um, what's the status of that with regard to uh, vaccines for anthrax? Well, we're actually currently uh, under a congressional mandate examining uh, the side effects and new regimens for administering uh, the current anthrax vaccine. 
plus there is research uh, going on in a variety of institutions, including National Institutes of Health, uh, that are attempting to develop new and more hopefully effective vaccines. When I uh, visited the post office, the main post office in Baltimore, it was very interesting to see, I mean, this is a big post office. I mean, it's a lot of machinery uh, going and um, I think two or three floors of machinery uh, going. And, you know, I, I keep going back to the question Ms. Norton was asking about how do you determine when to close a facility. Um, it's my understanding, do you give advice to the postal to the post office as to when they should close a facility? Well, we try to, whoever the partner is that's responsible for... Well, right now I'm talking about the postal system. You, do, are you the key person, one of the key people from a health standpoint to give advice to them? Actually, the, the individuals who are in the, the particular geographic area who are part of the team would be the key people because they have developed all the specific data. Mm -hmm. And so they would work with them. Plus, we, as I said, have a liaison now uh, who is uh, working directly with uh, the U.S. Postal Service uh, and with uh, U.S. Postal Workers, mm -hmm. so that you know that's a combination then of the people in the field as well as the liaison providing the, the technologic and scientific support. Well, when I was in Baltimore, a number of the people who I met with employees said that they had been in the uh, Brentwood facility, but they had never gotten any kind of test. And they were kind of concerned uh, because they said, you know, it seems like uh, if we had been, if we had visited that facility or pick up mail or whatever, a lot of these guys were, were drivers. These were all men, but they were drivers. And they said, you know, we don't understand why aren't we being given a test. And they were very upset about that. How is that determined who gets the test? Well, the, the test is uh, not, you know, used to determine whether a person has been exposed or is at risk of disease. It's helpful in defining the area in which people may have worked so that people who do go to that area, regardless of whether they have a test, whether they have a positive test or not, are offered prophylaxis. So the, the test doesn't tell a person whether they're at risk or not at risk for developing anthrax. Mm -hmm. so, so if a person, so, so a lot of the people who are now taking Cipro and uh, the other medications um, may very well not have uh, anthrax. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct, although they were potentially in an area of exposure and therefore would be indicated to receive prophylaxis. One of the things that was also interesting in the Baltimore Post Office is that you had a number of people who had gloves. Some had gloves and masks. Others uh, had gloves. Others just had masks. And I was wondering, what is the, and perhaps you, Mr. Wagner, might want to address that, what is the advice that you're giving them and what good does do the gloves or the masks do? Well, we have made gloves and masks available to all employees and, and again, uh, it's been highly recommended that if they are in an area where they're handling mail or around machinery, uh, that they wear that, that equipment. One thing I'd also like to mention on a prior comment you made, uh, for those employees that visited the Brentwood facility on the workroom floor or in the back dock area, either dropping off mail or, or picking up mail, uh, we have put the alert out that they should report and, and get the medication. Okay, well, maybe that's happened since I, I met with them. Yes. But that's, that's good. I'm glad to know that. The, um, and that, what I want to go back to the gloves and the masks. What did you base, what advice did you base that on? And in other words, the distribution of the gloves and the masks. Are you, are you following me? Yes. I, you know, early on, even, even when we got indications from Boca Raton that mail may be involved in the anthrax situation, the Postmaster General went out and, and made gloves and, and masks available. Initially, there was some concern that, well, we can't wear gloves with the mechanization and it might present a problem. But they have since resolved that, and, and I know we've spent a lot, of, uh, a lot of money getting the proper equipment, the proper types of masks uh, to lower the risk that uh, employees might contract. This. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. Mr. Otter? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, last night, uh, we had another report of an anthrax by inhalation, in fact, the first one in uh, New York City. Uh, that is the first one, isn't it? Uh, I believe so, yes. 
Uh, and, and it was also reported that this uh, lady did not work uh, directly in the mail room and handling the mail and that sort of thing. Is there any speculation, or maybe that's a dangerous word right now, but w would you have any idea how she would have contacted that? I think that that would be one of the major thrusts of the investigation to try to determine if there's potential exposures. Also, uh, in the mail, uh, in my mail last night at home, not here, uh, I received a very informative card, uh, and it told me, uh, as it did, I'm sure, all patrons, uh, what to do if they received some suspicious mail and what to look for and how to handle it and what to do to uh, protect themselves. I think that's very informative. Uh, and I'm wondering sort of out loud now, uh, would there, there would be a different treatment for anthrax as opposed to, say, some kind of a chemical agent, uh, wouldn't there? Uh, yes, there would be. Uh, would the post office uh, or would the uh, CDC uh, advise the post office to uh, uh, sort of get ahead of the game and, and say, uh, and this, you know, if a chemical agent is being transferred via the mail, uh, this is the action that you ought to take and this is what you ought to look for. Perhaps Mr. Weaver would be better. Yes, uh, Congressman. And, and again, I think the advice we give out is uh, many times very generic. Uh, number one, if you, if you receive something in the mail that you don't expect, uh, everybody kind of knows what kind of net mail you receive at home. You look through it and you say, yeah, I know what that is and that is. If you're not expecting it, if it doesn't have a return address on it, if the return address on it uh, is fictitious or uh, if it has uh, markings on the mail uh, that are unfamiliar to you, if there appears to be something bulky in the piece of mail, if there's certainly if there's something emitting from it, whether it be a chemical or whether it be a, a powder, those, uh, so they're very similar, the types of messages that we send out. Uh, but we, every time we run into a situation like this, certainly we need to adjust. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Cohen, it's my understanding that, that both the CDC and private companies are doing testing for, for, for the presence of anthrax. Is that, that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, can you bring the mic just a little closer? What's, what's the CDC's role in, in making sure that these companies, if there is any, is, are actually equipped and able to determine whether or not there is the presence of, of anthrax? I mean, do you assess the companies or? Okay. okay. Uh, we have had some of our laboratorians uh, visit uh, with the contractors and to go over some of the, uh, the strategies that we use, some of the methodologies, uh, recommendations about quality control uh, for those. Uh, so in many instances, we're an available resource and would have direct uh, interactions as indicated. And you don't have any, any concerns about whether or not any of these actually have the qualifications that are necessary in order to, to do the work? Uh, I, I don't know exactly the extent of uh, who's been contracted by all of the, uh, the private facilities. Let me just ask, if I'm a, let's just say I'm a mm -hmm. postal worker, um, what is it that I need to know or need to understand or need to have heard about in a particular facility that I might work in to determine whether, I mean, I hear people saying that they don't feel comfortable going to work or that absenteeism is down. And I assume if that's the case, it's because individuals feel unsafe and insecure and, and, and feel that they might become contaminated. Mm -hmm. what, what do I need to know? as a, an, 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 an employee to feel comfortable and secure that I can go to work and be protected? Well, I, I think that's one of the, the major reasons why it's important for us to, to work 
with the, the Postal Service and the workers to develop an education program that answers those questions. Because I could, you know, talk about, you know, the, the low likelihood of risk because of the few spores, but that may not be the answers that they want or need. So that's why I think it's so critical for us to work together to find out the answers to those questions and provide it to them. So you're pretty much suggesting that there are no quick and easy solutions and there, 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 there are no absolute standards and outright uh, conditions that we can guarantee that, yeah, everything is fine. I think, I think it would be very difficult to have any absolutes that would guarantee that no one would become exposed or become ill. I mean, there's a number of things that can be done to reduce the likelihood that people can become exposed and become sick. But I think it would be very hard to, to deal with absolutes, particularly since we're talking about an intentional act that we do not have control over as much as when we deal with a disease in a natural environment. And so the realities are that we simply have to continue to work, explore, generate the resources that are necessary if additional resources are needed in order to reach the point where we can, in fact, feel comfortable that people can go to work and not become contaminated and we'll be fine. I think it's uh, continuing to evolve and uh, we have to work together to try to get the answers to those questions to reduce the risk as much as feasible. And thank you, gentlemen. Both. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Ms. Mink? Thank you very much. Uh, oh, excuse me, chairman. one second, Ms. Hink. Uh, yes. Mr. Horn, you had something you want to submit for the record? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to include in the record the following question. Uh, as I look through the testimony, the Postmaster General uh, gave us two human beings. And when I asked my question, I had a human being there. The rest of it is sort of uh, very important and all that, how many we did this and that. But I'd like to put in the record at this point how many have that, and unless they want to, don't want uh, privacy uh, on it, and put them in here so that four months from now or something, where are we with real people? And, uh, you know, Machiavelli, uh, the, Italia, uh, the Italian th uh, theorist, uh, he said, uh, if you really want people to forget all these things, uh, put an individual in your concerns and uh, not thousands of people because they can't take it. And so I'd like to see the people that are... That we'll, we'll ask the, uh, the agencies to give us the list of all those people for the record. Ms. Mink? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I uh, have some very uh, basic questions I want to ask. Uh, Mr. Weaver, having to do with the uh, receipt of the letter in Senator Daschle's office, where did, uh, where was the, what was the postmark on that letter? The postmark was September the 18th from Trenton, New Jersey. So that would be the Trenton facility that was closed on October 18th. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. So that letter somehow was deposited in a mailbox and then went through the sorting devices in the Trenton facility. And then where did it go? What was its next stop? Then it would have been transported from Trenton down to the Brentwood facility. Now, at the Brentwood facility, it was sorted out. And where would it have gone prior to its arrival at Mr. Daschle's office? It would have gone into the government mails section. We have a section that specifically works all governmental mails. Where? At the Brentwood facility? At the facility? Brentwood facility, yes. Right. And then it would have been uh, transferred from there to the Senate mailroom operation. Now, at the Brentwood facility, would it have gone through the general distribution system before it went to the government sorting facility? Yes, it would have. So once you close the Brentwood facility on October 21st, uh, following the closure of the Trenton facility on the 18th, what ha how has the new mail coming from wherever, all parts of the country, where has that new mail gone to and why is it not reaching the constituents? 
that mail has come in and what used to go into the government mail section is now being held at the present time. I'm not talking about the government facility. I'm talking about all the rest of the mail. Once that facility was closed, we hear that people are not getting their mail delivery. Yeah, I, I believe the, uh, the Postmaster General or the Chief Operating Officer who will be here in the next panel can give you some detailed explanation of where, but I believe the answer is it is being processed in another facility in the Washington, D.C. area. So all the mail that was supposed to have gone to Brentwood after the 21st is being diverted elsewhere. Yes, that's correct. With the exception of the government mail, and by that I mean the Congress, the White House, State Department. That's correct. Et cetera, et cetera. So the contamination of the Supreme Court, the State Department, CIA, and the Longworth and Ford all occurred as a result of mail that was distributed prior to October 21st. Is that correct? We don't know. And I well, don't think we can speculate. Well, you said the mail facility was closed after the 21st, so nothing went out. Well, the, the options there are that, it, that there was cross-contamination because of that. And again, I'd ask uh, Dr. Cohen to comment on the possibility of that. Or there may be another piece of mail somewhere. No, my question is, mail that would have gone through the Brentwood facility, but did not because that facility was closed on the 21st and it was diverted elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Are you saying now that that mail might also be contaminated? Well, I don't know at this point, and I'm not speculating on that. I don't know if I'm missing something here. Well, I just wanted to know what's happening to the mail that would have gone to Brentwood, uh, but did not because it's now closed. Yeah, I, I would suggest maybe uh, the next panel may uh, may get may enlighten you a Is little bit further. Is that not part of your Inspector General's inquiry right now? Well, I'm not the Inspector General. I'm the, the law enforcement side, side of the Postal Service. Yes. That law enforcement side of the Postal Service is not making an inquiry as to what is happening to yes, the Yes, we are. We're, we're working with the, the FBI on the investigation and pursuing all those leads. Uh, my uh, question to Dr. Cohen has to do with the uh, anthrax vaccine uh, and its use uh, for the uh, Persian Gulf incident. Uh, do you have any statistics uh, with respect to uh, the number of uh, individuals given the vaccine at that time who became ill and had uh, serious side effects? Uh, no, I have none of that information. There's no one that has that information? Uh, I would assume that the Department of Defense would have some information about uh, adverse events. What would be the efficacy of the use of the anthrax vaccine now, given the circumstances of the threat on the uh, health of the postal workers? Uh, the, the vaccine was most extensively studied in uh, people who uh, worked in the fiber industries uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, and that's where the efficacy uh, was shown. Uh, we would uh, believe that there would still be a comparable level of, of efficacy, uh, but with you know, any vaccine, uh, the size of the infectious dose may impact how effective the vaccine is. Gentlelady's time has expired. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the, the one thing I'd like to have you address before you conclude, though, is, there, is I've, been, I've been told there's 28 strains of uh, anthrax, and would that vaccine be effective against all those strains? Uh, I, don't, I don't know to what extent uh, there have been studies uh, examining each of the strains. The vaccine is prepared to uh, protect against a particular antigen that's present uh, in these strains. So all the strains that cause disease that have this antigen would be protected against. And I would assume that would be most of those that you describe. Ms. Watson, do you have any questions? We held a hearing in Los Angeles and we had all of your counterparts there. The question that has been on my mind, and I'm sure on the minds of a lot of others, 
is how do we identify the powder? We have gotten calls into our offices about people who thought that the white powder on the floor of the restroom might have been anthrax. They have called, and it appears that it's a color of cinnamon, maybe, amber to brown. I raised this question yesterday, and they said they really didn't want to describe the way it looked. They'd rather investigate to see. Can you clarify, Dr. Cohen, for me what it is we would look for in the bins at the Postal Service, what it is we would look for uh, in our own offices when the mail would come? Well, I'm not certain that you could feel with a high degree of, uh, of comfort that a particular material uh, did not represent anthrax unless it was appropriately examined by the laboratory. Uh, again, we deal with uh, the potential here that this is something that's being done with intent. And so that I think that, again, although people, people are concerned that they must be alert and cautious. What we're trying to do is cut down on the anxiety mm -hmm. and the cause and, uh, of course, fire services, uh, police services, the FBI and so on are out there investigating. Is there any information that we can give the public in terms of what it is they suspect and what a description might be so it would reduce the number of false uh, alerts and calls and so on. Is there anything to look for, or should we just call when we see a suspicious looking powder? Well, I think the, the issue is uh, primarily the recommendations that have been provided about you know, what is a suspicious letter. I mean, I think we have information there. When you, I think they've gotten that down pretty well. Okay. When you, when you talk about a powder, I think it's very, it's very hard to provide you know, any information that, that would be that helpful. Uh, the, the various law enforcement uh, groups have ways of responding to the, the different calls. So they should continue to call the police? I think that would be most prudent. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Weaver, I want to thank you on behalf of myself and my staff because in the um, last uh, two weeks, two letters that were destined for my district office were flagged by the Postal Service because they were suspicious. And in each case, the Postal Service called my office to make us aware of the situation and confirmed whether or not we were expecting the uh, correspondence. And then took extra steps to guarantee the safety of our, those parcels and, and, our, and ourselves. But what it made me think was both of those letters were, um, came from overseas. Mm -hmm. um, if we track the mail from its origin to wherever it finally ends up, some of that is on airplanes. And I'm wondering if any of the mail thus far that was contaminated or if other mail um, has spearheaded any kind of investigation then of those spaces where the, the mail may be, if we're going back further. We're not ruling anything out, but uh, bear in mind we've got three pieces of mail right now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to correct a statement I made earlier. Uh, I believe the Congress lady uh, asked me the date on the Dashiell mailing, and it was October 9th, not September the 18th. But uh, as far as uh, whether, in all presumption, this mail entered the mail stream in the Trenton area and was processed in that facility and, and would have uh, uh, traveled to Washington uh, via highway. Uh, so right now, although we're not ruling out uh, any possibility of, of these substances flying or maybe in the air, uh, I don't think that was the case here. I guess what I'm concerned about is if we're trying to be proactive and prevent uh, a problem, if we have taken under consideration the possibility that some of this may travel in different ways. and tracking those places 
in, in a more careful in a more careful way? I think what we are going to try to do is get ahead of the curve a little bit through technology and make sure that uh, mail that uh, we are not comfortable with, that we do screen that either through technology and make sure that if there is any bacteria in that mail, it's killed. Is um, the mail of ordinary citizens, is, uh, are ordinary citizens as safe from their mail potential hazards as members of Congress? W are, are other people in my district being called that a, a letter was flagged? Or is that um, special consideration for members? Uh, not necessarily. We're, we're screening at, at different locations. We are taking a hard look at it piece by piece. And, and I won't divulge exactly what we look for or where it's at, but uh, we are doing some of that. But as far as, as the American people, I would like to say that I know this has been a tragic time, and there is a lot of fear out there by the American people, and it's, it's understandable. We've had three letters go through our system, and I think even the chairman commented on the number of pieces that we've processed, and it's probably up to about 25 billion pieces. So the chances of, of uh, the average uh, customer receiving any of this are very remote, but one's too many. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cohn, what do we know about the source of the anthrax? It seems like there's been some conflicting reports on whether or not it contained an additive that was only made in, in Iraq, and at first it was that it d didn't, and then it does. Do, have we been able to determine anything to narrow the source? Well, in our, in our laboratories, uh, what we've primarily done is looked at the, uh, the organisms, and the tests that we have done really tell us that the organisms are indistinguishable. Um, it's unfortunate that you know, FBI couldn't comment more on you know, the characteristics of the, the material. So the, the information that we have primarily deals with the organisms themselves rather than the powder. Let me ask one final question. Uh, an epidemiologist who is familiar um, with a, a good deal of, of what we're trying to handle right now called and, and was concerned, are, is the American public being told everything by the, the CDC? Not, I, I certainly don't think we, we want to terrify people, but do, is there information being withheld or as suspicions are aroused or as cases are being identified, do we know everything? We're trying to share information as rapidly as possible uh, that uh, you know, is important for the public health and the public to know and, and be educated. Um, I think that uh, you know, early on that uh, you know, there was uh, a number of opportunities for us to you know, perhaps talk more, but we were involved in the investigations, and I think now we're trying to use as much opportunities as possible to educate people and to you know, let them know what we're doing. What he said was, yeah. in war, there are times when you want to keep information um, from the public, because you know, we have strategic reasons, but when public health is involved, the more people know, the, the better. I would agree. Yeah. Thank you. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Weaver, you mentioned there are three letters out uh, now that uh, we're dealing with that we know of, the Daschle letter, uh, the Brokaw letter. The New York Post. And the New York Post. Um, we have other instances of contamination that may or may not be related to a specific letter. Uh, name those for me. I don't think I can, Congressman. I don't know. Uh, we've got other cases that where people have contracted cutaneous uh, anthrax and and again, I, I think it's speculation that where they got that and whether it was off a cross-contamination or not, but I don't have the exact number. So the, the media company in Florida, you're not ready to say that's related to a letter? We suspect it was, but we do not have the actual document or the letter. And I guess the, uh, you would say the same about the uh, situation in uh, Dan Rather's office in New York? That's correct. We do not have a physical document. And also the uh, incident of the uh, lady in New York at the hospital who was just discovered uh, to be uh, infected just yesterday. Yes, that's under investigation, and we're trying to, to get to the bottom of that right now. 
And um, are there others that I have not mentioned that might be possible? Yes. Uh, uh, the one that comes to mind is the State Department. There was a, an employee working the State Department mailroom that uh, is suspected of uh, contracting uh, anthrax. So that would be another case that I'm aware of. The uh, letter in uh, it was postmarked uh, that came into Senator Daschle's office, postmarked October 9th. That's correct. Uh, what was the postmark on the other letters that we're aware of? They were both September the 18th. September the 18th. Um, I want to ask Dr. Cohen, I, I, I want us to gain a little bit of fundamental education here while we have the opportunity about this disease. Uh, for example, the Daschle letter postmarked October 9th um, came through the Brentwood Post Office and we find a postal worker contracted inhalation anthrax uh, and was hospitalized on October 21st. Are those dates consistent with the evolution of that disease and the infection that would follow? Actually, I believe the, uh, the patient started reporting symptoms earlier in that time period and that there was a consistent uh, uh, period of exposure to when the person actually became ill. So that would be consistent with what we know about anthrax. So give me just the timetable on the initial exposure. The first sign of symptoms would occur how many days later? Well, it, uh, it could be, I mean, what has been reported is uh, one to seven days is generally the time frame from when exposure to illness occurs. Um, it, in some of the cases, it uh, you know, may have been shorter uh, time period. Uh, so I think that's actually a fairly good range. Uh, often the early symptoms uh, are relatively nonspecific. You could have fever, muscle aches, and pains, and which poses one of the diagnostic dilemmas is that when patients are seen by a physician, uh, it's difficult to recognize uh, that this represents something other than a, a common infection. And at what point do you have clear symptoms. Uh, what are those symptoms that well, would be identified? Well, traditionally, it's, it's been described that the, the illness uh, may, uh, the, the nonspecific illness may uh, somewhat improve and then dramatically worsen uh, where uh, the person, uh, you know, becomes very ill, uh, you know, they appear to, to have, uh, you know, a, uh, a serious illness uh, that would be consistent with having bacteria uh, circulating in your bloodstream and the toxins that are produced by those bacteria making you ill. So that can occur fairly rapidly and historically the, uh, the, the death rates from inhalational anthrax were very, very high. It was thought to be uh, almost uh, uniformly fatal. So you would say that if an individual has these preliminary symptoms, fever, flu-like symptoms, yes, and um, that they could go away for a few days then come back, even more severely and then result in respiratory problems? Is that it, well, it could stage? be, uh, or just uh, they, they may have uh, uh, respiratory problems, they could have shock, uh, they could have uh, a variety of clinical uh, findings and signs that we see, such as the, the swollen lymph nodes that are present in the chest that are referred to as a, a widened mediastinum that you see on a chest x-ray or as uh, in the first patient's case, the organism can get into the central nervous system and cause meningitis. And so the person could have that kind of a, a presentation. So there's you know, various possible ways that people can present. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Chairman, I'm satisfied to let these witnesses go as, as soon as we can and bring on the others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Well, we want to thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Excuse me. Did you, did you have any questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we'll In just a moment, we'll return to this hearing for testimony from Postmaster General John. After the rest of this event, part of another House hearing. This one, a House Rules Committee meeting on the Aviation Security Bill. Then at 7 a.m. Eastern, Washington Journal. On the program, more discussions about postal security, Pakistan's nuclear capability, and the ongoing actions in Afghanistan. And at 10, the U.S. House of Representatives returns for consideration of some federal spending bills that fund the Departments of Treasury and Energy, the Legislative Branch, and the U.S. Postal Service.
Tomorrow evening here on C-SPAN, the new Black Panther Party and Muslims for Truth and Justice co-host a town hall meeting on the U.S. War on Terrorism. Our live coverage begins at 7 p.m. Eastern. Join Book TV this Sunday for In-Depth David Halberstam. Three hours of conversation and your opportunity to call the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author of 18 books, including The Best and the Brightest, Playing for Keeps, Michael Jordan and the World He Made, and War in a Time of Peace, Bush, Clinton and the Generals. You can also talk to David Halberstam about the introduction he wrote for the new book, New York, September 11th. In Depth, David Halberstam, live this Sunday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. In-depth interviews are the first Sunday of the month. Looking forward, upcoming guests include David McCullough, Cornell West, and Tom Clancy, all on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Now more from the House Government Reform Committee hearing on the safety of mail and postal workers. Postmaster General John Potter testified before the committee for about two hours. Yeah. Excuse me, did you, did you have any questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we'll now go to our next panel. We want to thank the postmaster for his uh, patience, as well as uh, the, uh, see else we have? as well as uh, David Feynman, the vice chairman of the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors, and Thomas Day, the vice president of engineering for the U.S. Postal Service, yeah. and the chief operating officer, uh, Pat Donahue. And, uh, I know you've had a busy day, gentlemen, because you've been over to the Senate side, so uh, we appreciate your being here. It's our custom to swear in all the witnesses, so would you please stand and uh, raise your right hand. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so be God. I do. Thank you. Be seated. Mr. Postmaster, uh, have to play cards here. they have to change cards here? <laughs> okay. You can take those home as souvenirs. Okay. I think uh, what we'll do is uh, start with you, uh, Post Mr. Postmaster Potter. Uh, if any of you have opening statements, uh, We'd be happy to hear them. We'll start with you. And if not, we'll get to questions just as quickly as possible. So, Mr. Potter. We, we have one opening statement, and I'll read the opening statement. Good afternoon, Ch Chairman Burton and members of the committee. I've submitted a detailed written statement, which I would ask be entered into the record. Without under, normal, under normal circumstances, I would hear, be here by myself. But with the situation changing daily, I've asked Patrick Donahoe, our Chief Operating Officer to my left, on my right, Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors, David Feynman. Governor Feynman, who is from Philadelphia, is one of the nine presidentially appointed governors of the Postal Service. And to Governor right, uh, Feynman's right is Tom Day, our Vice President for Engineering. Each is part of the team that's focusing on this crisis, and they will be able to add value to our discussion. Mr. Chairman, this is a sad time for us. The Postal Service has lost two members of its family, two of our employees, Joseph Curzine and Thomas Morris, to the anthrax attacks. Three others remain hospitalized, and four have been sickened and are recovering. None of them thought when they came to work in the post office that they would be on the front line of a war. But they were, and thousands of employees are as well. In fact, this is a war against all of our citizens. From the very outset, my overriding concern was for the safety of our employees and the public. We sought out the best information and the best experts to help us understand exactly what we were dealing with. Early on, when there was confusion about how and when anthrax got to American media in Boca Raton, we saw no direct connection to the Postal Service and the system that delivers the mail. Nevertheless, on Tuesday, October 9th, as a precaution, we provided supervisors and employees with updated information 
on what to do if they suspect that biohazards in the mail. Then on Friday, October 12th, the postal landscape changed dramatically. An NBC News employee in New York City was diagnosed with cutaneous anthrax. It became clear that the bioagent had arrived through the mail. Looking back, it's hard to believe all that has transpired in the last 18 days. We took a proactive stance in terms of educating our employees and the public. I cautioned that employees, the public, and companies and organizations that they needed to handle their mail carefully. If they found something out of the ordinary, they needed to respond appropriately to law enforcement agencies. Based on it, the information we had, I stress that this was a time when common sense and caution was needed. To put together a Washington-based task force, it included our union and man management association leaders. On a daily basis, we shared and discussed the latest information, what steps we should take, what were the right things to do. Our labor leaders' comments were valuable and carried equal weight with everyone else around that table. But the facts were sketchy. To that point, the only confirmed anthrax had been in Florida and at NBC New York. On that day, Monday the 15th, employees in Senator Daschle's office opened a letter that had been laced with anthrax. Then things began to accelerate almost by the hour. It was clear that the Daschle letter went through our Brentwood facility in Washington. On Wednesday, testing of 28 Capitol Hill employees came back positive. We were consulting and seeking the best experts we could find. But it was also clear that the mail and the nation were facing a threat that had never encountered before. We continued to operate under the theory that what had been sent was transiting our system in well-sealed envelopes. All along, the Postal Service operated on the principle of open disclosure. I knew that would be critical in protecting our employees and the public and in developing solutions. Knowing that the Daschle letter came through our Brentwood facility and after consulting with our unions, we decided to test the Brentwood facility as a precaution. The preliminary test on Thursday, October 18th came back negative. We felt good about that, although a secondary, more comprehensive laboratory examination would take another 48 to 72 hours. To that time, we had no indication that Brentwood was contaminated. Also on Thursday, October 18th, we joined with the D Justice Department to ask the American people for help by offering a $1 million reward. It was on the 18th that one of our letter carriers in Trenton was diagnosed with cutaneous anthra anthrax. The Trenton and West Trenton facilities were closed for testing, and CDC and the FBI moved in. We had discussed with CDC whether or not our employees should be tested in Brentwood, but all the indications and the best experts said no need. Unfortunately, and how I and others wish we had known, it was Friday, October 19th, when our first Washington employee would be hospitalized with flu-like symptoms. Two days later, on Sunday afternoon, the 21st, we learned of the first case of an employee with inhalation anthrax. Brentwood was immediately closed. As a precaution, we also closed the BWI processing facilities. We were operating in good faith, trying to make the right decisions based on the facts at hand and the advice we were receiving from experts. In fact, out of these dis those discussions, local health authorities began screening employees and providing them with antibiotics that weekend. By Monday, we were making every effort to track down all our Brentwood employees, even those on vacation. Last week, I said this is a not, not a time for finger pointing. I underscore that again. The male and the nation have never experienced anything like this. Where are we today? First of all, the situation remains fluid. Late yesterday afternoon, we learned that two additional facilities in Washington, D.C. were contaminated, and we closed them pending remediation. In addition, trace amounts of anthrax have been found in our plant in West Palm Beach. The remediation is occurring right now. 
For 18 days, we have been working to enhance the safety of our employees and their workplaces. At the same time, we want to keep mail moving to the nation's businesses and households. Let me share some of the actions that we have taken. We have scheduled 200 facilities nationwide to be tested. That's in addition to those facilities in the immediate area of their anthrax attacks where we had testing underway already. We purchased 4.8 million masks, 88 million gloves for our employees. We changed oper operational maintenance practices to reduce the chance of bioagents being blown around the workplace. We are using new cleaning products that kill anthrax bacteria. We have redoubled efforts to communicate to employees through stand-up talks, videos, and postcards directed to their homes to reinforce their awareness of our message. We, have, we also had medical doctors speak to our employees at the work site on the precautions they need to take concerning anthrax and offered employees nationwide counseling services. During the last week, we mobilized every resource to get employees screened, tested, and antibiotics distributed. We are purchasing machines and technology to sanitize mail. Unfortunately, we cannot deploy all the machines tomorrow. In the interim, we are using existing machines and private sector companies to sanitize targeted mail. The anthrax attacks were targeted, and we are responding in a targeted way. We are increasing our education efforts with the public. Postcards alerting every address in America were delivered last week. In all our dealings with our customers, we stress the need for vigilance. We modified our website to provide the latest information on anthrax. In sum, we are focused on getting the message out. I might also add that the cooperation and coordination between and among the federal agencies involved has gotten increasingly stronger as each day goes by. Governor Ridge has been instrumental in building bridges and making things happen. He also has been working to assure that all federal agencies work in a focused way to ensure that the equipment and technology we plan to use is effective. These attacks on our employees, the nation, and the mail are unprecedented. They have hurt us financially. The economic sl slowdown in 2001 already had an impact. Then the tragedy of the attack on September 11th again stunned the economy. The results have been reflected in reduced revenue and mail volumes. Although we are still assessing the economic impact of the anthrax attack, I can tell you it is sizable. We will provide information to the committee when we have it tallied. As I am sure you will agree, protecting America's freedom by ensuring the safety and integrity of the mail is at the core of the Postal Service's mission. Our 800,000 postal employees are using everything they've learned and doing everything humanly possible to keep the mail safe and moving. I cannot say enough how proud I am of the cooperation and spirit I have seen in our employees and in postal customers. They recognize that terrorists have launched an attack on one of America's fundamental institutions, the nation's post offices. We are determined not to let the terrorists stop us. This concludes my prepared statement, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Postmaster. Uh, I was watching television uh, the other night, and one of the postal employees in New York said that a couple of the machines that were being used to process the mail uh, where the anthrax uh, had gone through were just ringed with some kind of yellow uh, tape and that uh, the employees were working in close proximity to that. Can, can you clarify that for us? It's my understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we had four machines where we found traces of anthrax. Mm -hmm. What was done was we sealed that area off. The area that was sealed off was some 150,000 square feet of space. Uh, we brought in cleanup crews to, uh, to remediate that area. When we seal that area, one, one thing that has to be understood about the Morgan Station, it's a 1.8 million square foot facility. It's multi-story. Uh, we brought in CDC, NIOSH, NIOSH the uh, City Health Department, and we 
show them what we had. They were aware of what we had. They advised that we could seal off that area and, uh, and remediate that area without doing any harm to anyone else in the building. Uh, we were assured that the ventilation system in that building uh, had no uh, anthrax spore contamination. So the decision was made to uh, seal off an area and remediate that area, again, working closely with, with uh, the medical authorities. Uh, to determine a, a safe and proper procedure for handling the contamination in that building. So you're pretty confident that that's a safe working area right now? As confident as one can be, you know, getting advice from all the experts, yes. Uh, the Comptroller General six months ago uh, told us that the uh, Postal Service was operating in a very, it, it was one of the financial crisis areas. And I've talked to you and met with the Board of Governors on a number of occasions, I think Mr. Waxman has as well. Uh, you're up against your $15 billion ceiling, and uh, uh, you're going, you were going to run, I think, somewhere around a 2 to $3 billion shortfall this year before all this stuff started to happen, these tragedies. Uh, can you give us a rough idea? And you said you would get us the figures as quickly as possible. But can you give us a rough idea of what needs to be done uh, to uh, help the post office through this crisis without them going bankrupt? Do you need additional revenues for these irradiation machines from the federal government? If so, how much? How much will it take total? And uh, also, we've talked about postal reform for some time. Uh, is it something that we ought to be looking at right now that would help you uh, through this crisis as well? Well, first let me deal with the, the financial uh, situation. We had anticipated that uh, in fiscal year 2002, we would lose somewhere on the order of $1.4 billion. That's after us taking a lot of aggressive steps to consolidate operations and to reduce uh, overhead and some of uh, our staffing. Beyond uh, what's, what's occurred now is that as a result of September 11th, for the first, our first accounting period of the first month of this, this fiscal year, our revenues were some $300 million short of expectations. Our volumes were down 6%. Uh, and that was a result of the September 11th attack. Now we have this anthrax attack which is compounding the situation. And we hope that Americans continue to mail. We hope that Americans continue to have confidence in the mail. Uh, and the best thing that people can do around America for us is to put a stamp on an envelope and, and get it in the mail, continue to use their catalogs. We have not and cannot accurately predict what might happen as a result of the anthrax attacks, and we're going to continue to monitor that situation. However, it's not far-fetched to, to uh, imagine that this uh, situation could end up hurting us to the tune of several billion dollars. But again, it's a, it'll be a function of consumer behavior, business behavior in terms of how they use the mail. In addition to that, we're looking to put in uh, processes and equipment that would sanitize the mail. Uh, and we have worked with the, the Defense Department and others to identify equipment that would, uh, that would uh, sanitize mail and eliminate any bacteria that might be found in mail. The mail that we're looking to sanitize is that mail where people have open access to enter mail into the system. So it's from collection boxes, lobby drops that we might have in post offices, or lobby drops in, in major buildings. Uh, our initial estimate on, on the costs associated with putting that type of, of equipment into our centers is on the order of two and a half billion dollars. So there we have a seven, several billion dollars in costs. In addition to that, we have costs that we didn't anticipate for masks, gloves, and we're going to change our operational procedures such that, uh, uh, you know, we protect our employees. Uh, initially, and I think you're aware that uh, the administration made $175 million mm -hmm. available to the Postal Service. It was for the initial buy of, of sanitizing equipment uh, and the initial buys of gloves, masks, and uh, costs associated with uh, uh, medical and uh, medical treatment for our employees. Uh, so, you know, beyond that initial $175 million, we anticipate that costs continue on. Our hope is that we catch the people who have perpetrated this act, uh, but in, until that time, we have to do what we can to shore up, you know, vulnerabilities, either vulnerabilities to 
uh, into mail into the mail stream or vulnerabilities of our employees. Let me just ask one more question. Uh, you, you, you didn't address the, how these costs uh, will be paid for. Uh, will you need uh, a, a direct uh, appropriation from the federal government in addition to possible stamp price increases to meet the, the cost of uh, these irradiation machines, these cleansing machines? And uh, will that be in conjunction with a postal rate increase, or will that necessitate that? And also the postal reform issue. Well, well I'll okay, I'll, I'll answer the first part, and I'll ask uh, uh, Governor Feynman to uh, uh, follow up with my response on the, the reform issue. Uh, we definitely are going to ask for an appropriation, uh, particularly, you know, for uh, the economic costs associated with this. We view the, a lot of the costs that we're going to bear as part of homeland security, uh, and we don't feel that the ratepayers sh should bear the burden of, of you know, these costs. Uh, we had filed in late September a uh, for a rate increase, uh, and you know that rate increase uh, was already. We anticipated that rate increase may impact the volumes of mail that we have. We don't think that the ratepayers can bear a, an additional burden, so we are going to seek an appropriation to help us with that. We're, we're delighted that that uh, you've taken on postal reform uh, as as one of your key issues. Uh, we are working uh, and will work closely with you uh, on postal reform. We believe that there is there's a need to change uh, to allow us to uh, operate in a more business-like manner. Uh, an area that you know I'm excited to. Uh, get into is is area of uh, negotiated service agreements where we can work with big volume mailers such that we can uh, offer them price uh, packages that would allow them to increase the volume of mail moving through the system and uh, help to finance in the long run uh, the nation's mail. I'll turn to Governor Feynman to, to add to that. Mr. Chairman, um, as you know, and Ranking Member Mr. Waxman, I've met with both of you and met with other members of this committee who have been working on postal reform. Um, and I've spoken passionately about it, you know, the, the absolute necessity to have postal reform prior to the incidents with anthrax. I can only tell you the frustration that I feel today as a member of the Board of Governors, yeah. and that is that um, Many, both myself and my colleagues, we sit on boards of privately held companies. And if you had a major catastrophe, the board of directors, the management would come to the board of directors with a whole bunch of things that you might do. In today's world, the way the Postal Service, the law that was written in 1970, we don't have the luxury of doing much. And that is particularly in the area of pricing. Assume today that we wanted to get our volumes up. Assume that we could go to some of our uh, major suppliers, that is, some of our major customers, and we could say to them, you know, it's absolutely necessary to keep people having confidence in the mail. What we'd like to do is we'd like to lower the price for you right now, for the next month. I'd like to maybe lower the price a little bit and see if we can increase volumes. We can't do that. The law prohibits it. What we have to do is file a rate case, and I've testified here before, as you know, that it'll take us 16, sometimes 20 months by the time we finish and start preparing a rate case to get it finally finished. And. Um, it doesn't work in a modern society. The law just doesn't work. And I would say to you that the situation with anthrax is a frustrating situation for us on the board because we, we feel like our hands are tied, that there aren't that many things that we can do in regard to the financial viability of the Postal Service. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Mr. Mr. Potter, as I understand the the cornerstone of the approach that the uh, uh, Postal Service is planning in response to this anthrax possibility in the mail is to try to sanitize the mail so that uh, 
consumers will know that when they receive mail that it won't have anthrax and it won't have any other harmful biological agent in it. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yes. Sir. And you're looking at you're looking at uh, uh, asking the taxpayers to, to come up with 2.5 billion dollars to help pay for this new technological innovation. And I support helping the Postal Service, but I want to be sure that we're doing it the right possible way. As I understand it, there are uh, two types of technology. One is it what's called e-beams, and the other is x-rays. And these technologies uh, are both effective, but they have strengths and weaknesses. For example, the, um, the e-beam, uh, they both use radiation to kill bacteria and viruses. They've both been proven to be safe uh, for use on food and medical equipment. But the, if you look at the e-beam technology, my understanding is that the Postal, the postal Service uh, wants to use this to sanitize letters by directing a stream of electrons at mail that passes on a conveyor belt. Uh, my staff contacted private sector experts in e-beam beam technology, and we're told that e-beam has promise in sanitizing large amounts of mail. And according to these experts, the advantages of this approach are that sterilization can occur quickly and efficiently. But they also told us that using e-beam technology to sanitize the mail poses large engineering uh, problems, because e-beam technology has been used for really homogenous kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, products, uh, like sterilizing medical syringes or whatever. They're basically the same thing. And therefore, uh, the uh, engineers can adjust the technology to ensure that the right dose is administered. But in the mail, it's very different. We have different size packages. Uh, we can have not only the variations in weight, but the composition can be different. Uh, and I want you to answer this question, but I, I'm limited in time. One of the things I want you to answer for the record is the assurances about being able to overcome these engineering problems and adapt e-beam technology to something as complex as the mail stream. So that's one thing we're going to need an answer for. But I want to get to the second point. The other is to look at x-ray technology. And uh, the problem with e-beam technology, it won't penetrate solid matter very very far, uh, but e even dense letters may not be sanitized, as I understand it, uh, with e-beam, but the x-ray can sterilize far deeper than e-beams, can be used for sterilization of large packages. However, according to experts I've consulted, x-rays are far less efficient, far more time consuming, potentially far more costly than e-beams. So I have a lot of questions about this technology. But I also want to ask you, why aren't we doing something common sense like Obviously, you're not going to put everything through a screening. If it's a, you, you indicated if it, if they were in a, um, a mailing house, you're, you know, there's no need to screen it. Exactly. What you're looking at is mail that goes into a collection box or a lobby drop. That's mail that uh, terrorists can use uh, in a way that keeps them anonymous. Isn't that really the problem we're looking at? Right. Th that is the problem we're looking at. And again. Uh, we don't want to take away a freedom that we have in America to, to have open access to, to the mail stream. Uh, so we're trying to balance that with technology. Now, regarding the technology, I'm obviously not an expert. My expertise is moving mail around the country. But we are going to use e-beam x-ray technology. And you know, anticipating that I might get a question on that, I brought the Vice President of Engineering, Tom Day, who's working with the best people in, in the field on this. So I, let me turn it over. Well, before you do. Yes, sir. Um, E-beam uh, technology and x-ray technology can be different. They can be referred to the same, but they are different technologies, as I understand it. But let's look at it. Before you even use the high-tech, high-priced technology that, that have pluses and minuses, why not take away some of the freedom that people have to go in anonymously and send packages? Why not have people uh, be required to come in personally and have some identification before they start mailing some kinds of, of uh, uh, letters or packages that might be harmful? Why, why can't there be some kind of analysis the way did you do it in some airline screening where you make a, an assessment of somebody face to face whether they are uh, possibly someone you want to watch carefully 
because of the, the demeanor they have or the way they approach the, the males. How about some of that uh, less expensive way to deal with narrowing the amount of mail that would have to go through either e-beam or x-ray technology? Well, I have a couple of responses to that. One is that, in my opinion, it would be more expensive to do that. We have some 50 a billion pieces of mail that come in through collection boxes over the course of the year. So it would be a recurring expense as well. It would be an inconvenience to the American public. And so the introduction of, of technology is, is something that uh, uh, we feel uh, would be the most cost effective means of dealing with this problem for the American public as a whole. Of course, packages, they still have to come in face-to-face -face and, and take it to a place. Packages where they're, where beyond they're a certain size, yes, uh, Congressman. And do you think that's kept uh, the people from using the Postal Service for their packages? No, I don't, but, uh, but I do believe that if, if, uh, if we had everybody come into the Postal Service uh, with their letters, that that would be inconvenient to, to many Americans. And I they may look to, to use other technologies to get... Uh, uh, their bills and payments done. Well, that may happen anyway. Uh, my time is up. I just want to conclude this round or this opportunity because I'm going to further okay. request answers to some questions in writing for the record. I would hope you would consider trying to figure out low-tech, low-cost ways to narrow the amount of mail that has to go through the high-tech, high-price screening, uh, especially since there are pluses and minuses in the technology, the technologies you're considering. And I would just hate to see us spend billions of dollars on high-priced technology that may not work and probably won't be un available for a very long period of time. Isn't that correct? We're looking at years, or at least a year or two, before you can sanitize the mail and assure everybody that every piece of mail is, uh, is secure. Looking today at manual screening of mail in targeted areas to try and identify pieces of mail that may be tainted and moving through the mail stream. Again, expensive to do. It will be a recurring cost. Um, and I'm unsure, should we have uh, Mr. Day respond, or would you like that done for the record, uh, Congressman? I, if, the, if the chair would uh, yeah, permit, let's ahead. get it for the go record. Go ahead and respond, oh, Mr. Day. Do you want Day? him to respond? Yes, I want to hear the response to the question. Okay. You, you, you well, then, Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll have a chance for follow-up questions. Congressman, you, you pretty well summarized the pluses and minuses on the two technologies. Um, we have not done this on our own. I've worked with the uh, President's Office of Science and Technology. Um, Dr. Uh, Marburger has been very gracious to help us coordinate with the various federal agencies um, to get the right specifications for the equipment we need. I can tell you in discussions we've had uh, on two separate occasions with, with various other federal agencies uh, that the belief was that our long-term solution with technology should be the X-ray because, as you correctly pointed out, the issue of penetration. Uh, E-beam is our interim solution and we're limiting the product we send through there uh, in, in a way that ensures that it's properly irradiated and the, uh, any biohazard can be eliminated. That, that took a bit of discussion amongst the agencies uh, and it's interesting because no one ever thought of this technology for the mail, uh, but it involved both the FDA as well as some work by the Department of Defense uh, to come up with some agreement about what, in the term used, is dosing levels to ensure that you've achieved the kill rate on the uh, biohazard. And we've set it exceptionally high uh, with very stringent quality controls to make sure that it works. But you're correct, the long term, to ensure you've got penetration is the X-ray solution. Um, the me, one, I might, uh, just so we understand, if that's the direction you're taking, we, we're going to need to know uh, the cost of X-raying a single piece of mail, how long it'll take to sterilize a typical, typical package with X-ray, how much energy we're going to have to use uh, for these X-rays to sanitize the mail, and uh, how much radiation needs to be used to kill a collection of anthrax spores. I don't, other members have questions, but we're going to need to get those answers at some point in the legislative process Gentlemen's before time we expired. appropriate the money. I'd ask unanimous consent to put in the record congressional testimony of the U.S. Postal Service Safety and Security, Charles Moser, President of the National Association of Postmasters. Um, without objection, um, I also ask unanimous consent to include in the record uh, 
an article by Alan Robinson, Direct Communications Group. Um, could the USPS be the first major business casualty of the war on terrorism? That objection is so ordered for both articles. Uh, the chair now yields himself five minutes for questioning. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Potter, for coming and testifying, and all of the uh, people you brought with you. Uh, the eyes of the nation are really focused very, very intensely on this. Uh, let me just start out by asking you, what would you say to the average American who goes down to his mailbox in the afternoon to get his mail? My message to the average American is that the mail is safe, that they need to take the proper precautions and have awareness about what's in their mailbox to assure that it's safe. We, I would suggest to them that they read the postcard that we sent them that would make them aware of things that might be out of the ordinary in their mailbox and, uh, and advise them on what to do in the event that they come across something that's out of the ordinary. But we deliver to 137 million addresses every day. And we've had a handful of letters that have moved through the system and have caused, obviously, death and uh, have caused uh, disease. And, uh, but in terms of the average mailbox, the knowledge that people have in, of what's in their mailbox, greeting cards or packages that they might have ordered from a catalog or their bills uh, or letters from loved ones, that mail is safe. And would you say that those items you were just mentioning, catalogs and um, mail, say, from a utility company, say, a bill, those items are to be viewed as safe, um, that it's other pieces of mail that perhaps meet the description as has been outlined in the press that is more of a concern? Yes, Congressman. Okay. Now, this may be a question for Mr. Day. I just want to follow up a little bit on uh, the line of questioning the ranking member was pursuing. Uh, there are very few companies that make this irradiation equipment. So even if we gave you an appropriation, it's going to take, I understand, months to years to get all this equipment in place. Is that correct? Congressman, I, in general sense, you're correct. One of the things we've quickly realized is that it is a very limited industry. Previous uses were generally food processing as well as uh, medical equipment sterilization, a few industrial uses as well. So a very limited industry. We've already begun discussions. One of the things quickly uh, determined is that the industry uh, depends upon a couple of key suppliers for key components to make the system. We've already begun the discussion to see what it would take to ramp up those key suppliers as well as uh, try to get some of the bigger uh, companies that we deal with for postal technology potentially to help with the manufacturing, uh, to ramp up the manufacturing of this product as well. Uh, you're correct, it is a very limited source currently, but we have begun the discussion to see what it would take to speed up the uh, production of the equipment. Now, I've heard the discussion of how you will uh, make some sort of distinction between high-risk and low-risk mail. Um, and I can understand if you're taking a bulk delivery from, say, Sears Roebuck or Land's End of catalogs from a printing company, that constitutes a lower-risk uh, mail product for you. But how, how are you going to protect the postal workers that are collecting the mail from the drop boxes. Um, I, it's fine if you have an irradiation machine and you're taking it to the irradiation machine and it gets irradiated and then it comes to my house and I know it's been sanitized and I'm safe, but what about the postal worker who's going to those drop boxes and collecting the mail? We have a, a separate group from the engineering group working on the process, the collection box process to assure that those employees that might remove mail from a collection box are, are not put in harm's way. Today they're doing that via mask and, and gloves, but we believe that there are processes that we can put in place to, uh, to prevent them from uh, coming into harmful contact with that mail. 
and we're working on those as we speak. Is there any discussion of vaccinating the workforce for anthrax and or other biological agents? The, uh, the Surgeon General did make that statement and we're going to rely on, on the medical community to, uh, to, to give us that advice. Uh, we're, we're not medical experts. Um, just a couple of additional questions. Um, well, I see my time has expired. Let me just ask one quick one. I understand um, the FAA is not allowing uh, USPS parcels on passenger flights anymore. Is that true? Uh, uh, the FAA has, uh, there, there are restrictions uh, that, that the FAA has regarding the, the transport of packages uh, above a certain weight on uh, on domestic has passenger airlines. Has that impacted your operations at all, the restrictions on mail that's traveling on uh, passenger airliners? Yes, it has. We've had to uh, expand the, the surface reach for packages as well as move those packages uh, onto uh, uh, cargo carriers as opposed to uh, uh, passenger carrier planes. Um, well, my time has expired. I thank you, um, and the chair now yields to uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank you, Mr. Potter, and, and all of your colleagues for, for your important testimony today. You may know that I had a town meeting last night. Among many, uh, over 500 residents uh, came, were a fair number of postal workers, and uh, not surprisingly, there is still some uh, disconcerted a response there. Uh, many of them are still dislocated because you're decontaminating the Brentonwood facility. You had a something of a labor relations problem before anthrax. Obviously, you're going to have a, a problem afterwards. This is a tough workplace. It was a tough workplace without disease. It's become uh, a much tougher one, but. I, Frankly, I'm not interested in recrimination. I am interested in whether or not the post office is prepared, the, po is prepared to, the postal service is prepared to save lives uh, and to give the appropriate assurances going forward. Uh, apparently, the only contingency plan the postal service had uh, was one that would allow the mail to be de delivered in the case of interruptions such as the, uh, as, a pl as the plane's not going up and the rest, but nothing related to hazardous substances. I'd like to ask a question about Brentwood in particular. These workers have been out of the workplace at Brentwood now, I don't know, what is it, a week? Some contamination job must really be going on. They've been out for a long time. Um, I assume now that a great deal of planning is going on in the Postal Service. Uh, to stay ahead of, cr of the crisis and of disease. Can you assure us that after the facility is decontaminated, that only sanitized mail will be processed through the Brentwood uh, Postal Service, Postal Station? We will be able to assure that once we have the equipment in place to sanitize mail. Well, the reason I ask is you go through, you know, workers out in there for a week or more, and if, in fact, anything other than sanitized mail goes in, how is anyone to know that the process of contamination is not going to be repeated? Th that, is, that is a dilemma that we all are facing right now. It's a terrible dilemma, given the, the deaths at, at Brentwood. And I, is there a planning, is there a planning group trying to look ahead in, 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 in ways like this? What we, good will it do to right. tell people to come back if they don't know if the, that the next letter coming in has anthrax in it and everybody might be out of Brentwood all over again? We are working as, as diligently as we can to identify a targeted mail and screen it early in the process to keep it out of our mail systems. Uh, I would just ask, and I understand the dilemma you're under. This is a brand new situation. Nobody's ever had right. to think this through before. But I, I do believe that it would be important for your workforce, important for the people who live here, and important for the federal presence. If 
The mail going through Brentwood in particular, even if not sanitized by the new technology, could go through some process that would give everybody some assurance, even if it was low tech, even with some of what the ranking member was discussing, that would say to people, this mail has not come in blind. Something has happened that makes it different from uh, before. There is a before and after here for all mail, or else I think you're going to have a crisis of confidence that, that continues. We are looking at a number of things in, in the Brentwood facility. Uh, obviously, uh, the mail that, that was targeted initially uh, in this, this case was government mail. We're, we're considering not moving government mail back into that facility. Keep that isolated and make sure that that's appropriately sanitized before employees there touch it. Uh, we also, you know, until we have sanitizing equipment in place, the, the best thing we can do for our employees is offer them protection, that protection in the form of gloves, the protection in the form of masks. It's not the ultimate solution. We don't want our employees walking around, uh, you, you know, feeling that they're in an unsafe environment. But in the interim, that is the short-term solution that, that we can find in addition to uh, targeted screening of mail uh, as it's collected in places uh, of concern. Mr. Potter, on page two of your testimony, you describe how the, and the postal inspector was here earlier, how your postal inspection service has, quote, been actively involved with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'd like to know exactly how they operate. Is the FBI on the one hand, there's a postal inspector on the other. Uh, let me give you the model that often is used in D.C. In D.C., the FBI sits in D.C. police headquarters so that if a matter local or federal rises to a certain level, you can't tell the difference between the FBI and the D.C. police because they work like that. I want to know how the postal inspector operates operationally. How is he related or she related to the FBI? On individual cases, and obviously we have an investigation going on here, they work as a joint team uh, working on all of these matters. Today, they're not only investigating uh, to, to try and determine who the perpetrator of, of uh, the crime of putting anthrax in the mail was, but they're working closely together with the FBI and local law enforcement to track down all of the hoaxes that we have because the hoaxes are as big a problem in terms of the psyche of the American public as the actual anthrax because we don't have anthrax in California but we do have a number of hoaxes that have been perpetrated out there so there's a, a entire law enforcement effort working very diligently on this whole matter uh, and uh, in, in each of these cases it's a, it's a matter of a team working together. I think it's transparent, as you described in D.C., as to who's who. It's just a matter of working as a team, putting our resources against it, and following up to find the terrorists, because this is a terrorist who's putting anthrax in the mail, and to get after those folks that are committing hoaxes. And we're happy that there have been 18 arrests around the country uh, from a ho and regarding hoaxes, and we anticipate more. General lady's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Horn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was uh, very interested in some of the dialogue and the policies on this. And I want to say, Mr. Postmaster General, in my town and in this building, I've never seen a clerk that did not have a smile on its face. And I've never seen a letter carriers in Long Beach, California that I've uh, seen anything but uh, something uh, on their face. They are out in the sun, and uh, it's a tough job. And I took uh, uh, one time a big cake with the seal of the post office to each of the uh, 10 post offices. One person broke down. He said, you're the person that's ever thanked me. And uh, it's a tough job. But uh, I've got some concerns about your predecessors, uh, Mr. Runyon in particular, if he put this policy in. One day I had 100 individuals, federal workers, that were eligible for federal worker compensation. And about 60 of the 100 were postal. 
and I said, I want you to tell me, how's this system work? And one said, well, you know, the vice president in the region and the manager, uh, they wouldn't even let him uh, give me the form. Now, that's a real problem, and I realize when you're at the top of the heat, uh, you uh, can't be everywhere. But I would hope now that you're in office that you could turn some of those attitudes around because there's a real feeling out there. And uh, I have read several hundred uh, of these before they've gone to the Department of Labor, and I've got real bones with them. They aren't doing much, and uh, they aren't treating people as human beings. And I said earlier, before you came here, you put two human beings in your speech, and I put one in my uh, question, and uh, nobody else really went for it. So it uh, looks like you're a pretty humane guy, and I would hope that you would look that at that whole operation where their uh, the executives get money for not having health forms out, it seems to me. And, and that bothers me. And I'm told uh, your uh, predecessor once removed, Mr. Runyon, had a $100,000 retirement party. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, it's stupid, especially when everybody else gets a new penny on their uh, stamp. And I think you'd agree with that. I'm not planning one, but I'd like to say that, uh, in resp and that wasn't meant to the gym, but I'd like to say that this effort, when we were faced with this challenge uh, of anthrax, the first thing we did, and it was part of my statement, was put together a task force, and on that task force we have our, our four largest unions, the presidents are there, we have three management associations there. And part of the reason that they're there is because, yes, I'm at the top and it's a very large organization, and I can get feedback through my managers, but I also need to get feedback through those who represent the employee groups. And so if we find out that a stand-up talk wasn't, you know, given in an appropriate manner, you know, we're able to correct that. We also have an opportunity by working closely with the unions to get their input up front. So we can understand and they can understand why we're doing things uh, and why we're making changes, get input from them on changes that they would recommend. And working collaboratively, we're going to have to attack the terrorists in the same manner that they're attacking us. We're going to have to get after this problem. And I know that we cannot do that independently. It's going to take all 800,000 employees and we need uh, to mobilize all 800,000 employees, and the best way to do that is to work with the leadership of those employee groups. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from New York, uh, Ms. Maloney. Mr. Chairman, I, I am a reading this uh, article in The Economist, and it begins by saying, few Americans want to be postal workers at this moment. Fewer would like to be John Porter. And I'd just like to say, and it goes on and it describes all the challenges that you confront and the dangers in the post office. And I, when you come forward with your list of concerns, I certainly want to be part of the team uh, working to help uh, the postal workers in the post office. The, the last thing that we want to do during this uh, economic downturn is to put these costs on the backs of postal customers. Uh, high mailing costs uh, have contributed to the demise of several high-profile high magazines in the district that I represent recently, and uh, five have closed in my district, Mademoiselle, Mode, Brill, and uh, Industry Standard, to name a few. And we can't just keep passing along uh, costs to customers because then they can't compete, and then they go out of business. I, I am uh, really supportive that the administration has already come forward with $173 million to help the, the Postal Service, and I, I know that I'll be one supporting other efforts to help the Postal Service. But don't you think the Postal Service should likewise help the mailing community out as well during this very tough economic time? And shouldn't you or the Postal Office delay implementation of any rate increase until January 2003 or even later. 
uh, magazines tell me that the rate increases that they confront are over 24 percent in the past two years. And, and I'd like to know where you stand on rate increases. Well, and will they be put off as other things have been put off? <clears throat> the decision about uh, what we do with the rate increase will, will certainly be uh, 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 determined by what, ha what transpires in, in, in the next several months. Uh, the, uh, we entered into a, a rates process uh, in September uh, that would take 10 months, normally take 10 months. We're very grateful that the Rate Commission has decided to uh, try to expedite that case, not expedite the, the rate increase, but just expedite the whole process uh, to, to negotiate uh, rates. Uh, we will be better postured, and we've told our, our mailers that we will be better postured to make a decision about when we could implement rates or when we should implement rates uh, next summer, and it's still our intent to, to do that. We, like you, agree that uh, that mailers should not bear the full burden of these terrorist attacks. This is a homeland security issue. This is a, uh, a service that's provided by the federal government, that's paid for by the ratepayers, but we have a very, very unusual circumstance here, and that's why we would move ahead to, to seek appropriation to avoid the type of uh, economic impact on, on our uh, magazine publishers and others who use the mail. Would you like I, to answer I, that? I, I uh, represent uh, New York uh, City, and I've received uh, numerous phone calls from postal workers who uh, cannot understand why New York's Morgan uh, Station facility is, is opened while uh, New Jersey, the postal areas in, in Washington were closed along with four congressional office buildings, uh, some of whom, uh, some of the office buildings closed for Congress did not even uh, find anthrax. There wasn't even... It was just a suspicion. So I'd, I'd like to know who is making the decisions to close or keep open postal facilities? Who makes that decision? Does a different person make the decision in different areas or in different states? Well, the decision is, is made initially on a local level a local with level. input from the medical officials that we have on board, the CDC, in the case of New York City, CDC, NIASH, and, and NIOSH and the city health department were in New York, in Morgan. They analyzed the data that they had, uh, and they made a decision that we could seal off the area on that workroom floor and that we could uh, successfully remediate the area. Again, it was traces of anthrax found on four machines. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill Burris, who's in the front row, uh, who's uh, the president-elect of the American Postal Workers Union. He and I met at a funeral on Friday. Uh, he expressed concerns, uh, and we, we discussed what options we had. What we did in the case of Morgan, in response to the concerns of, of the employees there, was we had those medical officials go in and give talks to all the employees to explain to them exactly what it was that was found, explain to them how we were remediating it, explain to them what threat, if any, there was to them, and we gave those employees the option of staying in that facility or moving to another location right across the street in our general post office. Uh, so we took the advice of the, the local medical officials, however, Throughout this process, people have the ability to raise their concerns, mm -hmm. and that's one of the one of the benefits of having this task force. The employees raise the concerns through the American Postal Workers Union. We were able to get together, discuss the issue, and come up with with options that we believe were fair to the employees, or I believe were fair to the employees. I don't want to speak for Bill, but do you, do you think these decisions should be centralized? Now they're basically local decisions and different people making decisions, as I understand it, at different facilities. So it appears to me that possibly it should be centralized with centralized uh, standards and criteria uh, to determine uh, so that there is a consistent, clear method that 
all of us can understand and all the workers can understand. And uh, I know my time is up, but very briefly, why has this decision not been centralized? Are you going to move to centralized standards and procedures? Well, let me ask you, say briefly that um, all these situations have individual circumstances. Uh, you know, we, we're finding different things in Florida than we found in New York, than we found in Brentwood, than we're finding in Trenton, New Jersey. And we are working to establish a consistent protocol. However, we're not getting consistent advice in, in each of these locations. Um, it, it's kind of comparable to what medications is somebody on. Uh, at one point it's Cipro, the next point it's deoxycycline. So we're in a very fluid situation and we respond to the people uh, locally and we do seek the advice of people at a national level beyond the Postal Service, the CDC and others. So it, it's an evolving situation and we are looking to develop a clear s set of protocols but again, the, the mm -hmm. situation is so dynamic and so fluid we haven't been able to get to that yet. Well, thank you very much, and I, I sent you a letter earlier on just what we've been talking about, clear standards and protocols, and thank you very much. Thank you. General, your time luck. has expired. Thank Ms. you. Mr. La Tourette. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, General. Um, just a, an introductory comment. As with your predecessor in the previous administration, I, I want you to know that when I watch television, uh, when Deputy Postmaster General Wilhite gets on the television screen. She's very reassuring to the American public, and I think she's a, a good presence for the service, as are you. Um, you created a little bit of a stir this week in Ohio as trucks rolled through uh, Ohio to Lima, Ohio, uh, and that is my understanding, the, the plant that you have uh, two contracts with for six months to use their facilities. <laughs> I, I want to follow up with, from where Mr. Waxman was because I saw um, interviews with the gentleman that owns the facility and, and uh, listen to what he had to say relative to his technology. And I, I don't have the same understanding that Mr. Waxman did. What, what this gentleman is explaining, and maybe you can tell us, is that um, the mail is taken from the Brentwood facility or other places in Washington, D.C., put in a sanitized bag, put in another sanitized bag, put in a box. Uh, the box is then carried on a FedEx hazmat truck, delivered to the facility, put on conveyor belts and then goes under this uh, conveyor belt with the electronic beams. The, the gentleman did not express any uh, concern that, uh, I, I heard Mr. Waxman talk about thicknesses and maybe you can't do a fat package or a dense package. Uh, the, he was pretty much, and I know it's his business and he's proud of his business, but he was pretty sure that what they were doing in Lyme, Ohio was going to sanitize this mail to everybody's satisfaction. Is that, is that your, mis your understanding as well? Congressman, what you described is, um, is very accurate. Um, the discussion that, that my staff has had, uh, again with Dr. Uh, Marburger's assistance, is talking to both the Department of Defense and our um, base that we're comparing this to is research done by the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute that assessed this technology on a variety of biohazards and established dosing levels that would safely um, achieve kill rates to assure that you had a safe product. Um, the other source of, of information is the Federal Drug Administration, who's regulated this process for uh, food processing. Right. That combined, uh, without getting too specific, what we came to a conclusion is from the study done by the um, Department of Defense, that there was a safe level. However, as was described by Congressman Waxman, there's a level of homogeneity, con same product being run through. So the question became is with mail, which can be very different from one mail piece to the next, how do you determine a dose level that's appropriate? Well, the dose level that we've established is twice what the research would have indicated and beyond. To further evaluate that it's being done properly, there's a device called a dosimeter that actually measures, did you get the dose you thought? That's placed inside the product. Uh, so we're running that quality assurance. And to assure that the product truly gets scanned properly, it's run through, does a 180 degree to turn, and then run through in the opposite direction. We're just trying to apply every measure of certainty that what we're doing here is applying the correct dose and sanitizing the mail. I would finally comment that 
We're also limiting the product that we're making that claim on. When you start dealing with packages, uh, you really can't assure that somebody could have screened so that the dose couldn't be applied. We will have a separate process, and there are some packages that are making their way into Ohio. That's fine. It doesn't do any damage. But what we're saying should be safe is the letters and what we call flats, the larger business uh, size envelopes, uh, will be properly dosed. So we're working closely with the other federal agencies that have normally dealt with this kind of uh, technology. And, and the other observation is, and you don't have to comment on this, but I also, there's been some published reports that this process damages credit cards, and I understand that that is not, it doesn't damage credit cards, is that right? Uh, under some very preliminary tests uh, done by the company we're using in Ohio, which is uh, parent company is Titan Industries, they specifically tested credit cards, and uh, it does not damage the card. I also very specifically asked Dr. Marburg, who has some expertise in this field, he did not believe that the type of dose we're talking here, the electronic beam and the magnetic uh, medium that would be on the back of a credit card, that there should be a problem. Same question has been asked about checks that go through the mail, because that industry also, use, also uses a magnetic ink to sort. Uh, we also believe that there will be no harm to that uh, product as well. Thank you. And uh, General, just before my time expires, uh, there's been some observations made, and you've talked about them, the, the governor's talked about them, uh, about postal reform, negotiated settlement agreements, and so forth and so on. Just, just speaking as, as one member of this panel who has worked with on postal reform in the past, I, I think most of us recognize that a disaster struck the Postal Service on September 11th. It's continued to strike with the anthrax scare. But to tie in some issues that have been rather contentious relative to negotiated service agreements in an attempt to solve the anthrax problem would be, in my opinion, uh, a serious mistake. And I hope we don't use the, the events that have occurred as a result of terrorist activity uh, to put newspapers, magazines, and other mailers out of business. Um, and, and I would just indicate that some of us are still scratching our heads about the contract that your predecessor entered into with Federal Express, with, with, which left a lot of questions. So I hope we solve your anthrax problems, give you plenty of money to make the mail safe, but I hope we don't go down a path as sort of let's tag that on, too, because I think that would be a mistake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The sentiments that the gentleman just expressed are not consistent with the chairman. Uh, let's see who's next. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, and uh, the Postmaster General, thank you for uh, your service to this country. I know this has been a tough time for you and your staff, and I, I know our committee is very concerned about the people who are making the decisions that they get support and trying to do their job, and I think this committee has been very supportive. I have some questions about uh, uh, this plan uh, to use uh, irradiation equipment. Have, uh, have there been any studies done on the impact that could have on the workers who are using the equipment to make sure we're not creating more of a problem here? Again, I'll defer to uh, Thomas Day. Congressman, uh, this is a proven technology, again, that has been used in uh, food processing. Um, has it some, ever been used for mail before? It has not been used for mail. The, the technology is such there is substantial shielding that is built around the actual equipment. That's where the irradiation actually takes place. There is no radiated byproduct that comes out with it. Uh, we, uh, we are confident that, again, and I'm going to rely upon the experts of the field, I do not claim to be a physicist, uh, that the guidance they have given us on how to send mail through this type of technology uh, will not cause harm. The, the only harm that can occur is if you're physically in the room where this takes place. That is a very secure, controlled environment with uh, shielding. And again, an industry that has been around for a while, tightly regulated and tightly controlled to ensure the safety of the workers who are around it. I, I, I think that's going to be essential because, uh, you know, we're here in part because of workplace safety issues that were not addressed in a timely manner. And uh, I think that uh, the American people want to make sure that anyone using this equipment is not going to be adversely affected because if the equipment is powerful enough to kill anthrax spores, uh, I would imagine at the doses that are being uh, recommended for this process, there might be some question about it posing any hazard to other, uh, to humans and other living organisms. Now, I, I wanted to uh, 
uh, ask Mr. Potter, uh, how many how many letters uh, communication to the the government? You know, all these letters that you have that are being boxed up and shipped out to Lima, Ohio. Uh, about how many pieces of mail are there? Um, Congressman, uh, right now we're we're looking. It's probably around a million pieces of mail. And and that's uh, for. That's for the uh, up to federal. To what date? I'm sorry. What are the dates involved? Uh, some of that mail goes back to whenever the uh, the House and the Senate shut down their post offices back when the original Dashell letter came through. Members of Congress understand that the ability of our constituents to communicate with us through the mail is an essential part of our job. Yes. I mean the the phrase you know write your congressman or right. congresswoman has a, a, an entire lore about it in terms of its importance to government, mm -hmm. that we can keep this government of the people functioning. So um, how long would you say it might be before we'll be able to get this information, these letters, back into Back into your ba hands. Back into okay. our offices. Let me tell you exactly what we've done. On uh, Friday of last week, we, we asked all of the government mail managers, all the offices, what the, the Congress, uh, the, through the White House, all the agencies came in. Uh, Tom Day and a number of people went through a number of safety procedures around what to look for with our inspection service. Tom explained to your radiation. We also provided these managers uh, some, some of the tips that we were using in, internal to the Postal Service as well as masks and gloves. Really tried to bring up to speed exactly uh, what a, each of the government agencies, agencies should be doing in their mailroom. Um, we have started delivering mail. On Monday, we began delivering mail. We will continue this process as we get the irradiated mail back uh, from Ohio. It has started to come back, and by Thursday, some of the personal correspondence will be, will be back in your system. So people will be able to communicate with their representatives through the mail now? Do you have a system set up so it, it's not going through this equipment, It's coming, but it is coming into the House and the Senate? It will come, but it's still going to go through the equipment. It will be a little bit slower, but we, we're looking again for safety first. It, there will be some, some, some delays at this point. And the mail that's being irradiated, um, if let's say we're in the Longworth building, which isn't open yet, is that mail then going to be set aside? And then given to us when the Longworth building is open, like what are you what are you no. doing in the Senate? We, the Hart building? Right, we we delivered all of the mail to the to say the the house house post office. They would sort and then hold mail for any buildings that would be closed. We 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 deliver all of the mail. And the individual for, and the individuals would uh, right. would have a chance to go get their own mail. I mean, well, I, how do you do this? Well, maybe let me back up a second. We deliver the mail to the Congress in bulk. The Congress hires folks who work the mailroom. And so we're going to continue to deliver it to wherever you tell us, and your contractor will sort the mail and make it available to you. So, so you'll be delivering, yeah. you're saying that the irradiated mail, all of it will be back yes. in Washington by? It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. As you heard Mr. Day explain, we're taking the mail out. Uh, it, it, it gets irradiated, comes back, is sorted in our government mail facility, and then we distribute it to the government offices, including the Congress. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it'd be, uh, I think all of us would like to know, and I think our constituents would want to know, how much more the, the letters they're sending us are going to be delayed. And if we have an, another internal step here that we have to look at, I think it'd be interesting for uh, the, the chair and the ranking member to. Uh, inquire about it. Thank Congress, Congressman, we just began this process, so we're, we are learning as we speak in terms of the throughput and the capability of this facility. We're also looking to uh, move mail into other uh, private facilities, and we are quickly moving ahead with, and we signed a contract last Friday to uh, purchase our own uh, electron beam technology, and we anticipate the deployment of that shortly. So we, we will provide that for the record. G gentleman's time has expired. Uh, let me just uh, say that uh, I'm sure that the Postmaster General will keep the Congress informed 
on all of this so that we can disseminate it to all the members of Congress as quickly as possible. In the interim, I'll tell you, one thing that we have done is that any correspondence we're sending out to constituents, we say that if you send a letter and you haven't had a response yet, write us again because it may or may not uh, get to us for a while. So, Mr. Stoddard. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, first I want to apologize that I missed the first part of the hearing. I was actually chairing two hearings up on the Canadian border looking at border security. I did hear Mr. Potter's testimony in the radio, uh, in addition to having read all the testimony that had been given. Let me uh, first uh, comment along the lines of, of Mr. La Tourette. Uh, this is not an opportunity to use the current crisis to fix things that we've been debating where we have substantive policy. Things. I've, I've read the next panel's testimony as well. I know it's going to come up again, but let me assure you that uh, we understand that there is a crisis in the mail system. We're gridlocked in some of how to resolve this, and we have to have real resolution, and we're not going to be steamrolled by a crisis that may not directly relate to that. That said, there are going to be additional costs to the post office because of the crisis that, that regardless of our opinion on the broader postal reform, that we understand we, we are dependent on the mail in this country for all forms of communication, and it is a, a, a central American principle that we want to try to protect, but um, that you're likely to get more uh, conflict if you push too hard in this period because we're having all sorts of industries come into Washington saying uh, often with problems they had before they came, uh, before September 11th, to, to, to come to us, and uh, it's going to get old real fast. Also, there is a difference, quite frankly, in the post office from a pure private sector. We regulate prices in the energy sector. Anybody who has a government monopoly uh, is subject, even if you're quasi-independent, to more regulations, and you always will be, as long as, as you have had uh, assets that were invested by the general taxpayer, and as, as long as, uh, quite frankly, uh, some of the management reforms that you might undertake as a business, such as Saturday delivery, uh, closing certain regional post offices, uh, having different rates in first class, probably Congress would react if you started doing certain of those type of things. And so you're always going to be kind of a quasi-independent agency that we have to work together, even though the goal has been more for independence. I also wanted to, to make a brief comment. I know one of my colleagues asked about vaccinations. This committee has had numerous hearings on anthrax vaccinations and problems therein regarding the Guard and, and others. It is not a slam dunk. Uh, what we do know is we know that there is a minimal but small risk to people who take the vaccination. We know that the company shut down. We know that their supplies have never been FDA cleared. But what we also know is, is that it doesn't treat most strains of anthrax. And there's a lot of publicity in this country about how the vaccination, even if we had the supply, even if it was untainted, and even if it was FDA, FDA cleared, does not appear to work for the strains that are common in, in Iraq and some of that we're looking at. So, so it isn't a, a you know, a silver bullet for the post office or for the armed services or for American citizens, and it's kind of gotten lost in this national uh, uh, concern about anthrax. I also, just being general contrarian, want to raise one other, one other point and would like you to particularly comment on this point if you'd like to comment on the, any of the others. Um, unlike uh, many, um, uh, but there's a general concern in the public that we in Washington aren't being treated the same and our offices and staff and our members aren't being treated the same as the average postal worker who's clearly more at risk than any of us. That whether it comes to our offices here, whether it comes to our district offices, or whether it comes to our home, the first exposure is going to be to the people who are bringing it to us. And uh, we've seen that because they've died and we don't even have anybody sick. And that uh, part, of, part of our concern here, and this isn't just a House question, it's a Senate question. When it occurred immediately in the Senate building, Floors have been shut down for weeks where there wasn't even a trace of anthrax in the Senate Hart building. Uh, in the Longworth building, floors are shut down where there's not even a trace of anthrax. And there's a question whether they're going to fumigate the whole building before anybody even comes into any of those floors. Now, I know that they're being prudent and that you can have disagreements over the health policy, as you've suggested, about prudence. But it, it is bothering Americans that there seems to be a higher level of prudence for people in power, then there seems to be prudence 
for people who don't have power, even though it puts the male at tremendous risk. And I'd like you to comment on that question without criticizing anybody in particular because it, it can go both ways, but this inconsistency is bothering the American public. When I reflect back on the situation and, and what happened, uh, it's, it's obvious to me that people acted based on uh, the science that was available at the time. At the time that action was taken in that Senate building, there was an envelope, there was confirmed anthrax in that envelope. Regarding postal facility at Brentwood, there was a linkage there because we knew that the envelope had passed through Brentwood. But the assumption was that these envelopes were sealed, heavily taped, that whoever sent them was trying to uh, do harm to the recipient of the mail and, and protect those along the way by heavily sealing them. What we found out later, a week later, was that the size of the anthrax spore was so small that it could actually penetrate the paper. Now that was something that we were not aware of. That's something that we learned by by working backwards from, you know, the opening of the letter in Senator Daschle's office. And so we began a process of working back. Once it became clear that we had a case of anthrax, although we did not have any confirmation, as I said, we did a quick test on that Thursday that said there was no anthrax found in Brentwood. Once it was clear that we had an employee with anthrax, we took immediate action, shut that facility, had people tested, had people treated. Uh, and so, again, it was what, were the, what was the information we were working with at the time? I, w I wasn't even necessarily, uh, although it, it's, in retrospect you can do all sorts of management. Right now, a New York building is open, whereas the Senate Hart, where they didn't find traces on those floors, and the Longworth House and the Ford Building, where they didn't find traces, are closed. And uh, it, it's not just a historical question, it's a question that we're looking at right now. Um, and that uh, the general public would like to see some consistency because on the one hand, you say your postal employees are safe, but if the political leaders in the State Department shut all their floors, or HHS does, or Congress does, it's not surprising that you're gonna have dissension. Or uh, it may be that we're overreacting. But the American public is disturbed and can't get a consistent health message when we're not behaving the same way on floors in the same buildings that do not have traces. Gentlemen's time has expired. Do uh, you want to respond? We, we, we're believing, we believe we're reacting with the information that we have at hand with the best advice that we can get in the world uh, so that we can safely remediate our buildings and not put our people in harm's way. Mrs. Mink. Mr. Chairman, I had asked the uh, uh, first panel a question that they declined to answer, and they passed it over to you, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Potter. Who did that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't name the individual. <laughs> but uh, the question that still persists in my mind is uh, the tracking of the mail from uh, Daschle's office uh, to the Brentwood facility and then the uh, stopping of the mail deliveries to uh, the House of Representatives on the 12th of October. From the 12th of October until the Brentwood facility was closed on the 21st, we assumed that the mail was held there and uh, embargoed because of the possible presence of anthrax on the outside of the envelopes. From your testimony, I understand now that the, the mail that had been held in Brentwood from the 12th to the 21st is being sent to Ohio to be sanitized by this uh, E-ray uh, machine that uh, irradiates. Uh, my question is, once Brentwood was closed on the 21st, what happened to our mail, and is that also going to the Ohio facility? Uh, the answer to that question is that the mail, for, the mail that originates in Washington, D.C., 
was moved to uh, facilities in suburban Maryland and Northern Virginia to be processed and dispatched throughout the country. In addition to that, mail coming from around the country was moved to these facilities, and mail is being sorted there on a daily basis and prepared for delivery in Washington, D.C. The mail for, for Target, where we have, uh, there's an assumption that there's a, a threat, that mail is being isolated and will be uh, sanitized. So the reason we haven't gotten any mail since the 12th of October is that we still constitute a target group and the mail is not being delivered to us, but is being delivered to other people in the city. Is that correct? Correct. And so we can expect that all of the mail that's been sent to us from the 12th of October will go to this Ohio facility and eventually come back to us. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. That's, uh, that's uh, very comforting because we get asked this question all the time, what happens to our mail? Are we eventually going to get it? And we have been responding thus far that ultimately we will see the mail. But <clears throat> there's some question of what happened to the mail after Brentwood was closed. Why weren't we getting that? And the answer is that too is being sanitized in Ohio. Is that correct? Correct. So then... Uh, the uh, constituencies that are waiting for responses can be told roughly, what, another week? It may be several weeks. Several weeks. Are you taking it in the sequence in which they arrived at Brentwood, or are you taking it wherever it happens to be? We're trying to move the oldest mail that, w that we have through the system to direct it back to your offices and to other federal agencies. I see. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. That's all right. Well, to my ranking member. Because you had another minute left. And I, what concerns me is that uh, we're taking all this mail that, that might have anthrax in it and isolating it. But we've seen a couple of people get sick, and that's not from this mail because it's isolated. So the, the question is how these people got sick. And it could well be one possibility is that they had a cross contamination from some letter or mail that had anthrax on it. Uh, the previous panel testified, we asked whether they have done any of the investigation to see whether there is this uh, cross-contamination of mail. And we were told they haven't even begun to, e to evaluate where the cross-contamination can take place. Uh, the chairman and I prepared a letter, and we're sending it to uh, Mr. Mueller and, and to Dr. Copeland and, and to you uh, expressing our concern about the fact that one proactive thing we could do would be to take the mail that uh, was, uh, was at the same time delivered to Senator Daschle's office and see if that mail was cross-contaminated. That would give us some indication if cross-contamination actually takes place. We were told that, it hasn't, that, that, that process hasn't even started. So we, we want to urge you in our letter to you which we'll make available to you, rather than mail it to now. you. Yes. Rather than mail it to you, we'll hand it to you. I, uh, I'd like one in the mail, too. I need the revenue. Well, if it comes in the mail, <laughs> either sanitize it or check for cross-contamination to be sure you don't have any anthrax. But we, would, we think that study ought to go on immediately so we can test this hypothesis as a possibility for those two people who did unfortunately get sick. We are doing an analysis and we're, we're theorizing. We have a model of that facility. We're looking at mail. We have the ability to track individual pieces of mail across multiple pieces of equipment. I don't want to go into a lot of detail on it, but we are building a model that would track that piece of mail and also enable us to do the type of analysis that well, the congressman the, suggesting. That's theorizing. Here you can do a real-world test if you just simply get some of the mail that it was uh, uh, part of the package of mail delivered to Senator Dash. Right, and we're going to be able to identify the letters to be tested using the systems that we have. Ms. Morell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for scheduling this very important uh, hearing, uh, and I thank the ranking member also. Uh, Congratulations, Mr. Postmaster General. Little did you know the kinds of challenges you would be facing as you took on the new responsibility. And it's been a long four months. I, I know it must Excuse have me, been. as the gentlelady, he had black hair when he started. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I was skinny, too. I believe too. it. <laughs> I believe it. I, I, um, 
Just before I arrived at this meeting, I was in, uh, in my county, in Montgomery County, uh, with the president at a, a high school, you know, looking at Veterans Day, Wooten High School. It's appropriate that their logo has to do with the Patriots. They're called the Patriots. I say that because I really believe the United States postal system, have, they have been patriots. The letter carriers, the administration, those people who, uh, the postmasters, I truly mean that. And indeed, at this time, some of them feel like they're real veterans of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a war. Um, and, and they have all been very patriotic. And I just think you need to know that from the top all the way out. So I, I salute them. I have also been very much aware of the kind of tension that they have felt. And I, and I have particularly felt badly thinking that they perceive that members of Congress are being treated better than they are with regard to education, communication, remediation. And I know that you've been trying to get communication together. And I wondered if, well, first of all, let me be provincial. <laughs> What is the status of the suburban distribution facility in Shady Grove, Maryland, after your scheduled inspection last weekend? We did not get the uh, test results back, but we did schedule the suburban Maryland and Northern Virginia facilities. Uh, and so the, su the surrounding facilities here in the, the metropolitan area, the surrounding facilities in Trenton, New York, and Florida, and we, uh, we, are, we hope to be getting those results back uh, shortly. What are you doing to bring everybody together to communicate? On a daily basis at 10 o'clock, and since October 15th, on a daily basis at 10 o'clock, we meet with the uh, presidents of the labor unions, the heads of the management associations, and we discuss the topics of the day, the issues surrounding this anthrax situation. We hear back from them on whether or not the stand-up talks we've asked uh, to be given to our employees actually have been given. We've been out there and communicating as aggressively as we possibly can. We have videos out. We have, uh, you know, masks out. We have stand-up talks. We are trying to, to message to our employees. It's not a perfect system. We have 800,000 people. You know, this is like an aircraft carrier, you know, trying to get everybody moving in the right direction does take time. But we're mobilizing not only our internal resources through management challenges, channels, but we're also working with the unions and management associations to use those channels to get messages to our employees. I commend you on that, and I, I, I know that you will continue it. I, I feel that this uh, terrible tragedy may well have brought us together in a closer partnership than there has been before. So I commend you on meeting with the unions, meeting with uh, uh, the postmasters, bringing everybody together because we are all in it together. It would also be good to if you assess how the employees feel too. In other words, listen to what they're saying in terms of uh, the scuttlebutt, the, the concerns they may have. Are they all? Are they give? Are they assigned like at the Shady Grove's uh, distribution center? Are they assigned gloves and masks and do yes. they do it voluntarily or? Yes, we have, uh, we've purchased uh, over 4 million masks for our 800,000 employees. We've bought some 88 million pairs of gloves. Um, and so, and they're being messaged. There are videos out there and they're being trained on how to appropriately use this equipment. Um, and uh, so again, we're doing everything that we can to help them feel safe uh, in the work environment. We also have counseling available to all our employees. We've also uh, uh, contracted for doctors to come on site and talk to our employees uh, around the clock and explain to them what anthrax is, what they should be looking for on their personal bodies in the form of lesions, what they should be concerned about concerning their health, and what, you know, the appropriate precautions that they should take. Now, again, you're going to find somebody in America who might have been off on that day or where it wasn't done properly, and, and we're trying to shore that up and make sure everybody's getting a common message. Mm -hmm. And with regard to the uh, irradiation or the electronic beam technology, are you prioritizing what centers are going to get it before others? I mean, do you have a kind of a level of... of well, uh, well, certainly we'll listen to the law enforcement authorities and, and, and allow them to, uh, to 
help us in terms of prioritization. It's not something that we would tell the world, obviously, uh, because people then could circumvent what measures we put in place. Mm -hmm. But you will have a priority will be established, and it will be done on the basis of the greatest need as perceived greatest by, threat. Yes, by, well. by those, who, those people who are experts. Well, I just want to, um, um, want to thank you for the kind of uh, work that you all have been doing and tell you that I look forward to continuing to he hearing from you about what needs to be done, particularly with regard to dispensing Cipro and, and uh, antibiotics and um, uh, whatever other situation is absolutely necessary. And, um, and I thank you, as I say, for what you're doing. And I hope that you will continue to be a partnership with all of the other uh, elements, including the unions, postmasters, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, ladies, time has expired. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me apologize for missing part of the uh, testimony. I was engaged in something else at the time. But it sounds to me like you're, you're, you're expressing a level of confidence and comfortability in terms of having policies that are either in place or that can be immediately put into place to not necessarily guarantee, but to feel that the health and safety issues of employees are being addressed uh, adequately. Yes, sir. We are, con uh, Congressman. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, everybody, as I said, the unions, management associations, health experts to determine what are the best measures that we could take to uh, create a safe and secure workplace and with the law enforcement authorities to make the mail secure. Now, as we do that, and, and as we know that the service was being taxed in some way already relative to its financial condition, or at least that's information that had been brought back and forth. How much additional pressure is this putting on the Postal Service in terms of its ability to, to be financially secure and able to continue with its work and meet the challenge of the bioterrorism? It's putting a tremendous burden on the Postal Service. The measures that we're taking to screen mail are costly. Uh, the measures that we are taking to uh, assure that we have a safe work, safe work environment, whether that's masks, uh, gloves, the, uh, all of the medical costs associated with uh, this situation. We have some 15,000 employees who are on medication. All of, the, all of those situations are costing us money. We were very happy that the uh, administration uh, allocated some $175 million uh, for the Postal Service to help us with a 30-day period worth of costs. However, that beyond that, the, the cost of, of modifying our uh, operations such that we can sanitize mail or do some other type of intervention are going to cost several billions of dollars. In addition to that, the, the September 11th attack uh, caused our revenues to be uh, approximately $300 million below expectations. And we went into the year with a very conservative estimate of, of what our revenues would be. Uh, this anthrax attack could further compound that, depending on the, the confidence that the American public has in the mail. Uh, and so we could be looking at several, several billion dollars worth of impact, uh, in, you know, from a revenue standpoint. Obviously, as time goes on, we'll be better able to quantify that. Uh, and we are working feverishly to try and provide what is a, uh, a, a, an accurate estimate of what those costs would be. So you're saying that any way you cut it, that no matter how you look at it, you're going to need to be able to generate either some additional revenue or find some way
to reduce the cost of operating, and certainly it doesn't look as though that would be possible in this climate. There were conversations earlier already about certain mm -hmm. reform elements and movement. Does, the, does this heighten the need for reform that was already being discussed and on the table? It, it certainly illustrates the tools that the Postal Service has to address these types of situations. Uh, one tool that we have not used in, in years was to seek an appropriation. And we're going to seek an appropriation because we are going to have one time costs associated with the modification of our facilities, uh, one time costs associated with this loss in revenue. And we view this as a homeland security issue. This is, this is you know, uh, terrorists have, have done harm to the postal system. Uh, there have been comments before you came into the room regarding whether or not this was an appropriate time to discuss reform. Uh, we had the Postal Service have been discussing that uh, for the last five years and discussing the type of tools that, that we have as managers and that the board has uh, available to them to react to situations such as this. And, and I would ask that uh, Governor Feynman uh, perhaps would want to make a comment. I feel somewhat reluctant, Congressman. I, uh, I, I would say that there's no part of me that wants to limit the, they can in any way limit the debate that this committee is going to have about postal reform. Um, but on the other hand, it's clear to me that um, this crisis just heightens the awareness of postal reform. And maybe we do have to separate the issues. But an issue for us, the governors, you know, there's probably two of the most important things we do, one of which is to hire the postmaster general. And in this case, we hired the right man. We hired somebody who understands how the Postal Service operates and is guiding us through what is clearly a crisis in operation and a crisis in management. On the other hand, what we do is we, we help set rates in conjunction with the Postal Rate Commission. What we don't want to do, we've spoken to the Chairman, Congressman Davis, to others, um, I heard the Congresswoman talk about the magazines in New York, we don't want to, in, in essence, limit the amount of mail that's going to come through the postal system by raising rates so high that we're going to find other means of communication. And as the Postmaster General indicated, for this one time, we're probably going to come back to Congress and we're going to say we, we need some help here because this is a homeland security problem. On the other hand, at the same time that we're going to be asking for funds, it looks pretty clear to me that the amount, the volume of mail is going to decrease for some period of time. And I, and I just say to you, we can talk about how to do it, but right now, we have very, very limited tools. I know that my time's up, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the indulgence. Um, could I just ask if they'd answer? Are you saying that you really feel that you don't have any choice except to come and ask for an appropriation? Given the economic circumstances of the Postal Service, the answer is a resounding yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No. The uh, Postal Service, as you know, and Danny Davis and I worked on this, they've been right up against that debt ceiling for some time, and I'm sure with this tragedy they're going to gonna probably surpass it. That means Congress is going to, in addition to the $800 billion, probably have to uh, do something else to, to, keep, to get them over the hump. Uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Potter, I was looking at your uh, prepared statement. Uh, I know we have over 800,000 postal employees, and you stated that over the last two weeks, more than 15,000 employees have begun receiving antibiotic treatment, and that some 9,000 
have been tested to date. When I uh, looked at those numbers, I realized that uh, in many ways you attempted to do the best that you can, even though I do agree with, I think, many who think that it would have been better had those antibiotics been administered immediately upon discovery of contamination in the postal facility. But it, it does seem to me that um, a number have been tested. Have any of those have been tested, tested positive? We don't have any results from, from, from the, the bulk of those tests. We had 30 tests in Florida. They were all negative. Uh, beyond those, we have not received the results of those tests. If today you were to discover additional contamination in any postal facility in this country, or if you discovered that mail was contaminated that uh, had gone through any postal facility in this country, would you immediately suggest to those postal workers that they take antibiotics I would, if they were in those facilities? I would immediately consult with the medical experts. And being a layman, I would suggest and urgently, urgently suggest that they consider putting people on antibiotics. But I'm not a medical person. I can't prescribe them myself. Well, I recognize there's always medical uncertainty here. But because of the criticism that you've been uh, previously uh, met with, it perhaps would be a good policy to simply say that if in the future uh, any postal facility is discovered to be contaminated or if a piece of mail is discovered that is contaminated, then the postal facility through which that mail traveled those workers should be given the immediate option uh, for antibiotics. I, I'm wondering, uh, the, the mail that you have sent away to be uh, sanitized, uh, is that government mail that we're talking about that's being sanitized? It, it's government mail uh, that was, and any mail that was in that Brentwood facility that uh, when uh, we discovered that uh, the facility was contaminated. The Dashiell letter was postmarked October the 9th, New Jersey, Trenton. I assume it takes a couple of days uh, for it to reach uh, the Brentwood facility. Would that be roughly correct? Yes. It was uh, scheduled for delivery on Monday, and it was delivered on Monday. So if we believe there's the possibility of cross-contamination, it certainly appears to be possible. We have three offices in the Long Work Building who, that are have been shown to have presence of anthrax, and there's no letter to which that could relate. Uh, is it then not possible that cross-contamination occurred in some of the mail that was delivered uh, after approximately October 11th uh, until the mail ceased to be delivered from Brentwood, that contamination could have occurred in other locations in the district that is served by the Brentwood facility other than the government offices? Yes, that's certainly possible. And has there been any effort to uh, publicize which areas of the district that would be? There's been an effort to identify uh, mail that was processed uh, on, on, on machines with the Dashiell mail. And the, the vast majority of that mail, I'm talking about over 95 percent of that mail was government mail. So that's the mail that, again, we uh, uh, you know, we embargoed, held on to, and uh, are seeking to sanitize. You know, this government has just been, uh, it's been suggested that our government and our agencies have perhaps had a double standard with regard to the treatment of postal workers. It would seem to me prudent not to find ourselves in a position where we also are accused of a double standard with respect to recipients of mail who may be non-government uh, recipients. And uh, perhaps it would be wise to, to at least advise the public as to which portions of the district may possibly have received other contaminated, cross-contaminated mail. We're, we're thoroughly looking through our systems to try to identify uh, not only uh, 
what pieces there might have been and what sections, but actual addresses. I wanted to ask Mr. Day if he would comment. Uh, you've suggested that you need two and a half billion dollars to install the necessary equipment to begin sanitizing the mail on a routine basis. Uh, I'd like to have some feel for what that $2.5 billion will purchase, because I have a sense that the Congress and the American public may not have fully yet appreciated the tremendous cost that will be associated with protecting the public health and safety, not only within the Postal Service, but the myriad of other activities that are now threatened by terrorist acts. So could you give us a feel for how many machines, uh, what kind of coverage you will have if you were able to secure that two and a half billion dollars? Congressman, if I could, um, in terms of the full deployment and, and how we are plan to do that and the costs associated with it, um, quite honestly, if we could do that offline because there's, there's some security information as part of that. I'm actually doing a briefing on Friday for our for some both House and Senate staff members, I'd gladly do that if, if you'd like me to. Would you describe that $2.5 billion as total comprehensive coverage uh, of the United States uh, mail, or is this a effort to secure certain or sanitize certain mail facilities uh, to the exclusion of perhaps a whole lot of others? Without getting specifics, and I can do that offline, in the broadest sense, we're trying to provide for the security of the mail for the entire public. Gentlemen's time Thank you, Mr. has Chairman. expired. Thank uh, you, Mr. Day. Uh, we probably may have some more information for you that, that we can get to you, Mr. Turner, if you need it. Mr. Kinjorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Potter, I have a few questions. I, I think I'm trying to speak for the average citizen and the average postal worker. When, and I, I don't want to say this to embarrass you or to attack you, but there's an attitude starting to build in the country. It hasn't come to a, a, a crisis stage, but that we seem to be an hour late and a dollar short. Our logic and our reasoning are always behind the cycle. And I, something that struck me, that as soon as Mr. Stevens was infected with inhalation anthrax, it is axiomatic that the spores had to be one to five microns in order to penetrate the depth of the lungs that caused that disease. So then the logic must have followed after that, that somebody should have had the question, what is the poor, uh, the poor, uh, the poor size of paper? And as I understand it, the average uh, envelope uh, can be penetrated by 30 micron material. So it would have been very conclusive that what, was, what had uh, infected Mr. Stevens could pass through paper. And envelopes. And yet there was a period of 14 or 18 days that there was no backup study of the exposure of the post offices and the processing of the mail. That's not to blame anyone. The thing that bothers me is that there doesn't seem to be logical thinking, analysis, time where people are stepping back and analyzing what can happen. I pose another question, and I'm sure you don't have the answer to this. I did ask it of the uh, Homeland Security Director's Office the other day. We've now had four deaths from inhalation and flax. First time since 1978, to my knowledge, that anyone in this country has died that way. And my question was, as I understand from microbiologists, in every drop of blood of a person that expires from anthrax, inhalation anthrax, there are two billion bacteria. And bodies have to be processed after death. And I wanted to find out what is being done with these four bodies? Are they properly being processed to make sure that we're not t turning over an inventory or factory of anthrax, either in a grave or in a funeral home or its location? And the answer was, well, no one had thought of that. I haven't received a full answer yet, but that shakes my confidence in the system. You had mentioned earlier that you just you were buying 400,000 masks. Do those masks? With, withhold particles of one to five microns. Most masks that I know that you can buy only w uh, withhold 30 micron material. Other than that, you have to have a closed system of oxygen. I could be wrong, I'm not an expert in the area. But are you certain that these masks you're buying are, are, are able to filter out material lower than 30 microns? They're able to filter out down to three tenths microns. Three tenths microns, excellent. Glad somebody you know, asked the question. Now, 
The, the, the final question I come up with is I know your, your department has done a study recently on consolidation of postal centers and ha uh, postal handling material, and that was done pre-September 18th. It seems to me that this should point up to the Postal Service that concentration of mail out of single bulk houses covering regions, maybe a state in size or multi-states, may not be the best psychology in the world, and decentralization may be much better. I'll give you a perfect example. In Pennsylvania, you're going to be uh, uh, merging two uh, uh, centers. That means uh, rather than a million people uh, that have their mail, if they're merged in with another million or two million, if there is a biological attack, it affects the mail of three million people rather than one million people. It could have a tremendous economic impact, your, your theory of concentration and centralization. Now, I understand in, in pre-bioterrorism, that may have been good business. I'm not certain that total centralization is not something that should be re-examined, re-studied, and perhaps uh, doesn't lend itself to the best judgment at this time, not only considering anthrax, but any other biological problem or any problem that we may have in the future. So I would hope that uh, you as the leader of the Postal Service would re-examine that study. I wish I could give you the name. Maybe you're aware of it. It is contemplating the consolidation of 25 centers in the country. Yeah, the area mail processing right. studies that are underway. I'm very right. much aware of that. Well, I, I, that's right on track to be implemented, and it may be directly contradictory to a decentralization theory of, 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 of being able to contain the exposure and contain the, uh, well, the effect of something like this. We're also looking at it as being consistent with the, I, the concept of sanit sanitizing mail because of the expense of the equipment and the, the type of shielding that this equipment requires. Yeah, you you want to limit the amount of sites that you have that type of equipment in. I would assume, aren't you going to sanitize the mail upon receipt as opposed to pre-delivery? We're going to sanitize the mail. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to develop procedures for handling of mail out of collection boxes and moving the mail to... At the collection site, not necessarily at the distribution site. With the sanitizing will occur at a distribution center. Well, then so you're going to expose all the postal workers to anthrax? No, we're not. We're developing procedures to assure that that mail is handled safely. I just want to leave you with the idea. I, uh, something that's disturbed me over these last several weeks, and I haven't publicly spoken up, but I'm going to say it today. I've heard this expression, we were totally surprised. We were shocked. And that was the uh, fact that two airplanes could get, hit the high, uh, uh, that could be used as missile to hit the uh, 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 World uh, Trade Center. And I wasn't. I read it in a book by Mr. Clancy several years ago where a plane struck the Capitol. Uh, so it sort of shakes me up that uh, some of the people in government that are thinking of what can happen, may happen, or will happen, uh, that not, they don't seem to be thinking out of the box. And, and that was the example of what I gave you when I talked about Mr. Stevens all the way to Senator Daschle's office. The fact that you almost wait until there's a diagnosed case and, oh, you get the idea that it may have something to do with that letter as opposed to not being an expert myself, but I know these spores can only penetrate the lung if they're one to five microns. That's all the bi microbiologists have said that. I know that paper allows 30 micron material to go through. So I wouldn't be shocked if one to five micron material were put in 30 micron hole of paper that it escapes. And yet it took uh, a CDC and whoever was working on this two or three weeks to come to that conclusion I instead of going back very quickly and anticipating that uh, we have to look at the, uh, the sorting systems, the delivery systems, et cetera. And I'm just worried that uh, it, these are all new things that are happening to us. But I think what the American people expect us to do is think out of the box and not just think in numbers. Three billion dollars is a pretty big bill, but I'm sure the American people pay for that bill. But they only pay for that bill if they have a high degree of certainty that they are going to be uh, less at risk and certainly that the work, 800,000 workers in the post office are less at risk. These people aren't guinea pigs. And uh, I don't want to think that we used them that way, and I don't think we did. I think it was legitimate not thinking 
of what, what the ramifications of this could be. But now we've thought of it. Uh, I hope also you will take uh, your good offices to find out these people that have died from anthrax. What, what is the control of those bodies and the material in them? And, and have we thought of the potential of, of using the material that was produced in those bodies that can be remanufactured or remilled into much more greater supply of this material than we've yet faced? Someone in the administration has to ask that question. Well, I, I personally know that the, the uh, CDC contacted the widows regarding that because I discussed it with, with one of the widows. So, uh, Can you say with some certainty that actions were taken, that no one has to worry about? Again, I think that's a private matter for the families, not, not for me to discuss. But I know that those families were contacted uh, regarding that issue. Gentlemen's time Disposed. has expired. Uh, let me just say to the panel, and in particular to you, General Potter, I appreciate you uh, sticking with us as long as you have. I know you were going to try to be out here at 3 o'clock, and I apologize uh, for the delay, but it's very important for the American people, and in particular the Congress, to, to have answers to these questions. So we really appreciate your being here and staying with us. And uh, we have some other questions we'd like to submit for the record, and we'll get those to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Shays, real quickly. I just want the record to show that uh, I had an opportunity to speak to Mr. Potter beforehand, and I'm sorry I wasn't here during the hearing part, but I appreciated his response to my questions. And Did you have further questions? No, I don't. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very Congressman. Much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. In just a moment, more from this hearing. Up next, representatives from some postal worker unions. After the rest of this event, part of another House hearing. This one, a House Rules Committee meeting on the Aviation Security Bill. Then at 7 a.m. Eastern, Washington Journal. On the program, more discussions about postal security, Pakistan's nuclear capability, and the ongoing actions in Afghanistan. And at 10, the U.S. House of Representatives returns for consideration of some federal spending bills that fund the Departments of Treasury and Energy, the Legislative Branch, and the U.S. Postal Service. Here's a look at a couple of the events we're covering today. At 10 a.m. Eastern, a House hearing on student visas. A couple of House education subcommittees will hear from Bush administration officials about tracking international students who are registered for U.S. colleges and universities. You can see live coverage on our companion network, C-SPAN 3. And in the afternoon at 3 Eastern, another House subcommittee looks at human rights issues in Afghanistan. Representatives from Amnesty International, Afghanistan's Northern Alliance, and the Afghanistan Foundation will testify. That hearing will also be on C-SPAN 3. Join Book TV this Sunday for In-Depth David Halberstam. Three hours of conversation and your opportunity to call the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of 18 books, including The Best and the Brightest, Playing for Keeps, Michael Jordan and the World He Made, and War in a Time of Peace, Bush, Clinton and the Generals. You can also talk to David Halberstam about the introduction he wrote for the new book, New York, September 11. In-Depth David Halberstam live this Sunday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. In-depth interviews are the first Sunday of the month. Looking forward, upcoming guests include David McCullough, Cornell West, and Tom Clancy, all on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Now the rest of the House Government Reform Committee hearing on the safety of mail and postal workers. In this hour and 20-minute portion, you'll hear from representatives from some postal worker unions. Mr. William Burris, president-elect of the American Postal Workers Union. William Young, the vice president of the National Association of Letter Carriers. Uh, Gus Baffa, is it Baffa? Gus Baffa, uh, president of the National Rural Letter Carriers Association. I know that, Gus, I'm sorry. And William Quinn, President of the National Postal Mailer Mail Handlers Union. <clears throat> and
And George, it's good seeing you here today, too. You sit down, we'll just ask all of you to stand and raise your right hand. I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so I'll be God. Yes, I do. Be seated. I guess uh, if you have opening statements, we'll be glad to uh, receive them at this time. I think we'll start with uh, Mr. Burris. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify today. Accompanying me today is Mo Biller, the president of the American Postal Workers Union. I have been elected as uh, the next president of the American Postal Workers Union, but uh, today and forever, Mo Biller will hold the title of president the next president of the American Postal Workers Union, but uh, today and forever, Mo Biller will hold the title of president uh, of our union. He has served an illustrious career, having served humankind as well as all postal employees for an extended period of time. Uh, we in the labor movement honor uh, all of his contributions to our country and certainly to our union. and. Uh, we will be ever grateful for his contribution to us. I've had the opportunity over the past 21 years of serving as the vice president under Mo's leadership. I am proud and humbled to be representing him before you today. In the face of unknown and potentially deadly danger, they have been determined and steadfast in the performance of their duties. I have submitted and written toast testimony for the record and have an additional statement to make to you this morning, this afternoon. I've heard several questions from the panel comparing uh, the discovery of anthrax in the House, the Senate, and some of the other mail rooms throughout the country. I think it's extremely dangerous to compare the United States Postal Service to any other organization. We process and deliver 680 million pieces of mail today. While one can close the House, the Senate, or one of the smaller mail rooms and have an impact upon whoever they serve, you close the United States Postal Service, you have an impact upon the entire country and perhaps other parts of the world as well. It's really no real comparison to say, why don't we apply the same standards that they apply in some other units to the United States Postal Service? because the result and impact is drastically different. There have been a number of questions raised about the decisions made in New York, Morgan Station. As Postmaster General Potter explained, he and I did have a discussion about New York. And our policy is strict. We have agreed to a policy that if anthrax is discovered in any postal facility, it shall be closed. That's our strict policy. Uh, when Morgan was discovered to be contaminated. Uh, Mr. Potter discussed that with me, and we agreed that Morgan, representing one of the key points, the busiest city in our country, perhaps it was not in the interest of the American public to completely close that facility. We were in Washington, D.C., CDC, and the health authorities were in New York City. They were advising us by phone that it did not represent a clear danger to the employees on other floors. And CDC recommended that they close off the floor where contamination was found, but it would be safe for the employees to continue working on the other floors. Notwithstanding the fact that our clear policy was that if anthrax was discovered, we would close the building, not a floor. Mr. Potter and I discussed it, and I agreed, as representatives of the employees, that let CDC and the medical authorities in New York explain that to the employees and the local union. Convince them that it's safe and leave it to the individuals on those floors 
whether or not they wish to work on other floors in Morgan or leave the facility. Uh, they did that. Obviously, some of the employees in Morgan Station elected to continue working in the building. But what I've since learned is, having traveled to Capitol Heights uh, here in the district yesterday to visit with my constituents, there is a lot of animosity when employees come from a tainted facility into what is perceived to be a clean facility. The average employee believes that they can contract anthrax by mere contact with another person who possibly could have been exposed to anthrax. So taking the employees in Morgan and dispersing them to other facilities in New York would have set up that type of situation. You would have had other employees in other facilities resenting the fact and afraid of those employees' presence in their facilities. So I thought at the time, and I don't want to extend this, and I talked to Mr. Potter during our testimony today, in between our testimony, that we're not going to make the exception the rule. While we agreed to make an exception in Morgan Station, and today in Palm Beach, Florida, it too is an exception. CDC made the same recommendation. But I informed him and Mr. Donahue that these are exceptions and will not become the rule that if we have agreed to close any facility that is tainted by anthrax, we must follow through with that commitment. So if there is a future site identified as having been contaminated, I do expect that our agreement to close the facility will apply, and we will in fact close those facilities. I want to emphasize that despite the deaths and injuries that have occurred, the American Postal Workers Union and the United States Post Service have approached these tragedies and challenges together. Even though we have had a historic adversarial relationship, we find that this is common cause, and there are no differences between us as we address the real dangers of, in, of the anthrax scare. In fact, just prior to the earlier discovery of anthrax in Florida, postal management had issued instructions to employees to recognizing dangerous material and it initiated what we refer to as the shake test. That if an employee found a, a parcel or a letter that appeared to be dangerous or contained some hazmat related material, the employee was to raise it to eye level and shake it. This is before we knew anything about anthrax. Uh, we initially, my union initially, objected very strenuously to the shake test. We thought that it just didn't make common sense to take something potentially explosive take it up to eye level and shake it, perhaps combining two chemicals that when combined create an explosion and perhaps seriously injure a postal worker or a customer. But just as we entered the anthrax situation, after meeting with management, they agreed to eliminate the shake test. That was our first agenda item. We had to eliminate the shake test. And since then, we've gone on together in trying to address anthrax situations. The APW sees this as a situation where we and the Post Service must confront a common enemy for the good of the service and for the good of the country. And I've tried to focus our members on the real culprit in this situation. It's not the CDC, it's not the United States Post Service or the local health authority, although perhaps looking backwards with perfect vision, perhaps some mistakes were made, retroactive mistakes mistakes knowing what we know today, applying to the knowledge they had at the time the decisions were made. But I find it serves little purpose for me to impress upon my membership that their national union is in major disagreement with their employer because those employees go to work every day being psychologically challenged, wondering, is this the day? Do I contract anthrax today? And I believe that anything that moves them off that fine line perhaps may lead to the closing of the United States Postal Service. But across some day, if they find any fuel for that uncertainty, employees will not voluntarily work in fear for the balance of their lives. The employer has a legal and moral obligation to provide a safe and secure workplace. In this crisis, we have sought always to do the best that could be done to safeguard the lives of postal workers. We have set aside our labor management differences and worked together to protect lives, both postal and the American communities that we serve. We cannot bring life back to our brothers who are now deceased 
all we can do, and we are doing all that we can, is to work with postal management and other postal labor unions and management associations to try to make sure that we will never again be required to attend the funeral of a postal employee whose life has been taken through a terrorist act. This has been our approach, and we will continue to work with management to safeguard lives. But let me be clear to the committee, Mr. Chairman. You've heard the testimony of CDC, United States Post Service, and the high-level officials working for the Postmaster General. From day to day, we don't know if postal employees are safe. Much of what we're acting upon is speculation. A clear indication of that was yesterday as I attended the 10 o'clock meeting. I asked the representative from CDC who attends our meetings that I intended to go into the Capitol Heights facility. I have members of my union that work in that facility. In addition, some of the employees from Brentwood have been reassigned to that facility. Uh, these are men and women that are working there every day, going to work, not sure of the product in which they earn their living. Every letter has the potential to be deadly dangerous. Every parcel has the possibility of killing them. I had to bring the presence of our national union in their midst to give them the confidence that if they can work in that facility eight and a half hours every day, certainly their union leadership can show a presence in the facility where they work. So at our 10 o'clock meeting, I asked the representatives from CDC, Postal Service officials, all of the top level officials that testified before you today. I'm going into the Capitol Heights facility. I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going to don gloves. What are my risks? What would you say to me? I'm a member of you. I live in an ivory tower. What are my risks in that facility? Knowing that my risks are no greater or no worse than the employees that work in that facility. After 20 minutes of he and hawing, nobody gave me an answer. It's because nobody knows. We provide masks and gloves to those hundreds of thousand employees to serve perhaps some psychological needs as much as it does their physical needs. When they discover anthrax contamination, those who come into the facility at that time do not have on masks and gloves. They are covered from head to foot breathing pure air, not air through a M100 mask that may be compromised by one who wears facial hair or perhaps some other reason that does not have a perfect fit. They don't come in with the gloves that we're distributing to those employees. They have hazmat equipment to clean up that spill. And you can imagine the consternation of the employees I represent to be working in that facility with normal attire Glass and a small mask, uh, gloves and a small mask on their face, looking up to see these individuals coming in with these moon suits on, right? knowing that they're protected and they have all this uh, material on them. How can the employee be protected? So, despite our assurances to you, the assurances to our employees, the assurances to the public, we're learning every day. We don't know how the mail is being contaminated. We don't know if the Dashiell and other letters are the only ones that have transmitted to the United States Post Service. We don't know whether or not one is being put in the mail as we speak. And the employees I represent are working in those facilities with that uncertainty on their mind. And as postal management public, publicly expresses its sorrow and concern for deceased postal workers and their families, they are simultaneously attempting to cut the wages and health benefits of these very employees, using the impact of anthrax as justification for these reductions. Now, nothing could be more cynical than that. This is institutional hypocrisy. Postal wor workers have been without a contract since November of 2000. Management has refused to negotiate a new labor agreement and now are seeking to impose cuts in wages, and health benefits, and not just a simple cut. Cuts every year for four years. Successive cuts every year for a four-year period for individuals that are putting their life on the line every day to serve the American public. These are proposals management has advanced in bargaining before, 
But this time, they seem to hope that the anthrax crisis will give them an opportunity to achieve them. Excuse me, Mr. Burris. Uh, let me say that uh, your, your statement is very powerful, and we do appreciate it. Would it be possible for you to summarize I the am. balance of it? Thank I'm, you, sir. I'm just about finished. Thank you, sir. The APW will not tolerate or accept this attempt to exploit this tragic situation to achieve this long thought goal. This is not the time or place for me to go into these issues in any detail. I have called an emergency meeting of our executive board to prepare a response and to schedule a press conference. The focus of today's hearing should be and is safety of postal employees. This is our first and primary concern. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Bars. And as I said, that was a very, very powerful statement. Mr. Young? And if we could, gentlemen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to allow you extra time because I understand you've got an awful lot that you want to get off your chest. But if we could stay as close to the five-minute limit, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, sir. My name is William Young. I'm the Executive Vice President of the National Association of Letter Carriers. I'd like to thank you for holding this important hearing today. I know that you and the members of the committee will understand if I say that I really wish this hearing was not taking place. But given the current situation, we at the NALC appreciate your concern. The expressions of support that we have received over the last week and a half have been heart heartening. To every American, the sight of their letter carrier is a symbol of national community. It is familiar as virtually any image of our country. When the perpetrators embarked on this heinous attack, they could not have possibly imagined the strength and compassion of the American public. And I brought with me today, and I'd like to ask that it be entered into the record, Mr. Chairman, something that was hung on the, the board of the lo in the lobby of the Brooklyn Post Office just this week. It's very short, and I'll read it. To our postal workers, we salute your courage. We salute your services. You are the newest soldiers in the war against terror. We sympathize with and pray for your stricken and fallen colleagues. Stay the course of Brooklyn family. It's those kind of expressions, sir, that make it so easy for the members that I represent to be out on the street every day. We, we will put that in the record. Thank you very much. Now, Congress has expressed, and I won't get into any detail with this, but several of the members of the committee today while I was sitting back listening have expressed the importance of their mail because it keeps you in touch with the uh, constituents that you represent. We understand that, sir, uh, and, and that's why the members of my union, the members of Bill's union, and, and the other brothers represented here are working so hard to try to keep the mail flow up and running even in these uh, very challenging times. But when we're confronted with a challenge of this magnitude that is wholly removed from anything we've seen before, the learning curve is pretty steep. The Postal Service and all the employee organizations have been able to disseminate timely information as it becomes available to us. It is no secret that our union has not always seen eye to eye with the Postal Service, but this unprecedented attack has been met with equally unprecedented levels of cooperation. Our national agreement Article 14, Section 1 says it is the responsibility of management to provide safe working conditions in all present and future installations and to develop a safe working force. And from my point of view, sir, and from the point of view of the leadership of our union, the United States Postal Service is doing everything they can to meet that commitment. We have been forced to rethink the way we move mail. Serving more than 130 million delivery points six days a week requires a massive an extensive infrastructure, an infrastructure that will largely have to be revamped in the coming months. Our members have learned the hard way that they have to look for these new threats and that the country is relying on them for protection. I have great admiration for all of our members, especially those at the Brentwood facility here in Washington and in West Trenton. I'm extremely proud of the letter carriers there for the way that they have responded during this crisis. The New Jersey carriers are casing their mails in tents next to the building where they normally work. And I have another thing that I'd like to be asked and in the record. It's a picture of those tents with our letter carriers in them performing that work. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. taken very recently. Every day for the last two weeks, we have gathered with other postal employee organizations and the Postmaster General at Post Postal Service Headquarters here to obtain and share the latest developments. We've heard from the CDC, law enforcement, and executive branch agencies in our efforts to understand the full magnitude of this situation. 
In addition to the videotape and other materials that have been distributed from Postal Headquarters, we at Letter Cares have been working diligently to disseminate information to our membership. We have been regularly updating our website with the latest information. Our NELC bulletin is distributed and posted in 13,000 postal facilities, and we have been communicating almost on a daily basis with our 15 national business agents through our intranet system of computer. Last week, our national president, Vince Zambrato, had the high privilege to meet in the Oval Office with President Bush, Governor Ridge, and Postmaster General Potter. The White House committed $175 million to deal with the immediate response, such as testing and distribution of antibiotics, the masks, and the gloves. The Postal Service is also using $200 million from its own security fund. However, there's still enormous expenses to be met, and the Postal Service will be seeking billions of dollars necessary to obtain and install equipment to sanitize the mail. These are funds that would otherwise go towards the purchase of machines through which mail at all processing facilities would pass would be cleansed of biological agents. This would prevent the transmission of anthrax, smallpox, or other infections through the mail. In addition to the actual expense of the purchase of these machines, each facility will need to be retrofitted to accommodate the new equipment and to ensure that employees are trained to operate them safely. It is important to note that the Postal Service is a self-funded entity and does not receive an appropriation. However, remember Congress does owe the Postal Service $957 million under the Revenue Foregone Act of 1993. Rather than being paid $29 billion, million a year over the next 42 years, as it, is, as it is currently written into the Act, the Postal Service needs that full amount now. Even that amount represents only a portion of the revenue lost as a result of recent events. These last couple of weeks have extracted a toll on our members and the Postal Service itself. Restoring the confidence to postal employees and the American public is of the utmost importance, not just for our national psyche, but because the Postal Service is an integral part of this country's economic infrastructure. Individuals and businesses rely on the Postal Service to receive and pay bills and securely send original documents. Keeping that system up and running is absolutely essential. Going days without mail extracts an extraordinary price. For example, one utility company in D.C. area has reported they normally receive 30,000 payments through the mail each day. Just one isolated example of what mail means to our economy it is coming upon us to do whatever extent possible to make sure that such economic disruption is not visited upon other areas of the country. We also need some level of perspective on the situation. Thus far, we have been relatively fortunate that the tragic events of the last few weeks seem to have been limited to a relatively small geographic area. We also need to be vigilant because if the evildoers spread their poison elsewhere in the country, the result could be worse than it's been to this point. I would also like to note, Mr. Chairman, that this disaster has further highlighted the shortcomings of the 30-year-old law governing the Postal Service. Simply put, Postal Service needs greater flexibility, not just when disaster strikes, but on a daily basis. I commend you, sir, because I know you've been studying this issue, and I know you're, you're right on top of the needs here. Each year, the, the NALC honors our heroes of the year. These are, the letter carriers never cease to amaze me by demonstrating what they're capable of doing when confronted with adverse situations. Now every letter carrier must display that same type of heroism. They are the first line of protection for a large segment of the American population. I know they're up to the task, but they also have to know that they have the tools to take on this new challenge. Mr. Chairman, I wish to thank you and the members of this committee for your concern during this difficult time. Too often the work that we do goes unnoticed. In many ways, that serves as a silent tribute to the members of the NALC. Now that times have called for a more vocal expression of support, I'm glad that we're all speaking up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and I can assure you that we're going to do everything we can to give the Postal Service and the postal workers every bit of help they need and equipment and everything else. Mr. Baffa. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Gus Baffa. I am the newly elected president of the 100,000 plus National Rural Letter Carrier Association. I have submitted my statement and requested it become part of the record. I also would like to make a brief 
oral statement. There aren't any rural carriers in New York City. There are approximately 30 to 40 rural carriers in the Trenton facilities, and many rural carriers are served through the Brentwood facility. On September 11th, this country was attacked by terrorists in New York, Pennsylvania, and right here at the Pentagon. And what happened as a result of that is this country became united. Recently, a person or persons unknown have utilized the Postal Service as a vehicle to send their weapon of anthrax through the mail. That is an attack on a Postal Service and the Postal family. And we are now united. Postal Service has attempted to do its very best during this crisis. There is no playbook to follow. This is a road none of us have been down before. It doesn't matter if we are referring to a rural carrier, a city carrier, a mail handler, a clerk, the PMG, the FBI, or the Center for Disease Control. It's new to all of us. Postal workers are part of the army of foot soldiers in this war against terrorism and getting back to normalcy. As our president said, we must continue life as normal. Our members are doing that every day. We are reporting to work, we are casing the mail, we are putting it in our vehicles, and we are delivering it. Sure, some are very worried. As a Kentucky rural carrier said on a national public radio interview when asked if anything had changed, he replied, definitely. Now when I come home each day, instead of picking up my three-year-old daughter, who is waiting to give me a welcome kiss with her arms outstretched, I need to take a shower first. At this time of extreme anxiety, Postmaster General Potter and postal employees across the country have stepped up to the plate to ensure continued delivery of our nation's mail. It is now time for Congress to step up to the plate by appropriating the sums necessary to ensure safe and ongoing mail delivery, and by passing postal reform legislation to ensure that the Postal Service can function safely and effectively in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bapa. Mr. Quinn. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, my name is Billy Quinn. I'm the national president of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union. On behalf of the over 50,000 union mail handlers employed by the United States Postal Service, I appreciate the opportunity to testify about the challenges of safety and security that currently are being faced by the United States Postal Service and all postal employees. The mail handlers we represent are an essential part of the mail processing and distribution network utilized by the Postal Service to move more than 200 billion pieces of mail each year. Mail handlers work in all of the nation's <laughs> large postal plants and are responsible for loading and unloading trucks, transporting mail within the facility, preparing the mail for distribution and delivery, operating a host of machinery and automated equipment, and containerizing mail for subsequent delivery. Our members generally are the first and last employees to handle the mail as it comes to, goes through, and leaves most postal plants. Our paramount concern is the safety of postal employees, including all mail handlers. To this end, we have been active participants in the mail security task force that has been established by postal management and includes representatives of all unions and employee associations. That task force is implementing plans to prevent infection by anthrax or other biological agents that may be sent through the mails. Among other issues, the task force is addressing the need to close affected facilities until they can be certified as safe for all employees. The distribution of necessary antibiotics to postal employees. The distribution and use of masks and gloves that may be helpful in preventing anthrax infections. The development and delivery of safety training programs and the development of revised cleaning methods for mail processing equipment. The task force also is looking to the future and is considering a host of issues such as anthrax vaccines and ir irradiation of the mail. I must say, however, the task force is having great difficulty keeping up with the news and information cycle that has developed around the anthrax issue. 
And even when the task force has current and accurate information, the timely dissemination of that information to more than 800,000 postal employees and thousands of postal facilities is extremely difficult. This problem is exacerbated by the confusing and often contradictory information that is coming out of postal headquarters, the Center for Disease Control, and state and local health authorities. I just returned from a meeting of all our local union officers and representatives. After a lengthy discussion of the various safety and medical issues facing mail handlers, our local leadership was fully informed with as much accurate information as possible. Even with this information, however, these representatives remain anxious. Certainly that they know that mail handlers must exercise caution while processing the mail. But they are less certain about precisely what to tell their members about the specific steps mail handlers should take to ensure their own safety. On the workroom floor, there is even more anxiety because members have even less access to accurate information. The key, therefore, is the timely dissemination of accurate safety and medical information. That should be the focus of the task force, and that must be the focus of postal management, the CDC, and state and local health officials. What is needed now is the constant dissemination of accurate and to the maximum extent possible consistent safety and medical information to all postal employees. Mail handlers and other postal employees deserve the best science available scientific protection against this bioterrorism. Through science and reason, we can overcome rumor and fear. In that regard, the most important action Congress can take is to appropriate all of the funds necessary for the Postal Service to process mail safely without harm to employees. It is unfortunate that it takes an incident such as this to make people aware of the hazards of working in postal facilities. Ten years ago, it was the threat of AIDS from needles and blood spills coming from medical waste and poorly constructed packaging in the postal system. With the help of congressional oversight, that problem has largely been eliminated. Yet our members still face hazardous working conditions. All of the postal unions have written to Congress or testified about the need for protection from dangerous equipment and terrible ergonomic injuries. We therefore need to take this tragedy and turn it into a positive movement for worker safety. This is a unique moment when American citizens have again been made aware of the great importance that the Postal Service serves in our nation's communications network. They will rally behind a sustained movement to make the postal workplace safe for its employees and a source of confidence for its customers. To do any less would be to fail in our commitment to the future integrity of the United States postal system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I think we'll start the questioning with Mr. Waxman because I have to leave for just a few minutes. So Mr. Waxman, we'll uh, yield to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each of you for your testimony. I think it's been an excellent presentation to us. And I hope, uh, Mr. Quinn, that your words will be taken very seriously by everybody involved, that we turn this tragedy into a very positive development to make the workplace safer for postal employees and give greater confidence the American people about their mail. And also that we uh, remind everybody out of this experience how hard our postal employees work for us, whether it's at the post office or delivering the mail in the urban areas, the rural areas, they're on the front lines. And given this war uh, on terrorism, they are genuinely on the front lines here at home where the terrorists are using the mail just as they use the airplanes uh, to um, uh, uh, serve as a uh, vehicle for their uh, attempt to uh, instill great fear in all of our people. I, I want to ask you about how you feel the, the uh, Postal Service is dealing with the, the, this whole uh, threat of anthrax and whether they are coordinating with you and partnering with you 
uh, as, uh, the employee unions to keep uh, employees informed of the rapidly evolving anthrax threat. Do you think the Postal Service has kept your members adequately informed and protected? Mm -hmm. Sion, do you want to start uh, off? Congressman Waxman, <clears throat> I would say yes. I'll just use last night as an example. Mm -hmm. At 7.30 at night, I'm home with my family. My phone rings. It's Doug Tolino from the Postal Service. He's under the uh, Vice President of Labor Relations. He's calling me to, to tell me that the tests are now back on 19 post offices here in the D.C. area and that one of them, the Friendship Station, has in fact, they found a, a very small, he, he called it a minuscule trace of anthrax, and that they were going to have the EPA try to clean the building up last night, and if in fact they were not able to do that, that the employees would all be moved out of the building into a garage right next door where they could work until the building was declared safe by the proper authorities. This is just a common, everyday occurrence uh, at, at my house. My, my daughter's 15 years old. She knows who Doug Tolino is as soon as he calls. It's more bad news about this <laughs> terrible uh, anthrax that's running around. And I, I think, from my perspective, they've went out of their way to keep us informed. That's good to hear. Bert? Yes, from the Nationals' perspective, my experience is the same as the NALC's. Uh, we have been communicating uh, very, very well. We meet every day at 10 o'clock, review past events, uh, get a report on the number of hospitalizations, uh, the number of uh, suspected sites, the results of testing. Uh, however, the United States Post Service is a very large institution, 38,000 facilities across the country. And the communications that we're enjoying here in Washington is not enjoyed in every one of those facilities. Um, very bureaucratic, the United States Post Service, and it's not unusual for the agreements that we reach at this level not to be enjoyed at the party by the parties at the local level. So we're working through that. We've put in place a system where if the supervisors or managers at the local level do not uh, comply with those things we agree to here, we have a system in place that we can bring it to postal management attention at various levels and resolve them as quickly as we can. However, uh, they're not sharing the same information at the local level that we receive at this level. I try to keep in touch with my members in a variety of ways. Uh, I have a teleconference once a week where I make it open to all of our members throughout the country. Uh, last week I had over 500 sites that were tapped into the teleconference and I gave uh, Mr. Donahue, Deputy PMG, the opportunity for the last 15 minutes of that conference to speak to our members to give them the assurance from the headquarters level that postal management really cared about their safety. But we've had a variety of ways of communicating with our members, and the relationship at this level has been a positive one in this matter. Let me not expand it beyond this matter. Yeah, thank you very much. Mr. Baffer, Mr. Quinn, do you want to add anything to that? The, the task force in the morning uh, is, is a two-way communication. Uh, the CDC is, is there every morning, so we also get to ask them any questions. As uh, Bill Burris mentioned earlier, he had asked the gentleman from CDC some questions. So it, it gives us a perfect opportunity. And each organization also has a responsibility, and we've all uh, assumed that responsibility and have taken it seriously by uh, utilizing our websites or uh, newsletters, our ma national magazines, to get the information out to our people. But uh, uh, the two-way communication is when we do get something back, one morning, I had gotten two calls on something in two different areas. And literally, when I mentioned it there, the Vice President of Labor Relations literally got up, went to the phone, called the area VP, and it was taken care of in less than literally two minutes. So I mean, uh, uh, the cooperation right now is, is uh, unprecedented. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quinn, do you want to add Since I could kill with my colleagues, there's no need for me to waste your valuable time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for your uh, testimony. You care about your workers, and we do too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair now yields to himself for five minutes, um, but I'm not going to consume the whole five minutes. I, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, my father. Uh, was uh, more than 30 years as a clerk with the uh, Levittown Post Office. And uh, from this member of Congress, I just want to say to all of you how much uh, we appreciate 
the rank and file and their uh, willingness to go to work. Uh, several of you have mentioned the word anxiety, and I just want you all to know you're not alone in that area of anxiety. Uh, we have staff that are anxious. Uh, we have meetings of just members, and the members are anxious. We've been targeted, too. Uh, so we're all in this boat together. Um, and it's okay to be anxious, um, but I want you to know how pleased I am uh, at the attitude of the postal workers, and I've talked to some of them myself in my district and uh, in this area, in the Washington, D.C. area, and I'm impressed. People want to uh, carry on. They know uh, that the risks uh, are there, but the risks are low, and the intention is to put fear in our hearts. Uh, this is a psychological game. It's a great tragedy to lose one postal worker, um, but, and, and as we all know, we've lost two. Um, but most of the postal workers are quite safe, and we know that. Um, but the real victory for these terrorists if they, is if they can put so much fear in the hearts of the American people and the postal workers that they'll stop working. Now, I think very clearly there's more we can do, and I've heard the message loud and clear. The Postal Service is going to need some help uh, in dealing with this crisis, and the ranking member and the chairman are, are ready to work with all the members of the committee and, <coughs> and, and your unions to uh, make sure that we're able to keep the mail moving. It is critical to the er economy. Mr. Young, I'm glad you focused on that, because um, this is a huge huge issue for our economy. So I want to thank you all for your uh, testimony and the work you're doing. And um, I now yield to the gentlelady from uh, the District of Columbia, Mrs. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I could just thank the four leaders, Postal Union leaders who given such important testimony today. Um, I don't think it is hyperbole to say that you and your workers are regarded as heroic in this country. And I can certainly say that from the town meeting I had last night where um, over 500 people came, most of them of course not um, postal workers or letter carriers, but a fair number of them were uh, and got to speak with uh, the experts from the CDC and the post office um, who were there to be uh, questioned. Um, just let me say that I think it should <laughs> go without, without being said that at the very least the post office which faced the uh, fairly substantial deficit should be made whole. That is to say, no worse off than you would have been had this tragedy not occurred. You are no different from the airlines. That is to say, they had nothing to do with the fact that those planes were made missiles and murderous weapons. You had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the males have been made missiles of killing. Just as people had to get um, medicine without cost to them, it, it seems clear to me that you should be put back at least where you were. And I certainly hope that does not become a controversial matter in, in this Congress. And frankly, I think it cannot and will not. I want to ask your advice. Um, at the town meeting last night, uh, there was not a lot of uh, solidarity, as you might imagine, with the postal management. You know, people don't, don't readily identify with whoever managers are. There was a hell of a lot of solidarity with the postal workers. Um, tonight, I am sending staff to the Friendship Heights community. Now, not a single person in that community I will be at that meeting, I bet you, 
works for the Postal Service. But I would appreciate, I, I, we need your help on how to transfer some of your courage to the average citizen. Because they think that what the postal workers are doing is absolutely unbelievable. They see you going to work in tents. They see you go, They see the pictures of the masks. Uh, they see their letter carrier every, every day. When they don't get their mail, they know why they're not getting it. They miss their le letter carrier. Some of them have only a letter carrier in their lives. Um, they identify with, with the mail handlers and the postal workers. Um, what would you say to members of the general public, like the people in Friendship Heights who are nervous today because their post office has been closed down, about whether they should regard themselves uh, as in danger or their mail because of what has happened and the Friendship Heights postal office? I mean, how will they will, you have more credibility <laughs> The, based on what I saw last night, to speak to them than anybody in this Congress or uh, bless their hearts, anybody in management, what should my staff say to them? Uh, what, what can my staff say that union leaders would say to the general public about how to deal with their mail and how to regard this controversy and their own personal safety with respect to the mail? Well, Congresswoman O'Norton, I would suggest that you tell the people of Friendship that they're lucky because they're down the road and we know how to deal with the situation. It's only a trace that was found in their station. Not even, uh, we're not even sure it's enough to, to do any harm. But the right things happen in there. The station's being closed down, it's being sanitized, and, and that will remove the risk. So I, my, my, if I was to go out there with you, what I'd be telling the, the uh, letter carriers out there is that they were fortunate, that they, they had learned from the other mistakes that had been made, the, the fatal mistakes, to be honest with you, in Brentwood, and that now the Postal Service was doing the right thing and that that risk was greatly diminished because the right thing was being done. I would... Gentlelady, Gentlelady time is would you like to let them proceed? I appreciate one more. Go ahead. Here. I would um, tell them that we will be at a point sometime in the future where we can guarantee absolutely that all the mail is safe. In the interim, we must tell them that we cannot let the terrorists win. Uh, I am afraid of colon cancer. I'm afraid of being hit by a truck, being in an automobile accident. I'm afraid of anthrax. We can't be controlled by fear. That is the weapon of the terrorists. So while there is some minor level of risk until we can guarantee absolutely, we have to tell the American public that we cannot be controlled by fear. We have to understand it or control it. Thank you for all you are doing. Thank you for the example you're setting. You, you may want to use some numbers. May I? Sure, go ahead. Um, since September 11th, we've delivered over 20 billion pieces of mail. Only three have been found to be contaminated. Only three deaths have been attributed to anthrax. Uh, the prediction from the CDC, I believe, is 20,000 people will die from the flu this coming flu season. Now, I don't know if that's going to put their mind at ease when they go to the mailbox, but those numbers are hard facts. Those I think it very, helps, actually. <laughs> those are very well taken points. Um, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Now my, my district's going to be asking if their postal carrier had the flu when they dropped off the mail. Uh, that uh, I said now everybody in my district's going to be asking whether their postal carrier had the flu when he dropped off their letter. Um, that. Uh, but I really appreciate your willingness to, to speak out on what is going to be not a, a couple of month question, but probably at least a decade or for the rest of our lives, and that's how you do risk assessment. And um, we appreciate your, your uh, bravery with that. Um, this is not new, it's new to us uh, in the sense of, of direct deaths in the United States. 
but the book Germs right now is either number one or number two on most bestseller lists, and it's clearly documenting that we've had variations of this in the United States. When I was in Iraq in 98, we had the opportunity to meet with some of the inspectors who'd been kicked out, who were looking for the very things that were coming. We've been talking about this. We've been having drills in the military as they've been sent overseas of how to handle chemical and biological uh, uh, weapons um, that, that could be weaponized in the United States. And now we're here, and we're just at the very, I think what the public is concerned about is not what they necessarily just see in front of them, but what may be coming. And this isn't likely to be some kind of a big uh, hit. We're, we're not sure whether it's a domestic nut or whether it's Iraq or, or where it is right now. But clearly, in, in the scheme of the type of terrorism we've seen out of Al-Qaeda elsewhere in the world, uh, this is a uh, kind of a warning to us as to how we're going to deal with this. And one thing I strongly want to encourage in risk assessment, that you push management to act rapidly to stop things even if it's only briefly. For example, anybody who's been watching saw they couldn't penetrate to Capitol Hill or to a lot of the agencies, and they hit the people who were carrying. And if they would have gotten in their offices, they were going to hit a front person. Probably at some point, maybe a decade or 20 years, maybe next month or tomorrow, they're going to try penetrating at a district level uh, or uh, at a local justice department. And when I would encourage that whenever you see a new pattern that, that the unions and the management say, if they see one district anywhere in the country where this happened, that the entire system stop to check it. Because we may, in fact, have prevented some in the agencies because of holding the mail for a little bit. Now, I believe we've gone on too long and that we, quite frankly, need to lead by example here at, in Washington, like, like you've led in the post office. But look for those patterns. And let's don't do what Congressman Ken Jorsey was saying, is always oh, seems like we're behind. Uh, for a baby boomer, it seems like we're in an endless Vietnam uh, where we're always just a little bit behind. And um, I wanted to ask you whether you know of, is there any unit inside the post office uh, or pushing CDC? Because the mail, we, we clearly have a vulnerability. We hadn't thought a lot about the mail, but it's extremely logical. It, it's been out there as, as a method, just like like other things, is there a unit that is currently um, testing to see what other chemical, biological, uh, just like we were talking earlier about the anthrax in the envelopes, and what's the, the I mean, we did, oh, what a whopper of a, whoop, a whoops. I mean, we didn't know it could penetrate the letter. That's a whopper of a whoops. And that the question is, is that we don't want more of that type of thing. Is there a unit that is looking at other chemical and biological as to how they could work through the mail system? Uh, okay, we have masks now that can treat this one type of thing. What other things may be coming? Uh, because not looking at this in terms of tomorrow, but a longer sense of tomorrow. And do you know of anything? Have you been told about anything? And if not, we ought to be looking at that, trying to figure out what other ways to research to make every letter carrier as safe as possible, knowing that perfection is impossible. I'm informed that postal service uh, doctors, and they have a number under contract, the inspection service and others in the posters are taking a fresh look at our exposure, not just to anthrax, but to a number of other attacks. I understand, I don't know if they had undertaken those type of activities before anthrax or not, but I am assured that presently they have. So yes, they are. We are not involved in those activities. Uh, we're just reacting to anthrax, uh, the uh, labor unions. But uh, the posters is embarking on some studies and other issues. In your, in your committees, for example, if we buy 2.5 billion in new equipment, is that equipment all geared to anthrax or is it going to? No, no, that would be <laughs> geared to all bacteria, all organism, organisms, anything that comes through small box, uh, anthrax, diphtheria, anything that comes through will be killed. Anybody else have any comments on this? I encourage you to, to stay aggressive with it uh, because you're the frontline defense representing your, your uh, workers. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony and, and for your leadership. As a New Yorker, I can tell you that since September 11th, there have been many heroes, uh, certainly New York's uh, finest, uh, New York's bravest, uh, uh, but now everyone's talking about the postal workers who are going about their business under very challenging and, and difficult times. 
I appreciate uh, very much the efforts that those of you in the mailing industry have taken to restore confidence. Uh, this is an enormous industry, and its stability is of the utmost importance uh, to, our, to our country. As Mr. Baffa pointed out earlier, we really have to keep this in perspective. Uh, we really can't blame uh, people for being concerned about the mail today, but he noted that 20 billion pieces of mail ha um, have been moving since the anthrax and only three uh, uh, in, in, in infections, and that's roughly 680 million pieces of mail uh, each day. So the risk uh, to the general public is, is truly uh, not very large when you put it in, the, in perspective. I, I, I would like to ask uh, you or, or any of you to comment, what else could we be doing to make your workers safe and to ease their fears? Do you mean Congress, Postal Service, or the unions? The, 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 what, what could we in Congress be doing to help the workers, to ease their fears, to, to make it safer for them? Well, you could advance the, the funds that the Postal Service will be so de desperately in need of. Uh, as long as money is at issue, then the Postal Service is going to be stretched in terms of how much protection they can provide to the employees. The $175 million that has been advanced to date uh, has been very helpful in terms of purchasing some of the uh, protective equipment that postal employees need. But before we're through with this, they're going to need a whole lot more than $175 million. So I believe that Congress could be directly involved in appropriating sufficient monies. Uh, you demand of us universal service. We have to deliver to every American, no matter where they live, provide forwarding services, number of other services that a good business would not perform at a universal rate. So recognizing that, that we perform services as an arm of the United States government, in these times they will need additional financing, funding. And I would request that Congress keep an open ear in regards to requests that will be coming to the Hill. Uh, there's something else you can do that's a lot simpler than giving us money, and we do need the money. Uh, I bumped into a senator here in town earlier in the week, and I, it was just at the time when the Senate was starting to reopen most of their facilities. And I just mentioned to the senator in passing how encouraging that is to our members to see you all back in business. Now, look, I don't want anybody here to take any unnecessary risk, and I want to make that clear. But... That double standard thing that was talked about earlier, it's out there. And our members look at that, and they do feel like they're being treated in a lesser manner than you all are being treated. And, and, and I just think to the extent that you can safely get back to your business, that's a, that's a pretty simple thing for you all to do. I know it takes cleaning it up and everything, but I mean, I want you to all appreciate how much that says to our members who are out there every day and have been out there every day to see you all back in business. and function in, in your in your capacities here so as soon as it's safe to do that I'd encourage you all to do exactly that Any other comments? Well, so, some of the members of the committee have expressed some uh, concerns about the uh, the cost that it may possibly be as much as uh, a three billion dollar expenditure and why is the Postal Service behind the curve uh, on this issue. I'd, I'd like you to envision this scenario. If Postmaster General Potter appeared before this august uh, body three months ago and asked you for $3 billion, you'd be calling for straitjackets. <laughs> and the Postal Service has been put, obviously, in a, in a horrible position, and the safety not only of postal employees, but uh, of the American public has been uh, put in danger. And I don't, uh, I, I'm not treating the subject of the money glibly, but uh, by the same token, uh, you can't expect the Postal Service to be able to do everything uh, on its own. And I think this is a, a, a perfect example of that quandary. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. Well, you can't have it both ways. 
Well, as, as Mr. Burris pointed out, by law, the Postal Service is required to deliver mail to every urban apartment, every rural farm. And uh, I, I, I also would like to understand whether you feel this should uh, be supported uh, through Generally, the general time revenue has funds, or would you say postal increases? Personally, I think it should be general, general revenue funds, but how do you feel? I think long term. Um, I've been in the Post Service since 1954 and experienced that period of time when we were, were part of the federal government. We, we, com we were competing with education, health care, roads, defense. It's really dangerous to start moving us back in that direction. I think it's appropriate to reform the Post Service so it's competitive in ways that it can really grow. Uh, recognizing that it does have monopolies, so there will be some restrictions. But long-term ties between the federal government and the United States Post Service is a prescription for the destruction of the Post Service in the long run. I have watched around the world those governments held on to their postal systems, and not one that I'm familiar with that is thriving today. There has to be a clear division between the two. So I would say yes. Uh, help the Post Service in the time of need, but don't bring them back into federal government as a branch on budget and be subject to the rises and falls of the political tides that go with budget making. Gentlelady, time has expired. Chair now uh, recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays, for five thank minutes. You. Thank you, Dr. Weldon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. I've been looking forward to having the opportunity to publicly thank uh, each of you uh, and Mr. Young, you, your president, for um, uh, being uh, true statesmen and patriots. Um, you have to weigh a very difficult issue. When do you fight for your union members and make sure that you know they are totally and completely protected? And when do you say, you know, we need to man the fort? And, um, and take some risks, and it's a very tough, tough call. And so, one, I want to thank you, and I want to thank all your workers, uh, every one of your workers. And I also want to acknowledge that we lost approximately 6,000 people in an act of war, and Thomas Morris and Joseph Christine are, are casualties of that war. and. Um, Knowing what we know now, they wouldn't have been casualties. They wouldn't have been. We wouldn't allow it to happen, knowing what we know now. I never for, for an instant believed, with all the hearings I've had on anthrax, and we've had about eight more, in fact, I never believed that you could actually see it seep or have it seep through a letter, uh, certainly uh, a sealed letter, but actually through the, through the pores of, of, of the envelope. I just didn't think it could happen. And, and we're going to learn a lot of terrible things in the course of the next few years. Um, I want to say to you that we are at war, that uh, we are in a race with the terrorists, and to make sure that we shut them down before they have access to better chemical and biological delivery systems, before they have nuclear waste or, heaven forbid, a, a nuclear device. That is the reality. And if we all know that, we know why we're fighting this war. And I also want to say to you publicly that when I went to Ground Zero, what touched me as a member who represents probably the wealthiest district in the country, except maybe for Henry's, um, I have a lot of white collar workers and obviously a number of blue collar. I don't have as many uniform workers, so called. But it was touching for me to see my white collar workers uh, manning the stations to hand out gloves <coughs> and protective gear and medicine and food to the blue collar workers, the uniform workers, because my constituents uh, came to grips with the fact of how grateful we are for all the service employees who serve our country. And they just wanted to be a part of what they were doing and knew they couldn't because they didn't have the skills. We needed the uniform workers to do that. And I'm using my time to question to just say that, but in my request for the chairman to have this meeting, I wanted to publicly acknowledge the loss of two people to tell you that I regret that we didn't see it happen um, and to, to thank you for the tough call that you have to make 
You haven't demagogued this issue. You haven't done all the things that you could have done. And then to just publicly say to you, if it's an issue between two million or three billion, I consider it a time of war. And your men and women are uh, one of the first line of defense. Uh, they are part of this army to fight terrorism. And I believe that the question during time of war is, what does it take to protect our army, your workers? And I think that you will see bipartisan and bicameral and, and by branch support uh, from you all, for you all, and that you have earned a lot of credibility with all three branches of government, uh, even the judicial branch, frankly. Um, not that I can speak for that branch, but so um, I apologize for not having a question. I'm happy to, to use my five seconds if you want to make a comment, but God bless each and every one of you and all your workers. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know it's been a long day, and we're about at the end of it. Let me just uh, join with all of those who have expressed a tremendous amount of gratitude to not only each one of you, but each one of you as well as the men and women that you represent who make up the membership of your unions. I would agree with all of those who have suggested or indicated that whether individuals intended or not, when they signed on or signed up to become postal employees, they now find themselves as soldiers on the front line in the war to preserve the democracy of this country as we continue to provide communication links and as people are able to continue to free and openly converse with one another from one part of the nation to the other. We've gone through the discussion in terms of whether or not there may have been perceptions of, 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 of different standards, whether or not there has been reaction that, that was quickly enough, and we've looked at all of the other components of, of what have us in this grip. But I want to commend you for putting the health and safety of your members first and foremost above everything else. And the fact that you have represented that position and that point of view, I think has in fact caused some reaction and caused all of America to really understand what it is that you do. The one point or the one question, and I think Mr. Quinn probably has said it as vividly as it can possibly be said, that we can have all of the intentions we can have all of the desires, we can have all of the hopes, we can have all of the intents, but unless we're prepared to bite the bullet in terms of generating what is needed to protect the workers, it obviously will not be happening. Unless we're willing, I don't know how we find it, who knows how it actually gets found, but it's obvious that it has to be found. It's pretty clear to me that the, the Postal Service can't find it all by itself. I just don't believe that it can. And, and so the one question, I guess, that I would, would raise, I mean, you made the point about going to heaven and not dying. Uh, I like to phrase it a little differently in terms of suggesting that you might not get everything that you pay for, but you'll pay for everything that you get. Uh, <laughs> Frederick Douglass, uh, that was one of his favorite sayings and comments. And so my question just simply becomes, if we're going to provide the needed resources to assure the protection of the workers 
and of the patrons. Where does the resource come from? Congressman Davis, I think that resource has to come from Congress. I agree with the statements that Bill made about not wanting to bring the Postal Service back under the under the federal government, but I also agree with the Postmaster General when he says this is all about homeland security, and we are in the front lines. And I just want to leave you with this, sir, if I could. I just came back from Chicago <clears throat> where our national president, Vince Umbrato, addressed 800 of our local leaders from all over the country. And he said that we cannot function in this society if fear is going to be our constant companion. And the members of our union jumped up to their feet and started cheering. If you folks want people in the front lines that want to be there, that are prepared to be there, the nation's letter carriers will stand right with you. We just ask that you give us the tools that we need to do so. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for all the hard work you put in on postal reform and everything else. Mr. Clay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I realize that the hour is upon us. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a few questions of the panel. Let me first thank the panel uh, for, for being here today uh, and showing um, your interest in this issue as well as uh, uh, representing those 38,000 postal employees that, that work hard every day. Uh, throughout this country. Uh, let me ask you about the Brentwood situation because I'm, I'm really concerned about the safety and the health of those, post, uh, those men and women that go to the postal system uh, every day. Uh, the Postmaster General has stated that he relied on the advice of the CDC in determining whether to have postal workers from the Brentwood facility tested for exposure to anthrax. Uh, postal workers were not encouraged to undergo testing until Sunday, October the 21st, six days after the letter to Senator Dashiell was shown to contain anthrax. Was the CDC on top of the Brentwood situation? Uh, Mr. Burris, perhaps you could answer that. I would believe it unfair to evaluate the post service, CDC, local health authorities, or anyone else. Applying today's knowledge to an evolving situation that occurred some three weeks ago. If I had known three weeks ago what I knew today, I'd be a very wealthy man. I would have played the right lottery number. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think it says it all. They didn't know. Uh, they acted in good faith. They re if they had rejected the advice of CDC, if postal management had not requested CDC, if they did not consult the medical and scientific community as to what they should do at that time, then I think they would be deserving of blame. At the time they made the decision, all of the medical community was telling them that was what they should do. Now, the Post Service is a major bureaucracy. It doesn't move as nimbly as some of the smaller units, the smaller enterprises in our society. But given its size, its bureaucracy, its complexity, I believe that they did act in good faith based upon all the best information available to them. Just, just as a follow-up, how confident are you that the postal facilities that have been connect contaminated will be safe for employees and customers. I think the Postmaster General on a television appearance uh, responded to that question and he's taken a lot of heat for it. His response was, we're not absolutely sure. The mailing community jumped all over him, the major mailers, the Board of Governors, some of his top staff. But he responded truthfully. We're uncertain, we really don't know what's in the mail. We don't know what's coming in the mail tomorrow. We cannot assure the American public that the Dash letter will not appear, and I wake up every, every time my phone rings. I'm afraid it's a postal official telling me that the, a Dash or a similar Dash letter was found in Chicago 
or San Francisco or Do LA. Do you know how many postal facilities have been contaminated throughout yes, the Yes, we have a listing of them. You do have a listing Yes, of they provide us that information at our 10 o'clock meeting every day. They bring us up to date on the status of every employee that's been contaminated, every office, what the results of that testing has been. We get a full briefing on that and are free how to How many as of today? I don't have it with me. I think it's something like... Anyone on the panel? No, but you, so, sir, you should understand, these are only the ones they've tested. They're in the process now of testing. I think the Postmaster General said there's 200 more delivery units that are being tested. The call that I got last night told me that there were 19 stations tested here in D.C., only one, the Friendship Station, had any. There were 12 stations tested at the Dulles Airport facility, and one of them had a small trace of anthrax. So that information pours in almost daily. Mr. Young, you are satisfied that the steps being taken will provide adequate protection for our postal facilities? I, I'm confident that the steps that are being taken are those that are being directed by the so-called experts, the people that are supposed to be the CDC, the doctors, the health communities, the ones that specialize in this field. I would say this, the Postal Service has not only taken their advice, they've went further than these people. For instance, in New York, it was the Postal Service that insisted to the CDC that they get into this National Pharmacy Bank and get the Cipro up there to medicate all the employees. The CDC didn't want to do that. Now, Bill was at that meeting, so was Gus, so was uh, Bill. And they can tell you it was the Postal Service that insisted. The CDC was saying they thought they were overreacting. They said they'd rather err on the, on the right side of this. So everything I see, and I'm not trying to point fingers at anyone, but everything I see, everything I'm aware of, leads me to the conclusion that the Postal Service has followed the medical advice from the so-called experts each and every time, and where they, where they haven't, they've exceeded what they were told to do. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Clay. Well, let me just uh, conclude by saying, first of all, uh, you know, we've had such an open society for so long. Uh, you know, two months ago, nobody would have ever dreamed anything like this would be discussed today. We'd be talking about postal reform alone and and uh, none of this other stuff. But let me just say that uh, I think I think I speak for most of the members of Congress in saying that uh, we're going to give you whatever tools you need, uh, the uh, radiation machines or whatever technology is needed to make sure that the spores or any living organism is killed before it gets to the postal employees. Uh, we'll have that online as quickly as possible. And uh, anything else that, uh, that you need, uh, I hope you'll contact us and we'll try to carry that on to the House and Senate leadership to see if we can accommodate you because we're not only protecting you and the eight, 800,000 postal employees, but we're protecting everybody uh, who gets mail. So we want to work with you. The last thing I'd like to say is that I personally believe that uh, one of the ingredients in this overall uh, solution is postal reform. And uh, I know that all of you are not in agreement on that, uh, but I'd like to, uh, for those who still have reservations about it, I'd like to get together with you, see if we can work out any differences and, and come to some conclusions that'll uh, solve that problem as well. And George back there who's nodding has been a, a real uh, soldier on that and, and we really appreciate your help. And with that, let me just say it's uh, been a long day. We appreciate your being with us and uh, we are adjourned. C-SPAN, part of a House hearing on the Aviation Security Bill. Then at 7 a.m. Eastern, Washington Journal. On the program, discussions about postal security.